Hi there, you're in the lab with your mate JJ. Today is Old Book Teardown Day, uh, my favourite part of the show. Um, I really love doing the Old Book Teardowns. Uh, in the Old Book Teardown video, we, uh, we take a detailed look at an old technology book. Um, and uh, uh, that comes out as part of the show. There's a corresponding electronics project. We already did the electronics project. That was the debugging of the JMP001, the uh, symbol keyboard from JCAR and Silicon Chip Magazine. I am working on JMP002 at the moment. That's on the bench here. I'm in the middle of making that video. Um, so that'll be coming out soon. It's not finished yet, but it's a work in progress. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much to Dave Jones from the EV blog because uh, last week I sent him a copy of uh, um, Forrest M. Mims uh, autobiography, which is called uh, Maverick Scientist. I sent Dave an autographed hard copy, a uh, hardcover copy, and um, <clears throat> he was very happy to receive that. So that was excellent, and he linked into my channel from his channel. And I got 200 new subscribers, so welcome to all my new uh, subscribers who've just joined this week. Um, this place is a bit of a mixed bag. I do all kinds of stuff. It's really amateur, electronics, beginner sort of stuff. I'm not a pro like Dave Jones, um, but I do love watching the EV blog, and it's really cool that he runs the EV blog forum. Uh, I use that as often as I can. I always get help there when I when I get stuck. So uh, that's a really excellent resource. If you haven't heard about it, I'll link it in the show notes. You can check it out. Um, and uh, I got myself a copy of Forrest M. Mims' book as well. This is uh, not a signed hard copy one. This one I picked up for 20 or 30 bucks from Amazon. Um, uh, and if you want to, you can get signed copies from um, Make Magazine or Make a Shed in California. I'll link to that in the show notes as well if you're interested. So, uh, yes, thank you to uh, Dave Jones for, for, for linking to me. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased that he was happy to receive his copy of Maverick Scientist, which, as I said, is the Forrest M. Mims III um, autobiography, which has just recently come out. And Forrest M. Mims, he wrote these great books that came out in the late 70s and were published well into the 90s and, and, and beyond. Um, the three, uh, he had a series called the um, uh, Engineer's Mini Notebooks, and they're great. They're handwritten. He, there's no typography in the thing. It's all hand-drawn. Even the lettering is hand-drawn. Um, and uh, he, he published uh, four uh, Engineer's Mini Notebooks. Uh, this is Volume 1, Timer, op -amp, and Optoelectronic Circuits and Projects. And then um, uh, this is Volume 3, Electronic Sensor Circuits and Projects. And then this is Volume 4, which is Electronic Formulas, Symbols and Circuits. Conspicuously absent is Volume th 2. Volume 2. Now, I wasn't able to get a copy of Volume 2 um, uh, because I, it wasn't for sale in Australia. And uh, one of my uh, uh, Patreon uh, patrons and uh, viewers... Um, Craig very generously sent me a copy, so I'm waiting for that to arrive in the mail. Thank you very much to Craig. Uh, thanks, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so I'm looking forward to volume two arriving. At that time, I'll have the full set of Engineers Mini Notebooks. They've actually been published with new covers. They, they, they looked different when they were made uh, back in the 80s and the 90s. I used to have those back in the old days. I don't know what happened to them over time. Uh, Anyway, um, I thought I'd also just tell you about a few other things. This is not old books, this is new book stuff. Um, but I got the second edition of Code from Charles Petzold. Um, and I'm, I'm just in the process of beginning that now. I'm really looking forward to reading this book. Uh, apparently this, this second edition was uh, much improved on the first edition. So um, I never got through the first edition, so I'm just catching up with the second edition. I want to give this some time. Uh, and I intend to. The other thing that I've been reading lately, and I'm about halfway through if you look at my bookmark there, this is Serial Port Complete, second edition, and it's about UARTs and serial ports, and um, it's it's everything you ever wanted to know about uh, serial port technology. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to learn about that, because I'm trying to learn about how to, to, do, to work with USB and serial um, with the Arduino uh, 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 microcontrollers, among others. I, I want to know everything I can about it. So I'm 
learning about serial ports. This is from Jan Axelson. I don't, I didn't know her until recently, but I bought four of her books, uh, one, two, three, four. Um, so I've just started, I'm about halfway through Serial Port Complete, second edition. I will also be reading USB Embedded Hosts, uh, the developer's guide, uh, also by Jan Axelson. It says, access USB devices from your embedded systems. So this, I guess, is a microcontroller side of things, looking at USB. So I'm looking forward to that. I haven't started it yet. Then I've got this one. I'm not sure how much time I'll actually have for this. This is USB Mass Storage. Um, also by Jan Axelson. So this is just about, I guess, storage devices. Uh, the, of the four, I'm least interested in this and have the least uh, uh, call, call to read it. So I'm glad I've got it, but I don't think I'll be looking at it closely uh, anytime soon, unless something happens and I need to. And then the, the, the mother load is this one. It's called a USB Complete 5th Edition, uh, also by Jan Axelson. Uh, includes Super Speed and uh, Super Speed Plus USB 3.1, the developer's guide. So this is USB Complete 5th Edition. Sounds good. Looking forward to reading this. Have not started it yet, so uh, that's in my near future. Um, and I learned something. Uh, imagine this. I only found out this week um, that USB 3 um, actually has in the cables an extra four wires. I thought that the difference was in, like in the quality of the wire, you know, like it had a, a lower in, uh, resistance or, or something. I thought it used better quality wire, but that's not the case. USB 3, which is called Super Speed uh, and above, uh, they actually pack an extra four wires. It's two differential pairs. They have one differential pair for transmit and one differential, differential pair for um, uh, um, uh, receive. Um, uh, whereas the USB 2 spec, or the original USB, only had four wires. It had a positive uh, voltage, a ground voltage, and then um, a, a, a differential pair for signaling. So, um, yeah, I was really surprised to learn that the actual the USB 3 thing, the thing about super speed, it actually includes two whole extra differential pairs in there. So um, I, I had never realized, you know, that the, the, the plug kind of looks the same. Those little blue ones are actually packing four extra uh, connections. So I, I hadn't realized. And there you go. So, you, you know, every day is a school day, as one mate said to me the other day. Anyway, that's enough yammering. What we're going to be doing today? Oh, and I should tell you um, that the silly job title for this video uh, is Component Wrangler. Um, when I when I do a main show like this one, I I, uh, I change the silly job title on my. Can you see my ah my silly job title? Yeah. Anyway, I'm the Component Wrangler, uh, and today the book we'll be looking at is uh, Digital Systems, uh, Hardware Organization and Design by Frederick J. J. Hill and Gerald R. Peterson. Uh, and, uh, okay, it was, um, uh, it says uh, Electronics Australia. So this is from the Electronics Australia magazine library, I believe. And it says received on the 29th of August, 1973. So that's a long, long time ago, isn't it? Digital Systems, Hardware Organization and Design. Um, oh, uh, here's the, um, so uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the letters for the, uh, for the authors. Frederick J. Hill is the Professor of Electrical Engineering, University of Arizona. And Gerald R. Peterson is the Professor of Electrical Engineering, University of Arizona. So they were obviously peers, they had the same um, title at the same university. Published by John Wiley and Sons, New York, London, Sydney and Toronto. And it was copyright 1973. Wow. Anyway, that's the book that we'll be looking at today. So this is a, uh, this is a digital, uh, uh, digital systems book from 1973. So it's probably going to be quite fascinating. So let's jump over to the bench and let's have a look at this together. Here we are on the bench. You can see I'm in the in the process of making the um, uh, the J Car Mini Project Number Two. It uses this LED shield, so and it, and I had to get a button. That's my buttons, and I'm 
doing some button stuff. I'm uh, trying to learn uh, about how it communicates with the hat here. The yeah. Anyway, um, I intend to do some uh, protocol decoding on the uh, I2C bus. Um, never done that before, so I'm learning how that works, uh, and hopefully I can figure that out. And that's all part of uh, the video that I'm making at the moment uh, for the uh, the J car. Um, mini project that I'm working on which is the second one I just recently re released the uh, the first one and then we did some debugging of that as well I don't know if you haven't seen uh, that was our recent electronics project we just fixed up some of the um, uh, debouncing logic for the buttons and made it a bit more reliable so that was good uh, I've got a why have I got a nail here I was gonna nail something somewhere I assume I'm not sure all right, so here's our book. You can see that. <sighs> Plenty of light. <sighs> so as I said, this is Digital Systems Hardware and Organization, Hardware Organization and Design. Uh, as I said, Electronics Australia, which is a, a magazine um, that was the. Uh, I'm not really um, uh, across the whole history of this I should probably go and read up on it in fact I might put some links to it in the uh, in the show notes for this video uh, but Electronics Australia was an Australian electronics magazine that preceded silicon chip as I understand it and I think silicon chip was a bit of a spin-off of Electronics Australia uh, which was just affectionately referred to as EA I believe for Electronics Australia So I'll, uh, I'll I'll dig up the details about that, and I'll put some notes in the uh, in the sh show notes so that so that we know uh, more about where this came from. And as it says here, it says received 29th August 1973, and it's got some initials there, JR maybe I'm not sure. Um, so this is a title page. As we said earlier, these guys were professors of electrical engineering at the University of Arizona. I might dig up a link to University of Arizona as well. I assume that that's, uh, uh, that institution remains. Uh, okay, so um, we've got a preface. It's only uh, two pages, really. So we'll have a look at that. Then our contents, we'll go through that. And then the index begins at page 479. So this book is sort of in the ballpark, 400 and 80, 490 pages. Cool. And uh, and then we're off into the introduction. So um, let's start. Let's start with uh, a look at a read of the preface. Then uh, go through the contents, and then we'll flip through the book and uh, see what's in there. So <clears throat> the need for a book on digital computer hardware <clears throat> design that is really an engineering textbook has been even evident for some time. Traditionally, engineering texts are concerned with imparting a skill, with teaching the student how to do something. By contrast, most books on computer design are little more than descriptive sur surveys of existing computer hardware. In reading such books, the student is an observer rather than a participant. In this book, it is our intent to involve the student in the design process rather than just describe the end product. The principal vehicle for this involvement is a register transfer and control sequence design language. Various such languages have been proposed, but none have met with any general acceptance. We have chosen a version of APL, a programming language, which we consider to be an unusually powerful and flexible language. Its flexibility is amply illustrated by the fact that it has achieved wide success as an interactive programming language, even though it was originally developed as a means of describing computer organization. Also, its basic structural similarity to other high-level languages makes it accessible to a wider class of students than would be the case with a more specialized hardware language. Using this language, we have attempted to explore the design of a wide variety of digital hardware systems. We have presented concrete design examples as liberally as possible throughout the book. This book has been written for the computer scientist and system programmer, as well as the electrical engineer. Undoubtedly, many users of this book will never be responsible for actual hardware design, 
but the design point of view is a fascinating one for the student whose primary objective is to gain familiarity with hardware organization and system architecture. The authors have used the text in classes divided almost equally between computer science students and with no engineering background and electrical engineering students with prior courses in switching theory and electronics. The response from both groups has been posi positive and most grat gratifying. Uh, the only uh, <coughs> I might just put that there. Uh, the only topics specifically prerequisite to the book are programming in some high-level language, the binary number system, Boolean, Boolean algebra, and Arcano maps. Uh, appendices covering the latter three topics were originally planned, but have fallen victim to the need to keep the size of the book within reasonable bounds. We assume that the instructor will have no trouble presenting a brief introduction to these topics if necessary. The material covered in chapters 2, 4 and 6 of our book on switching theory, and there's a footnote here, are J.F. Hill and G.R. Peterson, Introduction to Switching Theory and Logical Design, Wiley, New York, 1968. Okay. Uh, the material covered in chapters 2, 4, and 6 of our book on switching theory would be ample for this purpose. With, uh, <coughs> I, might, uh, I might see if I can actually track down a copy of that book in, in either my collection or online or whatever. Anyway, check the show notes for details about that book. Uh, with the addition of this material, the only prerequisites for a course based on this book would be programming experience, a certain degree of intellectual maturity, and a serious interest in computers. The electrical engineer who hopes to design digital hardware uh, should master switching theory and sequential circuits, as well as the material presented in this book. For such students, a prior course covering material similar in scope to the first 13 chapters of our Switching Theory book is highly desirable. The engineer on his first job is far more likely to be confronted with the logical design of a small system of sequential circuits than with the design of a com complete computer. Uh, chapters 4 through 8 of this book are critical. Uh, the principal example in these chapters is a small computer, the basic description and assembly language of which are presented in Chapter 2. Uh, once through Chapter 8, the instructor has some freedom in selecting the order of presentation of the remaining chapters. The three chapters on computer arithmetic are somewhat interrelated. Chapter 10 and some topics in Chapter 14 require the conventions established in Chapter 9. Chapter 15 contains some interesting design examples which the instructor may wish to use in, conjunct in conjunction with or closely following Chapters 7 and 8. Between 10 and 13 chapters can be covered in a once-semester course. Uh, most of the book could be covered in a two-quarter course. For a two-semester course, the authors recommend supplementing the book with a comparison of the characteristics of some existing machines. A variety of computer reference manuals would be helpful in this regard. We hope that this book introduces system in... Uh, okay. We hope that this book introduces system into the design process. In no sense does it reduce this process to a cookbook procedure. A premium is placed on the imagination of the designer. This will be immediately evident in the problem sets of Chapter 6 and subsequent chapters. A variety of problems is essential to any meaningful course, and the authors have attempted to include a broad selection. Problem solution, however, has not been reduced to the formalism of switching theory. For many problems, a variety of correct solutions are possible. We have uh, defined a very close correspondence between our version of APL and particular digital circuits. The criticism might be made that APL was devised as a hardware independent language. If used that way, it would permit the use of powerful hardware translation programs. However, our purpose is to teach the design process for digital systems. A program for automatic translation of the APL description to hardware can be and has been written, but this must be regarded as secondary. Only after the design process is understood should one be concerned with trying to automate it. Tucson, Arizona. Frederick J. Hill and Gerald R. Peterson. Presumably back in 1973. Doesn't say there. 
Alright, now here's our table of contents. So, chapter 1, Introduction. Objectives of the book. Evolution of the computer. Basic organization of digital computers. Instruction formats. Software. Summary and Outlook. Chapter 2. Organization and programming of a small computer. <clears throat> Introduction. Remarks on number systems. Layout of a small instructional computer. SIC. SIC instructions. Programming. Indexing and indirect addressing. Using the JMS instruction. Assembly language. Chapter 3. System components. Introduction. Diode logic. Diode transistor logic or DTL. Speed and delay in logic circuits. Flip-flops and register memory. RM. Random access memory. RAM. Semi-random access memory. SRAM. Uh, sequential memory. SM. Read-only memory. ROM. Summary and perspective. Chapter 4. Design conventions. Introduction. Register transfers. The synchronous system. Busing. More complex transfers. Master-slave flip-flops. Clocking and control. A simplified design example. Economics of digital system design. Chapter 5. Introduction to a hardware programming language, AHPL. Introduction. Operand conventions. APL primitive operations. Relational operators. Special vectors. Mixed operators. Branching and sequential control. APL programs. AHPL in perspective. Chapter 6, Machine Organization and Hardware Programs. Introduction. Register Organization. Data Paths. Classifying Instructions. AHPL Control Programs. Gating. Operate, operate Instructions. Busing of Arguments. Indexing. Addressing Schemas. Multiple Cycle Instructions. Summary. Chapter 7, The Control Unit. Introduction. The Control Delay. Asynchronous Operations. Translating Branching Instructions. Combinatorial Logic Subroutines. Return to the SIC Control Unit. A Refinement. The Increment Subroutine. The Shift Register. Another Form of Control Hardware. Sequences Involving Loops. Decoding Networks, a complete design example, summary, chapter 8, microprogramming, introduction, controlling the microprogram, a microprogrammed SIC, microprogramming a bus oriented machine, an assembly language for microprograms, further flexibility, branching improvements, an economical microprogrammable control unit. Observations. Chapter 9 Intersystem Communications. Introduction. Parallel, opera or, uh, parallel Operations. Where is control? Synchronization. Conventions. Data transfer rates. A tape transport controller. Chapter 10. Interrupt and Input Output. Introduction. Interrupt System for SIC. Basic Data Transfer Operations. Input Output Interconnections. I.O. System for SIC. Buffer Channels for SIC. Theme and Variations. Chapter 11. High Speed Edition. Introduction. Ripple Carry Adder. The minimum delay adder, the carry look ahead principle, group carry look ahead, section carry look ahead, generation of adder logic by combinator, uh, combinator, combinational, 
There we go, okay. Generation of outer lo logic by combinational logic subroutine. The carry completion adder. Summary. Uh, chapter 12. Multiplication and division. Signed multiplication. Multiplication speed up. Carry save. Multiple bit speed up techniques. Speed analysis. Large, fast, parallel multipliers. Division. Summary. Floating point arithmetic. Introduction. Notation and format. Floating point addition and subtraction. Floating point multiplication and division. Hardware organization for floating point arithmetic. Chapter 14. Figures of large fast machines. I'm oh, sorry, that's features of large fast machines. Overview. Register symmetry and multi address instructions. Multiple memory banks. Interleaved banks with multiple entry points, scratch pad memories, virtual memory, instruction look ahead, execution overlap, multiprocessing, variable word length computers, summary, special purpose systems and special purpose computers, introduction, push down storage, a display processor, digital filters, Special Purpose Computers, Sort Processor, Time Sharing, Process Control Computer, Large Special Purpose Machines. Then there's an appendix on page 473 and an index on page 479. And then we're off. Chapter 1, Introduction, Objectives of the Book. The proper approach to teaching digital hardware systems has been the subject of considerable debate. That the debaters have been unsure of their responsive, respective positions is evidenced by the scarcity of tech book, textbooks on this subject. Those books which are intended to cover the subject fall into one of three categories. One, largely software. Two, primarily switching theory. Three, <coughs> descriptive material only. It is the author's intention that the first two categories <coughs> uh, describe subjects really quite distinct from, although related to, digital hardware. Books in the third category fail because they do not involve the reader in the design process. They don't give him anything to do. Our primary result primary resolve in writing this book has been to avoid merely describing computer hardware. We have chosen the control sequence as the vehicle by which the reader will participate in the design experience. We have borrowed a technique from software in that we shall write control sequences in higher language form. The control sequences are easily translated into control unit hardware. Once this is accomplished, the digital system, except for electronic circuit details, is designed. We have used the term digital system without providing a definition. In the broader sense, digital simply means that information is represented by signals that take on a limited number of discrete values and is processed by devices that normally function only on a limited number of discrete states. Further, the lack of practical devices capable of functioning reliably in more than two discrete states has resulted in the vast majority of digital devices being binary, that is, having signals and states limited to two discrete values. Any structure of physical devices assembled to produce or transmit digital information may be termed a digital system. This includes, for example, teletypes, dial telephone switching exchanges, telemetering systems, tape transports and other peripheral equipment, and, of course, computers. Often the word system is thought of as implying a large or complex system. For the present, our definition will be the broader one just presented. In later chapters, large or complex may find its way into our meaning of system as we seek to distinguish a complete computing facility from its various components, such as a memory unit. The characteristics of digital systems vary, and approach to their design sometimes varies as well. Consider the very general model of a digital system shown in figure 1.1. Okay, here is figure 1.1. Uh, types of digital information control information, vectors of binary information, digital system. Okay. 
Although in practice the distinction may not always be apparent, we shall arbitrarily separate the information which enters and leaves a computer into two categories, information to be processed or transmitted, and two, control information. Of course, control information, I think these days we'd call that software, wouldn't we? Anyway, so they're talking about code and data as we know them today, I guess. Information in the first category usually occurs in the form of a time sequence of information vectors. A vector might be a byte, 8 binary bits, it might be a word of 16 to 64 bits, or it might be several words. In any case, a large number of wires are required to handle a vector in a physical system. Usually the bits of a vector are treated within the system in some uniform manner rather than each bit in a completely separate way. The second category, control information, usually occurs in smaller quantities involving physically one to a very small number of wires. Control information is self-defining. It is information which guides the digital system in performing its functions. Sometimes control information is received only. In other cases, control pulses are sent out to control the function of some other equipment. Certain digital systems handle only control information. The controller for an elevator is a good example. Systems of this type may be designed as sequential circuits. The procedures for sequential circuit design are well defined and are discussed in a number of introductory textbooks. For example, references 3 and 4. Classical sequential circuit techniques have not proven satisfactory for designing systems to process vectors of information. Consequently, computers have never been designed that way. The control portion of a more general digital system is, sequential, is a sequential circuit and may be treated as such. For more complex systems, uh, particularly computers, the portion which may be treated effectively as a classical sequential circuit is a relatively small part of the whole. Even general kinds of control information can be assembled into vectors and transmitted and stored as such. Our, appro our approach has been to restrict control hardware to a few standard forms which may be analyzed once and used repeatedly. We are then in a position to investigate and develop design procedures for most any form of equipment for processing information vectors. Digital computers certainly form the most important class of digital systems. Virtually every day we are reminded of the ways in which computers have basically altered our society and the case for their importance can hardly be overstated. In this book we shall be primarily concerned with digital computers and their peripheral equipments for two reasons. First, computers are the most important type of digital system. Second, virtually every aspect of digital design is encountered in computer design so that the person well versed in computer design should be capable of designing any type of digital system. For the computer scientists whose primary interest is software, this book may stand alone as an engaging, we hope, introduction to the philosophy of hardware design. With more imaginative use of microprogramming, the overlap of hardware and software functions becomes increasingly apparent. A familiarity with hardware at the level of detail presented herein will be increasingly required of individuals going into the area of systems programming. For the electrical engineer, it is certainly not our intention to minimize the importance of a companion course in switching theory and sequential circuits. As contrasted with the computer scientist, the electrical engineer has the responsibility of making the hardware work. Particular circuit technologies generate intricate fundamental mode problems in situations which have been idealized in this volume. Interface, common connection between uh, digital equipments, uh, design, interface design will continue to occupy ever increasing amounts of engineering effort. Uh, this area will always overlap system techniques, ch see chapters 9 and 10, sequential circuits and even circuit design. The computer engineer should have coursework background in all three of these areas. Okay, now this book, remember, was written in 1973. 
So the computer has evolved quite a lot since then, but here's the evolution of the computer as recorded in 1973. Various definitions, more or less formal, have been put forth for the computer. The following six criteria, which will be interpreted as a block diagram in the next section, describe most of the important features of a computer. 1. It must have an input medium, by means of which an essentially unlimited number of operands or instructions may be entered. 2. It must have a store, from which operands or instructions may be obtained and into which results may be entered in any desired order. 3. It must have a calculating section capable of carrying out arithmetic or logical operations on any operands taken from the store. 4. It must have an output medium, by means of which an essentially unlimited number of results may be delivered to the user. 5. It must have a decision capability, by means of which it may choose between alternate courses of action on the basis of computed results. 6. Data and instructions shall be stored in the same form, in the same memory, equally accessible to the calculating elements of the machine, so that the machine may treat instructions as data and thereby modify its own instructions. And of course, um, since 1973, we realized that uh, computers which modify their own, own instructions are a really bad idea. They're very hard to get right, they're very hard to debug, and they can lead to all sorts of security problems. So uh, this was a, a technique that mattered, uh, that was of curiosity uh, back in the day, but uh, subsequently fell out of favor. Of course, they don't know this yet because they're writing in 1973. So we might even see some talk about uh, self-modifying code in this book which I can assure you is, you know, here be dragons, right? Like, just be careful. You, you probably don't want to be doing that. Um, anyway, uh, the first five of the listed features were set forth by Charles Babbage in 1830 as the description of a machine which he called <coughs> the analytical engine. Babbage, an, an eccentric English mathematician, was one of the most fascinating characters in the history of science. He was concerned with improving the methods of computational table method. Uh, he, he was concerned with improving the methods of computing mathematical tables. Until the event of the digital computers, mathematical tables were computed by teams of mathematicians grinding away endlessly at desk calculators, performing the same calculations over and over to produce the thousands of entries in tables of logarithms, trigonometric functions, etc. Babbage was working on some improved log tables and so despaired at ever getting the job done that he resolved to build a machine to do it. The result of his first efforts was the difference engine, the first description of which he published in 1822. The difference engine was fun funded by the British government and was partially completed before ba Babbage observed the need for features 3 and 5 in the list above. Just a reminder, 3 is a calculating section and 5 is a decision capability. Uh, storage, as well as input, was to utilize punched cards, which had been invented by Jacquard in 1801. This also provided the decision capability, since the machine could decide which instruction card was next to be brought into control on the basis of computed results. Babbage first started work on the analytical engine about 1830 and the remainder of his life, he died in 1871, was spent in a fruitless effort to get the machine built. His ideas were a hundred years ahead of technology. The mechanical technology of the day was inadequate to meet the requirements of his designs. Indeed, it is doubtful if the analytical engine could be realized by mechanical means even today. The realization of Charles Babbage's dream had to wait, await the development of electronics. In 1937, Howard Aiken of Harvard University proposed the automatic sequence controlled register based on a combination of Babbage's ideas and the technology of the electromechanical calculators then being produced by IBM. Construction of this machine, more generally known as Mark I, was started in 1939, sponsored jointly by Harvard and IBM. The completed machine was 
dedicated <clears throat> August 17, 1944, a date considered by many to mark the start of the computer era. Mark 1 was primarily electromechanical, being constructed mostly of switches and relays, a factor which severely limited its speed. Scientists at the uh, Aberdeen Pro Proving Ground are uh, concerned with the development of ballistic tables for new weapon systems, recognized the need for a faster computer than Mark I. As a result, a contract was awarded in 1943 to the University of Pennsylvania to de develop a digital computer using vacuum tubes instead of relays. The result was ENIAC, the world's first electronic digital computer. The same group that developed ENIAC, directed by J.P. Eckert and J.W. Mouchley, later developed the first commercially produced computer, UNIVAC-1, the first unit of which was delivered in 1951. I'm sorry if I pronounced those names wrong. Uh, the, fix, the sixth feature in the list presented in the beginning of this section is a suggestion made by John von Neumann of Princeton in 1947. This feature is included in UNIVAC 1 and virtually all subsequent machines. Actually modifying the instructions is a far more powerful capability than simply being able to choose between, in old, uh, between alternate instructions. Now, I just remind our, our viewers that, uh, that that was what they thought in 1973. Uh, our experience showed that self-modifying code is bad for a whole bunch of reasons. I might see if I can find some information about that and put it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the show notes. But I, I suspect they're going to uh, keep riffing on this theme throughout the book, so I won't keep carrying on about that. And when you'll just have to remember when they tell you that, uh, that self-modifying code is a powerful technique, uh, just appreciate they didn't really know what they were talking about yet in 1973 because they didn't have much experience. So it seemed like a good idea. Uh, it turned out not to be. In the succeeding years, the power and speed of computers has increased by many orders of magnitude and computers now exercise a pervasive influence on modern society. But the improvements in computers have been due chiefly to improved devices and technology. The basic organization of most computers computers still conform, conforms closely to the criteria laid down by Babbage and von Neumann. Okay, well that's still true, isn't it? We still call them von Neumann machines. <sighs> All right. Basic organizations of digital computers. Any computer meeting the cr criteria set forth in the previous section will be basically organized as shown in figure 1.2. Here is figure 1.2. You've got uh, data and instructions as input go into the memory. Um, then we've got the control system uses the uh, arithmetic logic unit in the processing. Okay. Uh, then the instructions come in from memory. Uh, instructions can go out to memory. Um, there you go. So uh, basically input, memory, output, uh, processing and control. Great. This is a uh, basic computer organization. <clears throat> the exact nature of the components making up the five basic sections of the computer may vary widely and the sections may overlap or share components but the five functions associated with the five sections may be clearly identified in any digital computer. The memory is the central element of the computer in the sense that it is the source or destination of all information flowing to or from the other four sections of the computer. The memory may be regarded as a collection of storage locations for information with each location <coughs> with each location is associated an address by means of which that location may be accessed by the other sections of the computer. The amount of information that can be stored in an individually addressable location expressed in terms of the number of bits, binary digits, uh, is known as the word length of the memory. So just going to repeat that. Uh, uh, 
the, the amount of information that can be stored in an individually addressable location expressed in the number of bits is known as the word length of the memory. There you go. Uh, nomenclature here is sometimes confusing and you will hear such terms as byte organized and variable word length applied to memory. Whatever the type of organization, we use memory word to signify the smallest amount of information that can be individually accessed or addressed in memory. Word lengths in various modern computers typically range from about 8 bits to 64 bits. There you go. So they had 64 uh, bit um, words in machines in 1973. Well, a great variety of devices is used for memory, ranging from fast, low capacity devices with a high cost per bit to slow, high capacity devices with a low cost per bit. A single computer may employ a whole hierarchy of memory devices of varying speed and capacity ratios. The main memory, that is, the portion of memory in most direct communication with the control and processing sections, is usually a high-speed random access memory with a capacity in the range of about 4,000 to 1 million or more words. So we're talking about about 1 meg. <laughs> 4K to 1 meg. Not very much. This may be backed up by any number of slower devices, such as disk or tape, which may make bulk transfer of large numbers of words to or from main memory. The basic functions of the input and output sections are quite obvious, but they have two subsidiary functions, buffering and data conversion, which are not quite so obvious. The buffering function provides the interface between the very fast processing section and the comparative slow, comparatively slow outside world. For example, a human operator may punch data onto cards at a rate of a few characters per second. A stack of these cards may be read onto tape at a rate of a thousand characters per second. The tape may then be read into main memory at the at a rate of about 1,000 characters per second and main memory can communicate with the processing unit at the rate of a million words per second. The data conversion can be illustrated in the same example when the operator punches written information onto cards it is converted into the Hollerith code. While the Hollerith code is fine for punched cards, it is not particularly suitable for magnetic tape. So the characters are translated to another code as they are transferred to tape. While tapes are character organized, main memory is word organized with a word generally made up of several characters. So the characters are grouped into words as the tape is read into memory. The reverse operations take place on output. The processing section, which we shall refer to as the Arithmetic Logical Unit, the ALU, implements the various arithmetic and logical operations on operands obtained from memory. ALUs vary considerably in the number of different operators implemented. The minimum possible set of operations for a general, processing a general purpose computer is a subject of some theoretical interest. As few as two may be sufficient, but most ALUs have a repertoire in the range of 16 to 64 commands. The control section receives instruction words from memory, decodes them, <coughs> and issues the appropriate control signals to the other sections to cause the desired operations to take place. It also receives the results of various tests on data made by the ALU on the basis of which it may choose between alternate courses of action. Von Neumann's criterion is satisfied since the ALU can process any word it receives from memory and the control unit can cause any word in memory, data or instruction to be sent to the ALU. The combination of the ALU and the control unit is often referred to as the Central Processing Unit, CPU. 
and of course that stands to this day. Of course, some some uh, digital systems that 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 uh, that probably meet this criteria, uh, we don't call them CPUs, but we call them like MPUs or or uh, microprocessors, you know. And and of course, there's FPGAs and anyway. Um, but yeah, there you go. So we're talking about CPUs in 1973. Very good. Uh, section 1.4, instruction formats. Uh, we can get an idea of, of what information must be included in an instruction word by considering how we might give instructions to a person who is to do some computing for us. We could provide him with a ledger sheet of data and a sheet of instructions. Then a typical instruction might read, take a number from column one, add it to a number in column two, and enter the sum in three, and proceed to line four of the instruction sheet for the next step. In computer terms, this is a four address instruction. Uh, an instruction word, uh, which is simply a string of, of zeros and ones, uh, is divided up into several sections, each of which is interpreted to have some specific significance by the control unit. The format of a four address instruction is shown in figure 1.3a. Okay, here is figure 1.3a, got an opcode, operand address, operand address, result address, instruction address. Okay, okay, that's interesting. So that's uh, the format of a four code address uh, instruction is shown in 1.3a. The opcode is the numeric code, typically four to six bits, uh, indicating the operation, add, subtract, shift, etc., to be performed. The remainder of the word <coughs> provides the four addresses in memory required for the two operands, the result, and the next instruction. Okay. Uh, the main problem with the four address instruction is the amount of space required to accommodate four addresses, since addressing instructions <coughs> takes time. <coughs> it is highly desirable that only one memory access be required to obtain an instruction. Thus, the pressure is strong to limit the complexity of the instructions so they may fit into a single memory word. The size of an address is determined by the size of the memory. The more locations in memory, the more bits will be required to specify an address. For example, a 32,000 word memory which is a typical size, requires 15-bit addresses. So a four address instruction will require 60 bits just for addresses. Only the very largest machines have memory words this long. The number of addresses in the instruction word can be reduced by letting some of the information be understood. Computer programs usually proceed in a fixed sequence most of the time, branching to an alternate path only occasionally. We therefore specify that the instructions shall be stored in sequentially numbered locations, and the next instruction will be taken from the next sequential location unless otherwise specified. This concept leads to the three addressing instruction, sorry, leads to the three address instruction, which is figure 1.3b. Now that's here, opcode, address operand of the operand, address of the operand, and then result or instruction address. Okay. Uh, leads to three address instruction, which will typically have the meaning, uh, take the operands from the first two addresses, store the result in the third address, take the next instruction from the next sequential location. Uh, deviation from the fixed sequence requires a branch instruction which could have the meaning uh, compare the operators taken from the first two addresses if they're equal take the next instruction from the third address if not take the next instruction from the next sequential location uh, the number of required addresses can be further in, uh, reduced by allowing the destination of the result to be understood two word in, uh, address, uh, the two address instruction in figure 1.3c takes on two standard forms. So we've got uh, C, we've got the opcode, we've got the operand address, and then we've got the operand or instruction address. Okay. The replacement instruction typically has the meaning take the operands from the two addresses, store the result 
in the second address, replacing the second operand, and take the next instruction from the next sequential location. This type of instruction is convenient if both operands need to be preserved for further operations. Uh, the problem can be avoided by specifying a standard register in the ALU, uh, usually known as the accumulator, as the destination for results. Then a typical two address instruction will have the meaning, take the operands from the two addresses, place the result in the accumulator, and take the next instruction from the next sequential location. With this form, we must also have a store instruction of the form, store the contents of the accumulator in one of the two specified addresses. In either case, the branch instruction might take the form, compare the contents of the first address with the contents of the accumulator. If they are equal, take the next instruction from the second address. If not, take the next instruction from the next sequential location. Now, is that, that's jump not zero, is it? Compare the contents of the first address with the accumulator. Oh, so it's, it's like jump if. <laughs> if they're equal, or is it JMP? I'm not sure, I'm not much of an assembler programmer. Um, but it's jump, uh, if they're equal, then you jump to the specified address. If they're not equal, you just continue on with the uh, instruction pointer. Finally, there is the single address format, figure 1.3D just over here, my opcode and then an operand or instruction address, okay, um, which allows the source of the second operand to be understood. Now the typical instruction will have the meaning, take the first operand from the address location, uh, the second from the accumulator, place the result in the accumulator and take the next instruction from the next sequential location, a typical branch instruction might take the form, test the contents of the accumulator, if they are zero, take the instruction instruction from the address location, if not, continue in sequence. Okay, and that's jump if zero. Most uh, machines also have an unconditional branch which causes the next instruction to take from the address location regardless of the contents of the accumulator. The choice of an instruction format is a difficult one, requiring the balance of a number of conflicting factors. Uh, the single address is obviously most efficient in terms of the amount of memory space required for each instruction. However, a program written in single address instructions will certainly have more instructions than a corresponding one written in multiple address instructions. Obviously, the more information we put in each instruction, the fewer instructions we require to accomplish a given task. But even this is not a simple relationship since there are some types of instructions for which more than one address is not needed. The store instruction discussed earlier is an example. Another is the shift instruction, causing the contents of the accumulator to be shifted left or right a specified number of places. Uh, in this case, the address portion of the instructions is not an address at all and may be interpreted as a binary number indicating the number of places to be shifted. In the class of small machines generally known as mini computers, uh, the word length is usually 16 to 20 bits, making the single address format really the only practical choice. As we increase the word length, we obviously increase our options. In some large computers with long memory words, two or more single address instructions may be packed into a single word, thus reducing the number of memory accesses required for fetching instructions. Other large machines use two address instructions. Still others do both, placing uh, two single access or one two address instruction in each word. This makes the control unit more complex but gives the programmer more flexibility. Three address instructions are seldom, if ever, used for addressing memory directly. Several machines use shorter addresses to select the operands and destinations from eight or more operating registers. Thus, a three address instruction can specify two operand registers and one result register using only nine bits. This approach also requires a two address format for transferring information between memory and the operating registers. We know of no machine using the four address format. 
The number of combinations and variations on these formats is practically unlimited and virtually any combination or variation you might think of has probably been tried by somebody. However, the single address format is used in more different models of computer than any other and except for the chapters on large computers is the format we shall use in this book. Section 1.5 Software Programs written in the form of instructions discussed in the previous section, strings of binary ones and zeros, are known as machine language programs. All programs must be ultimately placed in this form, since these are the only kind of instructions the control unit can interpret. Writing programs in this form is incredibly difficult. First, binary strings are cumbersome, inconvenient, and downright unnatural to humans. Second, the programmer must assign binary addresses to all the data and instructions, and even worse, keep track of all these addresses. In the early days of computers, programmers had to work in machine language, and many despaired of computers ever being of much use because it was virtually impossible to get a really useful program running. As we know, the problem was solved by writing programs to get the computers to do most of the drudgery of programming. The class of programs to process programs is known collectively as software. Uh, oh, there we go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought. So software is programs to access programs. Okay, cool. Um, software is so important to successful operation of a computer that the success of a particular model is often uh, <coughs> Uh, determined more by the quality of the software than by the quality of the hardware, that is, the machine itself. Many of the developments in computer organization have come about in response to the need for efficient processing of the software. Software initially developed in a fairly natural and straightforward manner, but <coughs> has recently become quite complex. As we noted, binary strings are inconvenient, if only because they are so long. It was thus a natural first step to convert instructions to octal form, uh, treating each group of three bits as a binary number and replacing each group with the equivalent octal digit. And it was a simple matter to equip the input section with the capability of converting each octal digit to the equivalent binary form. Once we recognize that the computer can convert from one form to another, it is quite natural to replace the numeric opcodes with mnemonic names such as add, multiply, divide, etc. and write a program to enable the computer to convert these names to the equivalent codes. Next, as we assign variables to memory locations, we can make a table giving the address corresponding to the variable names. In the address portion of the instructions, we simply write the variable name instead of the actual address. We then feed the program into the computer and we also feed in the address table and let the computer replace the variable names with the appropriate addresses. Next, we note that assigning addresses is a routine bookkeeping job, just as well as given to the computer. <coughs> just as well given to the computer. Now our programs need contain little more than instructions consisting only of operation names and variable names. At this point we have an assembly language, the program which assigns the addresses and converts the instructions to machine language form is known as an assembler. Assemblage la uh, assembly language is an immense improvement over machine language, but there are still many problems. The main problem is that an assembly language is computer oriented. Each assembly language statement corresponds to one machine language instruction so that the programmer must be familiar with the instructions and internal organizations of the particular computer. Knowledge of how to program one computer will be of, fair, of little value to programming any other computer. We would prefer a language in which we could write programs that could be run, virtu run on virtually any computer. This leads us to the concept of problem-oriented or high-level languages such as Fortran, Algol, COBOL, PL1, APL, etc. Problem-oriented languages (P.O.L.) <laughs> Gee, that didn't that didn't last long. Problem-oriented languages. Gee, never even heard of that term. Uh, permit us to write our programs in forms as close as possible to the natural human-oriented languages that might be appropriate to the particular problems. Thus, the mat mathematical. Um, formula such as s equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a 
may be evaluated by a single closely analogous program statement in Fortran. The evaluation of a formula such as the above will obviously require many machine instructions. There are also distinct methods for converting POL, problem oriented language programs, into machine language programs. In one method, as the program is executed, each high-level language statement is converted into a corresponding set of machine language instructions, which are immediately executed before proceeding to the next high-level statement. A system functioning in this manner is known as an interpreter. Interpreters are inefficient for programs with repetitive loops. For example, in Fortran, we use do loops to apply the same set of instructions over and over to a whole set of data. An, interpre an interpreter has to translate the instructions in the do loop every pass through the loop, which is clearly inefficient since the translation is the same on every pass. This fault is corrected by compilers, which translate a, the complete high-level program into a complete machine language program that is executed only after the complete program has been compiled. There you go. So we've heard about assemblers, interpreters, and compilers as they spoke about them in 1973. Of course, these days, you will also see JIT compilers and bytecode, which is uh, sort of like where interpreters meet compilers, um, but that's, uh, that, that doesn't exist in 1973. Um, since interpreters and compilers translate into the machine language, they must be written separately for each computer. However, the compiler or interpreter for a given language may be written for any machine having adequate memory capacity to hold the software. Thus, a programmer writing a popular language, such as Fortran, can run his program on practically any computer. Another important class of software is the control program. In the early days of computers, each program run had to be initiated and terminated by an operator. With modern computers capable of executing a complete program in a fraction of a second, such human intervention is obviously impractical. So we have executive routines and monitors which control the actual running of the computer. For example, a card reader may be loaded with large stacks of cards representing hundreds of programs. The executive or monitor will separate the programs, assign them to tapes, schedule compilation and execution, assign memory, schedule printing, etc. all automatically. Except for dealing with emergencies, about all the operators have to do is load the cards and tear off the printer sheets. There are many specialized types of software that we have not discussed. Although the hardware and software of a computer make up an integral and inseparable whole, software represents a complete area of study in itself. In this book, we are concerned with software only to the extent that some understanding of software is essential to good hardware design. A knowledge of programming, at least in a problem-oriented language, is a prerequisite to this book and any person seriously interested in computer design must also study software design. Section 1.6, Summary and Outlook. In the past four section, the organization of a computer may have come to seem fixed almost by divine revelation. Indeed, some designers lament the lack of tolerance for variety in computer design. The accusation has been made that computers are designed out of habit. Uh, there may be truth in the charge, although the present state of affairs was probably forced by practical necessity. No other engineering creation requires of its users anything approximating the level of creative effort continually demanded of the computer programmer. Pressure will always be strong to resist innovations that tend to make obsolete the background and past efforts of programmers. This is especially the case in the context of the general purpose computer. By general purpose, we shall refer to a machine designed to work with nearly equal efficiency on a variety of problems in a variety of high level languages. The engineer has more freedom in the design of a special purpose computer. This is a machine which is designed to perform particularly well at one or a specific few specific tasks. A special purpose computer is nonetheless a computer as it will include the six features 
listed in section 1.2. Output information might not be the familiar hard copy printout and the calculating section must be interpreted broadly, but both will be there. The range of special purpose computers will vary from a fuzzy overlap with the general purpose computer to a one of a kind machine for a single job. With its own higher language, if one is used at all, the designer, the designer will of course have complete freedom in the design of the latter type of machine. The following is a list of the classes of digital systems which we have discussed thus far in this chapter. 1. General Purpose Digital Computer 2. Special Purpose Digital Computer 3. Vector Handling Digital System but not 1 or 2 4. Sequential Circuit but not 1, 2 or 3 the last two entries on the list are not computers. A magnetic tape unit, which falls into category 3, for example, is not a digital computer because its memory does not store instructions for controlling its internal, internal operations. And there's a footnote there that says, The concept of microprogramming will force us to modify our concepts slightly, but we defer this topic until chapter 8. So of course, you know, a tape, a, 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 a tape drive certainly could have a microcode, I think is what they're alluding to there. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of those um, are actually essentially computers by these definitions, uh, especially these days. Um, okay, so just continuing there, this is the final part of the introduction chapter. As mentioned earlier, the design techniques to be... <coughs> As mentioned earlier, the design techniques to be presented in this book may be applied to digital systems in any of the first three categories. Our approach in chapters six, <coughs> 2, 6, and 7 will be to treat one design example in all its facets. In subsequent chapters and in the problems, many other examples will be treated more rapidly or in part. There are a few arguments for choosing whether a general purpose digital computer as the primary example. We have chosen a microcomputer with an 18-bit word length. A prerequisite of the design process is a dedicated description of the system to be designed. For our mini computer, the description will consume all of chapter 2. Uh, background, definitions, and a language for the design process are presented in chapters 3, 4, and 5. With the exception of the input and output facilities, the, micro, the mini computer is designed in chapters 6 and 7. Now, I'm not sure what we should do here. So, we, we, we've looked through the introduction. Um, there's uh, about 450-odd pages to go. So, I suppose we'll just flip through and have a bit of a squeeze. Uh, Perhaps we'll read the introduction of every chapter and then just uh, have, a have a look at the diagrams and such. So um, this is chapter two, organization and programming of a small computer. <sighs> Section 2.1, introduction. Uh, this chapter contains a discussion of the organization and assembly language <coughs> uh, programming of a mini computer. At the risk of seeming trite, we shall label this computer SIC for Small Instructional Computer. Uh, a name will prove convenient since frequent references to the machine will be necessary. Uh, the, uh, the previous <coughs> background of readers in assembly language programming will vary greatly. Uh, for the reader whose only programming experience has been in Fortran, COBOL or some other high level language, um, this chapter is intended to serve two purposes. First, it will serve as the first introduction to assembly, lang uh, assembly language programming. Second, it involves a description of a mini computer sufficiently complete to serve as a basis for hardware design. The reader who is already familiar with assembly language programming should be able to move rapidly through the chapter. All readers must learn the organization and instruction codes of uh, SIC, uh, which is again just repeating the small instructional computer, uh, so they can follow the design of the SIC control unit in chapters 6 and 7. Uh, historically, the development and use of computing machines uh, preceded the invention of high-level languages. The development of these languages was heavily influenced by the already existing machine languages. Fortran, for example, is really a marriage of the notation of ordinary algebra with the control features of machine language. In this chapter, we shall proceed in reverse in reverse to uncover the machine language counterparts of the basic Fortran operations. We shall not attempt to illustrate all of the procedures involved 
in machine language programming. Armed with an understanding of the relation between Fortran and machine language, uh, the reader should be able to expound the list of machine language programming techniques to be presented. Some of the examples may resemble elementary compiler techniques. Our purpose is only to make to take maximum advantage of the reader's experience in a high-level language. Compilers as such will not be treated in this book. SIC is typical of several existing mini computers. Left out of this machine are many of the sophistications found in computers intended for high speed, maximum throughput batch processing applications. All of the essential features which serve to identify a digital system as a general purpose computer are included. We shall stay with this machine through to the end of chapter 7. In this way we hope to provide the reader with the basic tools of computer design without inundating him with details at the outset. Uh, section 2.2 .2, remarks on number systems so we've got uh, two's complement down here very good um, so we're just talking about uh, operations with two's complement figure 2.1 the example of two's complement addition okay very good of course with two's complement you can represent positive and negative numbers and then process them the same way for, for addition and subtraction and such um, so that's interesting that they jumped straight onto two's complement. They didn't bother with uh, one's complement uh, or, 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 or no complement, which is also, of course, a possibility. Um, okay. Layout of a small instructional computer. So we've got a program counter. We've got an accumulator. We've got an instruction register. We've got index registers. There's a footnote here. Uh, the, uh, so up here it says uh, program counter. The machine language instructions making up a program must all reside in the random access memory of the machine in order for the program to be executed. And the footnote is, the exception to this rule is memory overlays. However, it is not possible to jump directly from one overlay to instru an instruction in another overlay. Okay. <sighs> So yes, uh, our, our, um, our, our layout um, is divided into program counter, accumulator, instruction register, uh, the instruction register must store 18 bits, uh, index registers, so there's going to be two index registers, register A and register B, very good, and that looks like it, program counter, accumulator, I'm going to read this whole section actually because that's all pretty important stuff. So this is uh, section 2.3, layout of a small instructional computer, SIC. In chapter one, it was established that every computer includes a memory for storing instructions and data in binary form. Associated with each memory location is an address. The method by which an address is used electronically to obtain the components of a memory location will be discussed in the next chapter. SIC has 2 to the power of 13 equals 8192 memory location whose address are numbered from 0 through to the power of uh, 2 to the power of 13 minus 1. Uh, these addresses will be referred to as binary numbers or octal numbers. Uh, in octal the range of addresses is from 0 to 17777. Uh, each item stored in memory, whether data or instruction, has the form of an 8-bit binary number. I just need to take a quick break. A quick break. I'm back. So uh, on we go. <clears throat> the large number of memory locations required indicates that the memory must be realized physically by a set of relatively inexpensive memory elements. The speed at which a machine can execute instructions is dependent on the time required to electronically select a location and acquire or replace its contents. A memory in which any location can be accessed in the same short time interval is called a random access memory. One example of a reasonably inexpensive random access memory is a magnetic core memory. The control unit shown in figure 1.2 Oh, I think that was our, yeah, I remember figure point one point one point two. It's all the way back. Are we going to go back and refer to it? Why not? We'll find it. Ah, figure 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20
1.2. Okay, now this was the control unit, the ALU, input, memory, output. So we're talking about control unit, no problem. All right, the control unit shown in figure 1.2 must be capable of storing uh, some information in order to execute instructions. The binary representation of the instruction being executed is stored in an instruction register. The address of the next instruction in memory is stored in the program counter. An accumulator for storing the results of computations is included in the arithmetic section as discussed in chapter 1. Two additional registers called index registers are included. <coughs> Two registers would, which need not concern us until chapter 6 are a memory address register and a memory data register. All of these registers consist of electronic storage elements which function at the highest possible speed. A discussion of the purpose of these registers follows. A. Program Counter the machine language instructions making up a program must all reside in the random access memory of the machine in order for the program to be executed. There's a note here that says the exception to this rule is memory overlays. However, it is not possible to jump directly from one overlay to an instruction in another overlay. In any machine, it is possible to load a short program into memory utilizing switches on the control console. Usually programs are loaded into memory from a card reader or magnetic tape by a program called a loader, which might be part of the computer's software operating system. The program counter is a register which stores the address of the ne next instruction to be executed by the computer. At some point during the execution of most instructions, the number in the program counter is incremented by one. Thus, instructions are executed in the order of their locations in memory. The only exceptions occur in the event of machine language branch instructions analogous to the if and go to statements. The program counter is a 13-bit register <coughs> in order that an instruction may be obtained from any of the 2 to the 13 memory locations. Accumulator. An accumulator is utilized as temporary storage for the results of a computation. In some cases it may store one of the arguments as well. For example, addition is accomplished by adding a word from the random access memory to the contents of the accumulator and leaving the result in the accumulator. A 19th bit, called the link, is placed at left of the accumulator to facilitate various arithmetic operations. Presumably that's the carry bit. I've never heard of the link. Uh, C, the instruction register. In order for an instruction to be executed, it must be read from memory and placed in the instruction register. In this position, the binary bits of the instruction are decoded to generate control signals, which are active throughout the period of execution. The instruction to be placed in the instruction register is determined by the contents of the program counter. The instruction register must store 18 bits. Index registers. Two index registers are included in the machine. We shall label these index register A and index register B. The contents of these registers may be added to the address portion of an instruction to permit repetition of that instruction on an array of data words. Special instructions are provided for incrementing the index registers following each pass through some sequence of instructions. That sounded a little bit like self-modifying code, didn't it? What did they say? Special instructions are provided for, for incrementing the index registers following each pass through some sequence of instructions. Oh, okay, yeah, that's okay. That's just code to, uh, uh, to uh, increment the registers. That's not related to code. It's related to data. Okay. In effect, this permits convenient execution of do loops in Fortran. Uh, the mechanism of indexing will become clear in the next two sections. Index registers are 13-bit registers. <clears throat> Section 2.4, SIC instructions. Might as well read this as well, huh? Why not? So this is going to talk about the uh, opcode formats and, and, and so on. Um, so all 18 bits of an instruction word are necessary to completely define an instruction. Any 18-bit word placed in the instruction register will cause some 
sort of instruction to be executed. The computer cannot distinguish between an instruction word and a data word. If a program error causes a data word to be executed, ex executed the results are unpredictable. <clears throat> okay, so the first uh, three bits, <clears throat> which uh, have an octal uh, uh, representation and a mnemonic. <clears throat> okay, so we've got uh, increment and skip if zero load accumulator, logical and, two's complement add. Of course, two co two's complement add can uh, facilitate uh, um, subtraction as well. Um, jump to subroutine, uh, deposit accumulator, jump, and then operate or input output instructions. Okay. So it looks like they sort of uh, uh, sort of ferry, ferry uh, border instructions through with the uh, with the with the octal seven um, opcode. Okay. <sighs> now, okay. So they're showing you here. Um, the load accumulator instruction is 001 and then it looks like there's two bits of extra context and then there's a what's that 3 6 9 12 13 13 bit address so presumably load accumulator will dereference the address get the value and store it in the accumulator register and 00 they don't seem to be used for the time being, we are assuming that bits 3 and 4 are both 0, so that the uh, second octal digit from the left will always be 0 or 1. Still more convenient, convenient is the form LAC13. Throughout our discussion, LA, LAC13 shall have the same meaning as expressions 2.4 and 2.5. Okay, fascinating. Wow, okay. Mm. So this is the assembly language equivalent, load accumulator 13. So just looking down here, they've got a footnote from here. Um, this is the case with all instructions which place the contents of one register, including memory locations in another register. The information remains in the first register as well. This is consistent with the nature of Fortran replacement statements. Hmm. Oh, well, We'd have to read that very closely, but basically, it's uh, they they they've got a a, a a a very formal and complete binary uh, spec, uh, and then they've got a corresponding uh, assembly language uh, <coughs> spec. So we go on to learn about uh, the layout of uh, RAM and then uh, the various states of the registers. Very good. So this is the execution of TAD 13. What was TAD? That was two, two's complement add. So it's adding, um, it's adding this value into... the accumulator. There you go. And this is the link which is obviously the uh, <clears throat> um, the carry bit I guess. So 
Now, what is this? Op R, there we go, operate instructions. So when the opcode is seven, um, then uh, these additional operate instructions are available. And they've got RAR, rotate accumulator right, and RAL, ro rotate accumulator left, is included in the rotation operations. For RAR, the link is rotated into bit zero of the accumulator, and, f and bit 17 is placed in the link. There you go. So here's the list of uh, operate instructions. Halt, uh, no operation or NOP, uh, clear accumulator, set accumulator. Okay. Uh, Complement bits of accumulator, clear link to zero, set link to one, skip next instruction if accumulator is greater than or equal to zero, Skip next instruction if accumulator equals zero. Skip next instruction if link equals zero. Rotate left, rotate right. Deposit contents of accumulator in index register A. Deposit contents of accumulator in index register B. Deposit contents of index register A in accumulator. Deposit contents of index register B in accumulator. Increment index register A, increment index register B. There we go. So that accumulator is really central to everything, isn't it? Section 2.5, Programming. Let's read this bit. Uh, in order to avoid the presentation of an excessive <clears throat> number of programming examples, we shall illustrate how the basic Fortran operations could be accomplished in machine language. Thus, the reader will be able to generate his own examples by drawing on his Fortran programming experience. In this section, we only illustrate how the reader can use his ingenuity to replace Fortran routines with sequences of matching assembly instructions. This falls significantly short of defining a compiler or a set of rules for accomplishing this task automatically. Let us consider first given a version of Fortran consisting of replacement uh, of statements ix equals go to statements, numerical if statements, do statements, arithmetic expressions and subroutine calls the reader will recognize that any program can be written, although not necessarily conveniently using only these statements. The replacement statement can be accomplished using only the instruction DAC. Uh, suppose the quantity to replace the variable IXX, which we shall assume has been assigned to memory location 100, has been calculated and placed in the accumulator. Then the instruction DAC100 causes IXX to take on its new value. The control statements if and go to are implemented easily in machine language. The statement jump 100 could mean identically go to 100 if the first statement of Fortran instruction 100 was stored in memory location 100. Or 100 I probably should say. Assume now that Fortran instructions 100, 110 and 120 begin in the respective SIC memory locations and IXX is assigned to location 1000. Then we may implement the Fortran instruction IFIXX 1001101120 as follows. Uh, load the accumulator 1000, uh, skip, uh, jump, and <laughs> skip, and jump and jump. Ah, uh, there we go. Notice that the argument, uh, you know, these if statements, by the way, perhaps you've figured it out. If you're not a Fortran programmer, um, the, this f um, uh, expression uh, takes a takes a, a numeric value, and then it has three places to jump to. Um, so um, it it, it uh, it's less than equal to zero or above, uh, I believe. Uh, so yeah, it's very different to what you'd expect these days from an if statement in a high level language. This one is, it just gives you an alternative, uh, three um, uh, uh, branch candidates, depending on the value. Um, so um, I think SKP, I forget, so, so skip if positive maybe, skip if zero. Yeah, that must be what it is. Shall we go back to our... Um, yeah, there we go. So, 
uh, SKP if it's greater than or equal to zero, which we can infer, skip positive. So if, if the uh, if the register um, uh, or the memory uh, uh, memory location uh, one zero 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 skip positive. So if if the if it's if it's positive, then you go to uh, one hundred here. Right, right. So, oh man, I am not an assembly language programmer, but let's go through this carefully. So we we uh, we, uh, we we load uh, the value, then uh, we skip if if it's uh, if it's positive. So uh, uh, if it is positive, we'll we'll go to here, and we'll skip if it's zero. And go here. So um, oh man, I don't want to think this hard about it. Uh, all right. Look, I won't take your time with this, but uh, I, I, I believe that's probably going to be, if it's negative, we go here. If it's zero, we go here. And if it's positive, we go here. So we come in, it's positive, we skip. We skip zero. Yeah, and so if it is positive, we skip positive, we land here. If we skip zero, it's positive, we, go, we jump 120. Um, uh, if it was zero, then uh, it's positive or zero, which is right. You land here. It's zero. You skip. Um, so you jump here. That's good. So we're taking if one xxx, which is memory location one zero zero zero. Um, if if it's uh, less than zero, we go here. If it is zero, we go here. And if otherwise, if it's positive, we go here. There we go. That wasn't so hard after all, was it? Maybe there's an assembly programmer in me waiting to get out. Uh, and then uh, looks like we've got a more complicated program coming up. Oh, that's to do. Uh, okay, so this is um, to to do a more complicated expression, an assignment of n from m1 plus the absolute value of m2 minus m3. Um, now we're going to have uh, like some sort of a, a call CMA. What does CMA do? Uh, complement bits of accumulator. There doesn't seem to be any push or uh, how do we do the absolute value of M2? Perhaps we'll just keep reading here. I'm a bit curious about how to do the more complicated example. Notice that the argument of the if statement is immediately placed in the accumulator. Uh, the instruction SKP causes the next instruction to be skip, skipped if IXX is greater than or equal to zero. If JMP100 is not skipped, then the next instruction is taken from location 100. If JMP100 is skipped, then the next instruction is SKZ. Thus, control jumps to location 110. Uh, if the accumulator is zero, and to 120, if the accumulator is greater than zero. The only instruction which is obviously intended to accomplish arithmetic is TAD. However, any arithmet arithmetic expression can be accomplished using this instruction together with LAC and the various operate instructions. Consider, for example, N equals M1 plus absolute value of M2 minus M3. Uh, the sequence of instructions in figure 2.5 can be used to compute the arithmetic expression on the right. Assume n, uh, okay, this is 215. Uh, assume m1 is assigned to 1001, m2 to 1002, and m3 to 1003, and that the number 
001 is stored in 2000. Uh, since we shall wish to follow the program through several jump instructions, it is necessary to indicate the location in memory at the left of each instruction. Which of course we didn't do over here, did we? No, but we're doing that here and that's helpful. Okay. Uh, the first instruction in figure uh, 2.5 loads the argument M2. Here, if M2 is negative, the program jumps to location 200. Okay, here. Okay, so we go down, 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 and then down, 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 down. <coughs> cool. Uh, uh, the CMA takes the ones complement of M2, uh, adding plus one as is specified by instructions 201, leaves the two complement of M2 in the accumulator. Uh, then the uh, program jumps back to location 103. Uh, if M2 is positive, the instruction in location 102 is skipped. In either case, the absolute value of M2 is in the accumulator just prior to the execution of instruction 103. Oh, of course, so um, the absolute value of M2, that doesn't need to be a function call, and they just do it here by testing the, um, uh, testing the value M2 and, and figuring out if it's, uh, if it's positive or not. <sighs> Fair enough. So there's no actual function call that's needed here, so, and we can do the rest of memory addresses and accumulators. So there you go. Very good. So just learning some basic accumulator, uh, uh, sorry, uh, assembly language programming for our uh, SIC computer. Uh, on we go. So we're going to do double position, double precision addition. Okay. There you go. So um, th this is not talking about floating point. It's just talking about using uh, double word values for uh, for the full value. So um, are they going to? Well, let's just let's have a quick look. So um, uh, the first instruction uh, clears the link to prepare for a possible carry from the least significant 18 bits. These portions of the two arguments are added by instructions 101 and 102. Uh, the result is stored in location 1004 as illustrated in figure 2.6b here. For the particular example, a carry propagates to the link where it remains after a new argument is placed in the accumulator. The addition of the most significant 18 bits of the argument is accomplished by instructions uh, 104 and through to 107 uh, as illustrated in figure 2.6c. Uh, if the link contains a 1, 1 is added to this result. Uh, for the example shown, if the link is 1, representing a carry from the least significant 18 bits to the most significant 18 bits, the addition of this carry is shown in figure 2.6c, which is uh, here. Um, <sighs> Uh, if the link contains a zero, instruction 107 is skipped, and which is over here. Um, and uh, the most significant 18 bits of the link result are placed in location 105. Here. Very good. Okay, so we've got indexing and indirect ide indexing. We'll read this. <coughs> Uh, in this section, we shall see that do loops can be implemented by a sequence of instructions which use indexing or indirect addressing or both. Uh, both of these techniques may be used for other purposes. Indirect addressing, in particular, is useful in information retrieval and various types of simulations. Uh, the reader will recall that bits 3 and 4 of the instructions have yet to be discussed. The meanings of these bits, which apply only in the case of memory reference instructions, may be found in figure 2.7. Okay, here's figure 2.7. So we've got uh, bits 3 and 4 of our instruction, uh, and uh, we've got uh, just four possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So, um, okay, these are used to nominate or, or control how indexing um, is done. Okay. 
So uh, if they're 0, 0, then there's no indexing. Uh, if they're 0, 1, then they use indirect addressing. If they're 1, 0, we add index register A to the address. Otherwise, we add in, uh, register B to the address. OK, cool. There you go. All right, so basically, we can take all of this to get an actual final address. Um, We need to learn about indirect addressing now and what they mean by that. If bit 3 is 0 and bit 4 is 1, then the address specified in the instruction does not contain the actual argument of the operation. Instead, the instruction specifies the address of a memory location containing a word whose last 13 bits are the address of the argument. This technique is called indirect addressing. Consider, for example, a set of memory locations specified as in figure 2.8. Notice that the instruction in location 200 is LAC. Since bit 4 is a 1, indirect addressing is specified. Thus, location 600 contains the uh, which is the 600 here. <clears throat> Thus the location 600 contains the address of the argument. Uh, this address is 700 and finally the number 000005 is loaded into the accumulator from that location. There you go. So um, using uh, using this uh, protocol, you can uh, you can just uh, provide the value directly with zero zero. You can indirectly address the the, the value uh, using zero one, and then you can uh, use either index register A or index register register B um, to to compute an address. Very good. So uh, on we go. All right. Is a do loop. Uh, okay, we're not going to look closely at that. So here they're just going uh, carefully through the example uh, of assembly language here, uh, which is okay. So you can just see this just uh, just loops until um, the accumulator is uh, less than uh, 2004. Oh no, it just loops back here. So this is the inner part of the loop. This sets everything up. Fair enough. Now, on we go. All right, so this is going to get pretty heavy with the uh, assembly language programming of our particular machine. You know, I'm reminded of um, Donald Knuth's um, uh, assembly language. He invented one. I'll put the name of it up on the thing. Um, I forget that what, what was that was called. But this is the same thing. They've just invented an assembly language for their uh, fictional machine and they're showing us how to program it. So uh, now we learn the JMS instruction. So uh, the use of the JMS instruction is illustrated in figure 212. The subroutine, which begins at location 1000, takes advantage of De Morgan's theorem to compute the OR function as given by equation 210 which A or B equals inverse of A and the inverse of B, inverse of. Right. Oh, man, I haven't thought hard about that for like 20 years, and I'm not going to think hard about it right now. 
let's see what it wraps up. It's talking about assemblage language. So, so far, relatively few memory locations have been required, and the assignment of numbers to those locations has not been difficult. In writing programs in assembly language, the task of allocating memory locations for data storage and program storage in advance is not pleasant. Should a routine require more storage or use more constants than envisioned, at first it may become necessary to reassign an entire region of storage. For most machines, the assembler provides a way around this problem. As well as translating mnemonic instructions to a binary code, this program will assign actual storage locations. The programmer need only specify a string of characters representing a variable, and the assembler will assign a memory location. It may be desired to jump to an instruction whose numerical memory location is not known precisely. Uh, it is possible to label any statement by a string of characters, AAA for example, and then write the statement jump, uh, jump AAA, which will cause a jump to the instruction in AAA. The programmer is usually allowed to label a statement with a specific numbered memory location or symbolically with a character string or omit the label. If there are no contradictions between memory locations specified by a number, the assembler will fit it all together in memory. All right, on we go. It's so a program, uh, 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 program list in assembly language. Okay, I'm not sure what he means by that. All right. Now what are we looking at here? Example 2.3, uh, write a program which will accomplish the multiplication of two 18-bit numbers in SIC. Assume that these numbers are stored in two's complement form. Solution, the multiplication routine as presented in figure 214 assumes that the multiply Multiplier and multiplicand are stored in MLTR and MLTD, respectively. <sighs> 36 bits must be allowed for storage of the product. The most significant 18 bits will be found by PROD, or PROD1, and the least significant bits in PROD2. For purposes of explanation, the program has been separated by brackets into four sections. The first section merely provides for initializing the index and setting the product initially to zero. The second section takes the absolute value of both blah, blah, blah. So just going through the, um, the sections here, the four sections, as they said, here's the first section, second section, third section, and the fourth section. Okay. And then there's a bunch of problems given to you. And if you were a good student, you would do all of these problems. Shall we read them? We won't do them, but let's have a look. Uh, problem 2.1. Prove that adding the twos complement forms of two negative numbers will give the proper twos complement result if the sum of the magnitudes is less than two to the power of n minus one. Note that the addition is physically addition modulo two to the power of n. 2.2. Suppose that indexing were eliminated from SIC so that 14 memory references instructions could be permitted. Uh, list some additional memory reference instructions which you think would be of value. All right, section 2.3. Suppose that a computer is to be assigned with the same memory reference instructions as SIC but with eight index registers. How could index addressing be employed so that eight 1192 words of random access memory could still be used. So just a bit layout for the instructions in such a machine. Suppose that the number of IO instructions and operate instructions in SIC are the same. If this, if in this case, what would be the maximum number of distinct operate instructions which could be specified? Hmm. 2.5, write in SIC assembly language the equivalent of a Fortran logical if statement. Okay, well, we kind of did that earlier, didn't we? I think mean, we did. That was given. Anyway, uh, section 2.6, uh, devise a sequence of SIC instructions which will accomplish the equivalent of the do loop in figure 2.9 without using either indexing or indirect addressing. Hmm. 2.7, write an SIC assembly language 
uh, write in SIC assembly language a program for adding the rows of a 10x10 matrix. Uh, use index registers insofar as possible to imitate a nested do loop approach. 2.8 suggest a routine which demands depends on in a direct, indirect addressing to perform a search of a list. 2.9 write a short sequence of instructions utilizing any SIC instructions except ISZ which will accomplish the same function as an ISZ instructions. Okay, cool. Uh, 2.10, write a sequence of SIC instructions which will reorder the bits of a word in memory as follows. Okay. Hint, use the instruction AND to accomplish masking and use rotate instructions. Oh, wow, that'd be fun. I'm not going to think hard about it. That'd take me, that, I wouldn't be able to do that very quickly. That'd take a while. Wow, that's a really good question though. I like 210. Have a go at that if you if you want to do something interesting. Wow, that'd be great. <laughs> Alright, uh, 211. Suppose two floating point numbers are stored with 18-bit characteristics located immediately following 18-bit mantises in memory. Assume that the binary point is between bit 0 and bit 1 for both mantises. Uh, the characteristics need not be equal. Oh, they're talking about mantises. So they're... I assume that their uh, their um, precision stuff was uh, integers, um, but it's it's perhaps not. Is it, uh, did they develop a floating point format? I didn't notice that. How did I miss that? They did say something about uh, double precision, didn't they? I'm not sure where I saw that. All right. Well, that's interesting. So I'm not sure why they're suddenly talking about mantises here, because that has that regards uh, floating point. So maybe they maybe they did. Did I miss that? That must have been the uh, double precision thing they were talking about. I thought that was just double. Like anyway, I thought that was like big integers, you know, like 64-bit integers or whatever. Anyway, uh, 212. Write a sequence of instructions that will accomplish multiplication of two floating point numbers, such as discussed in problem 211. Yeah, right. So maybe um, maybe they haven't told us about floating point yet. 211 is supposed two floating point numbers are stored with 18-bit characteristics located immediately following 18-bit mantises in memory. Assume that the binary point is between bit 0 and bit 1 uh, uh, for both mantises. The characteristics need not be equal. Write a sequence of SIC instructions which will accomplish addition of the two floating point numbers. Oh man, I wouldn't want to think hard about that. Alright, 2.13. Two write a SIC assembly language version of a Fortran subroutine call. Include the mechanism for the transfer of arguments. Write routines which could tolerate separate compilations of the main routine and the subroutine. 214. Write a sequence of instructions which will call a subroutine without using the JMS instructions. Assume that no transfer of arguments is required. 215. Write in SIC assembly language a sequence of instructions which will illustrate the accomplishment of a simple Fortran function subroutine. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, 216. Write in SIC assembly language a sequence of instructions which will accomplish division of two 18-bit fixed point numbers. Wow. Did they even tell us about fixed point? Anyway. Um, 217. Write in SIC assembly language routines. <clears throat> write in SIC assembly language routines which will perform bit by bit the following Boolean operations on two 18-bit words. A or B exclusive or set the operations up as subroutines which will use the accumulator and one word of memory as arguments. 218. Justify the method of converting a binary number to octal form given in section 2.2. Justify the method in section 2.2. I don't remember what that was. We're going to go and look back. That's ah, all the way back. 
All right, now we're up to chapter three, system components. I'll read the introduction. So let's have a look at, at the introduction to system components. Uh, in this chapter, we will present a brief and rather general discussion of some of the basic types of logic and memory devices used in digital computers. The actual design of these devices is not the concern of the system designer, who generally regards them as black boxes with certain known characteristics. On the other hand, intelligent selection and application of these devices does require some understanding of their operation and an appreciation of their limitations. In addition, without some physical interpretation of registers, memory, etc., much of the material in following chapters may, be, may seem too abstract to many readers. Readers who are already familiar with digital hardware may skip the majority of the topics in this chapter without loss of continuity. Logic circuits are implemented in a tremendous variety of technologies. There is diode transistor logic, DTL, transistor transistor logic, TTL, MOS logic, uh, okay, metal oxide semiconductor, uh, emitter coupled logic, ECL, uh, etc. Uh, these uh, various types differ in matters of speed, cost, power consumption, physical dimensions, immunity to environmental influences, etc. But they all accomplish the same basic purpose, and from the point of view of this book, the differences are of little importance. All of them accept input signals in which the voltage levels represent the value of certain logical binary value variables and produce output signals in which the voltage levels correspond to logical functions of the input variables. Until recently, single logic circuits usually implemented very simple functions such as AND, OR, and NOT. With the uh, advent of integrated circuits, more complex functions are available in single circuit packages. Uh, the purpose of logic circuits then is to process signals and produce outputs which, which are functions of the inputs. The outputs are available only during the duration of the input signals. The purpose of memory devices is to store information for later use, generally returning it without alteration in the same form as it was originally stored. The definition of memory is elusive. We shall simply settle for the intuitive idea that a memory device is any device which we place in a specific identifiable physical state for the specific purpose of preserving information without alteration until a later time. Isn't that funny? It's a, I, I really like that. <laughs> the definition of memory is elusive. That's excellent. What a cool, cool statement. All right. Um, Memory devices may be classified in a number of different ways. First, most may be classified as being either magnetic or electronic. Magnetic device devices utilize ferromagnetic materials which can be placed in specific magnetic state by the passage of electric currents through them or near them and which then maintain these states indefinitely until interrogated. The chief types of magnetic memory are tape, disk, drum, and core. Electronic memory devices are primarily transistor and diode circuits in which the outputs can be set to certain voltage levels by the application of certain input signals and will be maintained even when the input signals are removed. The chief electronic memory device is the flip-flop, which can in turn be used to construct memory register memories, RM. Now those flip-flops these days, we'd call them static RAM, and they're expensive, but they're very fast, and they also chew up a fair bit of power, I think. Um, and But yet yeah, your, your CPU, your contemporary CPU, will have uh, uh, flip-flops for static RAM in the CPU. Um, the various caches are probably using that as well, the L1, L2, and L3 caches. Then when you're at an actual RAM, uh, usually these days, that's what they call DRAM, which is dynamic RAM, which is different to static RAM. The thing about DRAM is it's heaps cheaper than static RAM, um, and it just uses a capacitor to store the value. And uh, a read is destructive, so after it reads, it has to write the value back. Uh, so that's how DRAM works, and, and, and most of the RAM in your computer is DRAM. Of course, uh, DRAM didn't exist yet, um, and because uh, they, they just call it register memories, it's flip-flop. Uh, flip-flop gates, but we call that static RAM these days, and the thing to know about it is that it's relatively expensive, but it's very fast. All right. 
Uh, memories may also be classified by the type of access to the stored information. In random access memories, all stored information is equally accessible in the sense that any given piece of information may be retrieved in exactly the same length of time as any other piece of information. <sighs> Core memory and slower semiconductor memories are usually classified as RAM. Tape, by contrast, is a sequential memory in which information can be retrieved only in the same order it was stored. When you want a particular piece of information off tape, you simply start running the tape until the desired information comes into position to be read. The access time is thus dependent on where the desired information is located relative to the starting point. Yeah, I might just comment there on that on that mark uh, remark they made about how um, uh, RAM uh, uh, can be accessed uh, at, at the same time as any other piece of information. In practice, actually. Uh, the timing of instruction uh, processing times and timing of uh, random of memory accesses uh, it can actually vary um, and it can end up being a, a security problem for you when you if you're doing encryption and stuff uh, because uh, some uh, some arguments to some uh, to the same instruction will change the time that the uh, instruction takes to process depending on what upper ends it's processing um, and so then you can reverse that and you can say oh well if, if, it, if it completed quickly then the upper end was like this and if it completed slowly then the upper end was like that um, and then people can start guessing about about the nature of your inputs which you don't want when you are doing crypto so this timing stuff that they're talking about they're, they're not actually they, they shouldn't say that it actually does happen in the same amount of time because it won't necessarily actually do that at all there, there could be uh, you, you, you could should perhaps instead say that the time is unspecified or the time uh, sits in some probability distribution like some normal distribution um, but it, it can still depend on the on the operands and it can also depend on the actual implementations you can imagine of course having four memory bays in your computer and the, accessing one memory of a bay versus another memory bay some of the wires will be a bit shorter some of them might be a bit longer you know um, that there are various reasons why the actual timing of the actual random stuff access memory access uh, you know might not be exactly um, yeah so uh, I, I think that 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 statement is probably a bit out of date it says here um, in random access memories RAM all, inform all stored information is equally accessible in the sense that any given piece of information may be retrieved in exactly the same length of time as any other piece of information. So they should they should not use the word exactly there, um, you know, uh, in, in roughly the same uh, amount of time. Anyway, it, 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 it sounds like nitpicking, but it actually turns out to be very important uh, for security uh, uh, code uh, in some situations. But, you know, so uh, anyway, let's just say that RAM is roughly quick and roughly the same. Anyway. Oh, look, they are going to talk about SRAM here. Oh, no, no. Oh, okay, there you go. So they're talking about, uh, okay, they talked about SM. For sequential memory and then they have semi-random access memories SRAM of course these days we call SRAM static RAM and we probably don't talk about semi-random access memories anymore so this is a this is a case where we're looking at some outdated information anyway here we go between these two categories are disk and drum which are semi-random access memories uh, in these devices uh, any given area or sector of memory can be accessed in the same time as any other but within a given area you must wait for a given piece of information to move into position and to be read a final special category which resembles logic as well as memory is the read only memory the stored information is actually built into the structure of the device the stored information can then be read out electronically but can but can be altered only by mechanical alteration of the structure of the device the above classification and listing is quite broad and general and is not intended to be complete. There are many other specialized memory devices, some fitting into the 
the above categories, some not really fitting into any category. Uh, there we go, section 3.2, diode logic. So we probably, uh, we probably understand diode logic pretty well. So they're talking about the Zeno breakdown voltage, which is here. Um, very good. So, you know, a, a diode um, works as long as you don't uh, exceed the Zeno voltage. And if you do, it, uh, it breaks down. So, diode transistor logic. Okay, and here we've got a, um, a typical um, uh, transistor. These are, um, what do they call them? Uh, junction, j j uh, not JFETs. These are um, bipolar, uh, BJTs, bipolar junction transistors. Um, and of course, uh, these are not the transistors that we use uh, in semiconductors these days. Um, the, the, uh, usually, uh, the, the integrated circuits use uh, MOSFETs, uh, which uh, are different. Okay, we've got an inverter here with, uh, um, with the transistor. Very good. Uh, diode transistor gate. Okay. So... Uh, that's uh, okay. Just implementing some um, various uh, logic uh, comp uh, components with uh, uh, transistors. Very good. Conversion of NAND, NAND, and to AND or. Now they're probably making the point here that you can actually um, equivalently model. Um, um, uh, 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 circuits or logic elements uh, with, uh, so you can use um, uh, and uh, NAND gates into a NAND gates. You can use NAND gates into a NOR gate, and you can use AND gates into an OR gate, and accomplish, uh, I believe, the same, uh, the same thing. Uh, now. Uh, you will notice they haven't uh, got the AND and the OR um, symbols developed. This is 1973, so it obviously predates the uh, the, the curved box and the and the pointy uh, box for the, the AND and ORs. Uh, they are using the zero to implement the inversion. So uh, that little dot there, that's contemporary. We still use that, um, whereas the A and the OR, that those have been uh, standardized uh, with different notation, graphical notation. Uh, so we've got uh, section 3.4, speed and delay in logic circuits. Yes, so of course there's a rise time and there's a clock and there's the falling edge and there's the rising edge uh, and here we go. They just give you uh, give you some talk about uh, the various times um, and so this is the actual signal here and this is the logical uh, um, <clears throat> yeah. So this is the transient response of a transistor inverter. There you go. So when we go, uh, section 3.5, flip-flops and register memory, RM. So as they say, that they're implementing re uh, resistors with flip-flops. That's very good. That's what, even what we do to these days. That's, that's still uh, uh, contemporary. That's what we do. Uh, and here we go, implementing a, uh, a flip-flop with, um, with uh, two NOR gates. And the C and the S, and one is carry and one is set. Is it or something like that? I forget. What? Oh, here we go. And here's the uh, flip flop. Uh, and it's SC again. The SC flip flop. So a pulse on the S input will set the flip flop. That is, drive the Q output to the one level, and the Q invert output to the zero, zero level. A, a, a pulse on the C line will clear, reset the flip-flop. Okay, so it's S for set and C for clear for our flip-flop. And then you've got Q and not Q. 
and here's the here's the truth table for that. There you go. Fascinating. You notice down here when that we're both set at the same time. They're called the don't care entries. Um, so the don't care entries for XV plus one in the last two rows reflect the fact that the operation is indeterminate if both inputs are pulsed at the same time and that this input condition should therefore not be permitted to occur. The SC flip-flop may be considered a memory device because the state of the outputs indicates which input was last pulsed. Another, in t another important type is the JK flip-flop, uh, which is the same as the SC flip-flop, except that simultaneous inputs on both input lines are allowed and cause the flip-flop to change state. A third type of flip-flop, the T flip-flop, there's a note here. Where did that note come from? up here. A flip-flop operating in the above fashion is known as a set clear or SC flip-flop. This type of flip-flop is more commonly known as the RS set reset set flip-flop. However, the IEEE standards specify clear as preferable to reset. Interesting. And I think the JK flip-flops are contemporary. I think those are the ones that we actually use. So perhaps this type of uh, inputs uh, uh, um, obsolete. I'm not sure. And then, they, as they said, a third type of flip-flop, the T flip-flop, has only one input. If a pulse occurs on the T input, the output always changes from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, as the case may be. Flip-flops may be used individually to store single bits, in which case they are often referred to as indicators, or they may be used to construct registers. A register is simply a set of N flip-flops used to store N bit words, where n may range from 2 to 100 or more. For example, in SIC, the accumulator is an 18-bit register, the program counter is a 13-bit register, etc. Registers may be constructed with any type of flip-flop. We will use SC flip-flops in this book. The nomenclature here is not completely standard. Some manufacturers use the word register to signify any storage location permanently assigned to the processing unit for some specific purpose and not addressable in the same sense as ordinary memory locations. Thus, they may speak of a computer as having several hundred registers when in fact these registers are simply reserved location in magnetic core memory. There is nothing wrong with this practice and it may reflect a tendency for the functions of memory and processing to merge in some designs. However, we shall use the term register memory RM exclusively to denote flip-flop memory. Okay, and then I'm going to go with RAM. Uh, we're looking at magnetic core memory, which is of course well obsolete by now. Going through the process of reading core memory. Looks like uh, something to do with Faraday's law. What's that about? Let's have a look what they're saying there. Uh, it is a useful storage device only if there is some way of finding out what is stored. In a flip-flop, there is a voltage continuously available to indicate what is stored, but there is no such continuous voltage available from a core. The means of interrogating a core uh, uh, is shown in figure 313. Uh, in addition to the original wire, the drive winding, a second wire, the sense winding, is included to read the core. The current is passed along the drive winding in the same direction required to store a zero. If a one was stored, the flux will reverse and in accordance with Faraday, Faraday's law, which is E equals N uh, times uh, de phi de T, I think that's phi, uh, there will be a voltage pulse <clears throat> induced in the sensing winding as shown in figure 313b, if there is already a zero stored there, there is no change of flux and no voltage induced in 313a. We note one problem here, that the read operation destroys the information stored, so if we wish to preserve it, we must write it back in. 
However, we shall see that this is easily and easy enough to arrange. Uh, an advantage of core storage is that it is non-volatile. Uh, that is, uh, loss of power does not affect the information stored. We have not talked about uh, circuit details, but flip-flops uh, require continuous application of DC power to operate. If the power is lost, the flip-flop lapses into a passive state and the information stored is permanently lost. That is, the storage is volatile. Cores and other types of magnetic memory as well <laughs> require power only when it is desired to read or write information. The loss of power to the computer, a not uncommon occurrence, will not affect information stored in core memory. On we go. So we're talking about hysteresis, uh, uh, hysteresis loop of magnetic core. I think that I think that regards uh, how it kind of gets permanently magnetized. <sighs> Uh, consider figure 314, which shows a typical hysteresis loop for a magnetic core. This is a plot of the flux density phi in the core. Let me just confirm that that's phi. It is indeed. It's lowercase phi. And what did they say? It was the uh, 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 flux density. Flux density uh, in the core as a function of the total current on any wires threaded through the core. The two points labeled 0 and 1 on the zero current uh, axis. This is the current axis. So this is current and this is flux density. Uh, the two points labeled 0 and 1. So we've got 0 here and 1 here. OK, great. Um, correspond to the two values stored of stored information. When a core changes from one of these states to the other, we will say that the core has switched. The key to the operation of the core is that it will not switch unless enough current is applied to move it past the knee of the curve at point A or point C. There you go. Assume the core is in the zero state. Okay, now it's going to go on telling us about how magnetic core memory works. We're going to ignore that because it's well obsolete um, at this time. And there's a, a matri matrix, matrix, I guess. Uh, what do they call it? L liner select memory. So it's talking about how to address core, which is fine. Fine, fine, fine. How to address core, coincident current, 3D memory. Okay, general model of RAM. Okay, uh, so uh, MAR, MDR. The functions of the MAR and MDR have already been discussed. For a read operation, the central processor will load the address of the desired word into MAR, memory address register, presumably, and then uh, MDR, perhaps memory data register. I'm not sure. Anyway, we're talking about uh, basic form of electronic RAM. Very good. Uh, so uh, they're, they're using flip-flops again. This is the, uh, the set clear flip-flop, um, which they introduced earlier. Of course, um, those are still used. I don't know what type of flip-flops, but it's normal. Now, we don't talk about semi-random access anymore. We just call them hard drives, don't we? CD, ROMs, read, run there. Anyway, SRAM is static RAM. Uh, so here we're going to start talking about uh, hard drives, uh, write and read operations on a magnetic disk. Uh, okay, we're talking about multiple platters. Very good. You know, some of this, I mean, hard drives are still used, um, but they're giving way to um, solid state drives now, aren't they? Uh, anyway, general model of SRAM. So it's just uh, yeah, a block addressing, I guess. File systems are all built on top of it. Sequential med memory. So they're talking about uh, tape drives here. Uh, general model of sequential memory. Um, yep, there you go. So forward, backwards, that sort of thing. We don't, we don't use it much these days. I suppose tapes are still used, but I don't use tapes to you. I actually set up some tapes recently, and they were pretty disappointing. They're slow and old. Not very reliable, frankly. Here we go. So we've got read-only memory. Of course, these days we just call that an EEPROM, and it's 
it, it's kind of read only, but you can reprogram it. Whereas with these ROMs, they literally burn out the uh, the resistors, don't they? Um, so um, once it's burnt, uh, it, it's it's done. That's what it used to be like. It's not like that anymore, of course. Okay, here's a transistor, transistor coupled ROM. That's very interesting. So yeah, okay. So you can use transistors or you can use resistors, um, and uh, and usually the process of programming it is just to just to burn it, burn out the one that you don't that you don't want. All right, here's section three point ten summary and perspective of system components. Uh, as we stated at the beginning of the chapter, this is not intended to be an exhaustive survey. There is at least one whole category of memory that we have not treated, mass memory to handle the problems of very large stores such as census or tax records. At present, magnetic tape is the dominant medium for such applications. Uh, its capacity is unlimited, but it has the disadvantage of requiring manual handling of the tapes mass memory in which the computer could have access to any part of the store without human intervention would have obvious advantages. Most research in this area has centered on optical and photographic techniques. A few systems have been developed but this is basically an area with many difficult problems and few solutions. Uh, even with better access the problems of searching very large files are formidable and there has been much interest in the associative or content addressable memory. Fascinating. They're talking about content addressable memory in 1973. Wow. As a result, in a hit and run investigation, it might be desired to search the license plate files for all owners of cars of a certain make, year and color. But these files would be indexed under license number or owner's name so that a complete search of the entire file would be required. In an associative memory, we would simply input the desired identifying characteristics and all records with matching characteristics would be immediately identified without exhaustive search. Many techniques for implementing this type of memory have been suggested, but none have even approached the low cost required for very large files. The associative memory, which seems so inviting as a means of handling large files, may be used as a high-speed buffer memory, this application will be discussed in the next to last chapter of this text. Even within the categories we have discussed, we have treated only those types which seem to have the greatest present and continuing importance. However, continued technical developments will undoubtedly produce new devices and change the relative importance of existing devices. Rather than attempt to prophesy the future, with our very cloudy crystal ball, we will try to give the reader some perspective on the cost-speed relationships among the various categories of memory. These relationships are, hopefully, somewhat independent of exact form of implementation and may, therefore, have some continuity, cut some continuing validity. In figure 332, we show a logarithmic plot of memory speed versus cost per bit. Okay, the four main types of memory, register, random access, semi-random access, and sequential, are represented by dark areas on the graph, since there are wide variations in speed and cost in each category. Even, when these variation, even with these variations, however, it is notable that there are distinct intervals between the four categories, a fact which presumably accounts for the continuing importance of all four types over the past 15 to 20 years. Okay, there we go. So we've got register memory. And then we've got buffer memory. We've got RAM, ROM. Okay, SRAM, SM. Right, there you go. So sequential memory, uh, ser uh, what do they call it? Semi semi random, ROM RAM buffer memory. 
I don't know why they got a question mark there. And then RM, register memory. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, we won't we won't finish that. So th that that concludes uh, system components. So now we're up to chapter four, uh, design conventions. So uh, I might just take a quick break before we continue. And on we go. So next chapter, chapter four, design conventions. Uh, introduction. Uh, the procedure which we shall propose for computer design will be based on a high-level language. Most of this language will be presented in the next chapter. The purpose of this chapter is to interpret certain of the more basic conventions in terms of hardware. Enough of the language will be presented to permit the design of a simple vector processing digital system. The needs for a more sophisticated notation will become evident in the process. The reader will find that the language of chapter 5 will satisfy this need. Okay, so we're going to start talking about register transfers. Much of the activity of a vector handling digital system consists of transferring vectors of information from one register to another. A computation consists of placing some Boolean function of the contents of argument registers into a destination register. It is quite possible to view a digital computer simply as a collection of registers among which data may be transferred with logical manipulations taking place during the transfers. As we shall see, a major part of the description of a computer will consist of a schedule or listing of data transfers. All this being the case, it is essential that the designer have a thorough understanding of the ways in which data may be transferred in a computer. Okay, so we've got a set and clear transfer. Uh, we've got a jam transfer with uh, transfer hardware. And then we've got a jam transfer allowing other inputs to BR. As we discuss <coughs> transfer uh, register transfers, we shall need a system of notation. The notation we shall develop is part of a formal design language, the details and, formation <coughs> and formal definition of which will be the subject of the next chapter. Registered will, registers will be noted by strings of italic capitals such as MA, PC, AC, etc. Transfer of the contents of one uh, register into another is indicated by an arrow. For example, uh, MD is transferred into AC. Signifies that the contents of MD are transferred to AC. The contents of the source register, i.e. MD, in the above example, are not affected by the transfer, but any previous information in AC is, of course, destroyed. <coughs> So we can uh, set in 0, we can set in 1, uh, two basic methods by which a register uh, a transfer may be accomplished, a clear and set transfer and a jam transfer. The typical configuration for a clear and set transfer is shown in figure 41A. For simplicity, we shall assume 4-bit registers for the examples in this section. Uh, we wish to transfer the constants of register AR to register BR. We then first clear BR. Uh, okay. I don't know why it's necessary to clear. I'm not going to read all that in detail. Um, section 4.3, the synchronous system. Before considering further approaches to register transfers, we pause to include a section of background material primarily for the non-electrical engineer. The terms voltage level and voltage pulse, pulse have already been used without precise definition. The only physical difference between the two terms is the duration of their existence. In chapter 3, we chose the convention that a logical 0 will be represented by 0 volts and the logical 1 will be represented by some positive voltage. To facilitate the discussion in this section, we should use plus 5 volts. A voltage pulse, then, will refer to a brief transition of the voltage from 0 to plus 5 volts and back to 0. The precise duration of a pulse will vary with 
type of device is used in the system. Okay, so we're looking at uh, at at the pulse timing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we're looking at uh, at the timing between the pu the pulses that arrive here. So. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this is a uh, figure four point four partial register transfer using clocked flip flops. Okay, <clears throat> bussing. Okay, well, we know what bussing is. Here we go. Well, so there's the address register. Transfer among a group of registers A, B, C, D. bus connection of registers Hmm. All right. So they've introduced this bus notation, and they're talking about more complex. Okay, master slave flip flops. Locking and control. Multi phase clock. Hmm. Control section with a multi phase clock. Hmm. Control with arbitrary sequence counter. A simplified design example. Word disassembler. Hmm. Economics of digital system design. Are we interested in that? Let's read that. I'm interested in that. Most tasks which are accomplished by vector handling digital systems are sufficiently complex that a variety of approaches are possible. The costs, both production and design, are likely to vary with the approach chosen. So will the amount of time required by the digital system to perform a given task. In many cases, the digital system must interact with some very slow system, either physical or biological. Two examples might be desk calculators or a controller for a chemical process. For such cases, the speed of digital system is not important. The most economical approach consistent with adequate reliability should be chosen.
Occasionally a digital system must interact with a very fast system. In such cases, if indeed any available approach is suitable, only the fastest may be satisfactory. The above are two extreme examples of what may be called real-time digital systems. In general, the speed at which a real-time digital system must operate is dictated by some other system with which it must interact. The appropriate design approach is the most economical one which will operate at the required speed. The situation is quite different for non-real-time systems, of which the general purpose computer is the most common example. Such systems can operate at various levels of performance. In batch processing, for example, performance might be measured in terms of the dollar value of jobs executable per hour. Dollar values can be estimated when there is a past history of other digital systems performing the same type of job. In designing a digital system, many of the choices which affect cost and speed are choices of, which, of whether to perform sets of similar operations simultaneously or sequentially. The choices range from handling bits in a word serially or in parallel to the possibility of processing more than one job at a time by the computer. Simultaneous or parallel operations almost always imply larger numbers of components and therefore greater overall cost. In addition, choices must be made between component technologies on the basis of speed and cost. There are a finite number of essentially different combinations of choices which might be made in the design of a particular digital system. It is possible to analyze all of these alternatives in sufficient detail to estimate their cost and speed. The effort which one would actually devote to this would depend on the number of copies of the system to be constructed, as well as the cost of this effort in relation to the overall design cost. If such an analysis were made, the result might appear in the form of figure 414. Here is 414, plotting uh, speed and cost. Hmm. Uh, each cross on the figure represents a design based on some set of choices. The solid line on the figure is not a minimal mean square <coughs> uh, error fit of the data points, but is rather a smooth curve approximating joining points with the lowest uh, cost per speed ratios. The two points which are circled on the figure represent design choices which need not be considered seriously. There are higher speed, lower cost alternatives available. Okay, there and there. I see, yes, so this is uh, costs cost more than this and performs less than this, so there's no reason to choose it. Fair enough. <sighs> Notice that the dash tangent line passes through the point on the curve which has the optimum cost per speed ratio. If cost per speed ratio were the only criterion, then the design point nearest the tangent line might be chosen. Where system performance must be matched to some other system, it may be necessary to move in one direction or the other from the optimum. As mentioned, this is common in the case of real-time systems. It is the design of several subsystems of a larger system, sorry, if the designs of several subsystems of a larger system are projected to depart significantly from the economic optimum, a reconfiguration of overall system architecture may be in order. Vector handling systems, which are not computers, are more likely to be described by figure 414. In a complete computer, storage capacity as well as data handling speed is a factor in overall system performance. For some jobs, there is a trade-off between <coughs> speed and memory capacity. The analysis of overall computer performance in terms of cost, speed, characteristics, and storage capacities of subsystems is an interesting but difficult problem. In many cases, it is not possible to determine to complete as accurate an analysis as might be desired. We postpone further discussion of this topic until chapter 14. And then there's a bunch of problems to talk about uh, address transfer. We won't go through all of those. Uh, we're up to chapter 5, Introduction to a Hardware Programming Language. Okay, we'll read the intro introduction to this chapter. Uh, <clears throat> A digital computer is a very complex device and a complete description of a computer is going to be correspondingly complicated.
we have already seen that in chapter 2 that it can take a lot of words to describe even a few of the operations of a very simple computer. Certainly something better than the English language is going to be needed if we are to achieve efficient and concise descriptions of the design and functioning of digital computers. There are many levels at which computers can be described, block diagrams, wiring tables, etc. We are concerned here with the description of what the computer does in terms of the sequencing of operations and the flow of information from one point to another in the computer. Developing this description is the fundamental job of the designer. Once this description has been completed, the development of logic diagrams, schematics, wiring tables, etc. becomes largely a mechanical procedure subject to considerable automation as we shall discuss in later chapters. A program is a list of statements or instructions which are to be executed in a certain sequence. Specification statements specify new values for some quantities operands in terms of finite operations on already specified operands. Specification statements are executed in the order listed listed unless a branch statement causes a change in the order of execution. The concept of specification or replacement is very important. In Fortran we can write the statement n equals n plus 1 even though we do not mean <coughs> conventional uh, algebraic equality. To avoid any possible confusion we shall use the symbol uh, left arrow to signify specification thus the statement n left arrow n plus 1 signifies that the new value of the variable n is specified as being equal to the old value of n plus 1. Uh, there we go. In chapter 4 we saw that hardware registered transfers could be represented by a programming language of this form. Uh, the example of section 4.8 suggested that branch statements as well would be useful in the representation of control sequences. Assuming that it is possible to, replay, <coughs> to represent all hardware functions in language form, the question arises as to which language to use. The choice of a language is very important. This language must permit sufficient detail to describe even bit-by-bit -bit operations and must, be the <coughs> must at the same time have sufficient power to permit concise descriptions of complex operations. The advantage, sorry, the language which we feel best meets our requirements was developed by K. E. Iverson and is known as APL, uh, AP, a programming language. Although APL is now primarily used for interactive programming, hardware description was one of the applications originally envisioned by Iverson. APL has subsequently been implemented with various modifications on several computer systems, the most widely known version being APL 360, which is available on several IBM computer systems. A skeletal version of APL will be presented. Only part of this version of APL is directly translatable to hardware operations. To avoid confusion, we shall refer to that portion of APL which is translatable into hardware as a HPL, or a hardware programming language. In later chapters, a few conventions which are not part of APL will be added to a HPL. In section 5.9, we shall point out restrictions which must be made on APL to form AHPL. Alternatively, we might have introduced only concepts from the AHPL portion of APL at various points as they were first required in the discussion of hardware. We feel that this procedure would have been much less satisfactory for the reader in the long run. Most of the APL operations will appear in some form throughout the book. Trying to learn APL operations while struggling with a design concept can only interfere with the reader's mastery of the latter. We do not expect the reader's experience in learning APL to be unpleasant. The reader is already familiar with one or more programming languages such as Fortran, COBOL, PL1, etc. Learning APL will be a much less difficult task than learning a first language. First, APL is more than any other programming language, just an extension and systematization of conventional mathematical notation. Second, if you have already learned to program in whatever language you have already 
mastered the basic concepts of programming, concepts which apply equally to APL. Third, we will not be concerned in this book with actually writing ready-to-run computer programs, so many of the troublesome details associated with actually running a program can be neglected. This is not to say that having mastered APL, the reader may not wish to try his hand at actual APL programming. APL has many advantages over the more commonly used programming languages, but mastery of APL computer programming as such is not the objective of this book, nor is it necessary. All books on computer systems have some system of notation which must be mastered by their readers. Often this amounts to fragments of uh, several notational systems, the use of which varies from topic to topic and chapter to chapter. It has long been recognized that the control section of a computer is essentially a hardwired program for the execution of the machine's instruction set. In fact, this concept leads directly to microprogramming, which will be treated in chapter 8. We believe, therefore, that a programming language is the natural way to describe a digital computer and the power of APL is such that when <clears throat> that we can completely describe a digital computer in one consistent concise language without resorting to awkward special conventions to handle special cases then we've got section 5.2 operand conventions typographic conventions okay so we've got uh, literal and variable and then, uh, okay. Okay. I don't think we're going to look that, that close at it. <laughs> uh, APL primitive operators. Okay. So they're going to do... Um, Okay, there's the primitive operators. <clears throat> oh man, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna look at this uh, clear, carefully. Okay. So we've got relational operators. Got special vectors, unit vector, full vector. Oh gee, not going to think that hard about that. Mixed operators. Oh wow, mixed operators in APL. Catenate, reshape, left rotate, right rotate, rotate up, rotate down, left shift, right shift, decode, encode. Reduce, row reduce, column reduce, compress, row compress, column compress. Wow. Isn't that funny? So these are, are literally um, operators in, in APL. Wow. Hmm. Well, that got real complicated real quick, didn't it? Branching and sequence control. Fortran, Fortran program for sum of absolute values. Okay, and then uh, uh, APL equivalence of 4.7. That's interesting. So there's two different ways of doing the same thing. Wow. Examples of branch notation. APL programs. This section may be omitted without loss of continuity. All right. So we're going to look at uh, APL programs. Write an APL program which will search a list of words in memory for words the leftmost three bits of which are all ones. These words should be assembled into a separate list. Check that out. Wow. 
Wow. There exists in APL a convention providing for relating two vectors or two matrices with two binary operations. This permits a further abbreviation of various complex operations. In particular, matrix multiplication may be expressed this way. A thorough explanation and illustration of the usefulness of this convention would take us too far from the subject at hand. The reader is referred to Iverson or Hellerman. Chapter 2 of Hellerman is particularly recommended for its detailed treatment of several APL programming examples. Wow, that's seriously dense. Look at that program. That's amazing. Okay, so it says AHPL in perspective. Let's read about that. Let's hear. Okay, only those APL operations which satisfy the constraints imposed by available hardware are included in AHPL. We wish to make this point in the strongest possible way. Every HPL step written down by the designer will represent some action on some already specified hardware elements. The designer will always have a mental picture of the hardware involved prior to writing a HPL step, developing the precise correspondence between AHPL and its hardware realization is the topic of the remainder of this chapter and of chapters 6 and 7. As we shall see in chapter 7, some AHPL transfer statements fall short of uniquely identifying a hardware realization. In a few cases, a comment must be appended to the transfer statement. These comments will be in ordinary English and will be self-explanatory. In all, there will be about five possible comments. With the exception of comments, all features of AHPL may be described using the not notation provided by APL. It is not possible to completely define AHPL in advance and then proceed to apply it to a sampling of applications. The structure of AHPL operations must necessarily reflect the yet to be discussed structure of the hardware which they purport to describe. AHPL will be assembled gradually as the fundamental hardware configurations are examined. This assembly will take place using the material of APL. There are several aspects of AHPL which must be investigated in detail in light of possible need for new definitions or restrictions. Several of the items have been partially treated already. Most of these topics will be considered in the next few pages. A few conventions from AHPL must await formulate, formulation in chapters six and 7 and 9. Of the two uh, types of routines, the control sequence routine is by far the most important. It contains the list of registered transfers and branch statements which specify the function of the digital system. A translation of this routine will result in a logic block diagram for system hardware. Often the logic functions which must appear in transfer statements become very complex and therefore impossible to write on a single line. Significant portions of these functions may be replaced by reference to a combina combinational logic subroutine. A combinational logic subroutine is a sequence of APL program steps which effic efficiently define a combinational logic network. The rules for writing combinational logic subroutines will be presented in Chapter 7. Of the five types of statements which <clears throat> will appear in control sequence routine, uh, batch and transfer statements are of the most interest. Any of the five forms of branch statements listed may be used. We shall see that form of expression 5.3 will we shall see that the form of expression 5.3 will be preferred because of its more natural translation to hardware. There are several considerations involved in the definition of a valid transfer statement. The left side of the statement identifies the flip-flop or set of flip-flops or register or set of registers into which a new information is to be placed. A single transfer may involve a matrix whose rows are registers. A fixed transfer 
designation may use catenation, constant subscripts, constant superscripts, and compression operations. For example, expression 5.4 is a valid transfer statement where both A and B are 4 bit registers. Oh man, I'm not going to think this hard about that. Wow. Figure 511. Oh, let's have a look. Figure 510, outline of AHPL control sequence routine, branch statements, transfer statements, left side fixed destination, variable destination, right side as a function of registers, flip flops, and buses, simultaneous register declaration, bus logic declaration, bus load to combinational logic subroutine. Okay. Okay, so you've got control sequence routing and combinational logic subroutines. And then you've got within that branch statements, transfer statements, register declaration, bus declaration, bus load. And then within transfer stations, you've got left side, right side, and simultaneous. Okay. And figure 511, hardware realization of statement 5.5. Wow, that's, that's intense. So here's statement 5.5. Yeah, I'm not going to think hard about that. Dear me. Wow. Hardware programming language. Example 5.2, Example 5.3, gee those APL programs, they're intense. Wow. Okay, and then there's some problems for this chapter. Look at that. Wow, check that out. I wonder if I'm going to learn APL before I die. It does look kind of intriguing, doesn't it? But wow, talk about dense. All right, well, we're up to chapter six, uh, machine organization and hardware programs. So let's read the introduction. In Chapter 5, we introduced a new language, AHPL, with the justification that computer hardware could be described in terms of this language. Previously, in Chapter 2, we discussed in detail a small digital computer, SIC. In this chapter, we propose to design a computer which will function in the manner attributed to SIC on Chapter 2. Uh, the design will be expressed as a program in AHPL. Translation of this program into a hardware description or a, lo a logic block diagram must wait until chapter 7. We shall continue to use SIC as the vehicle to illustrate what is actually a completely general procedure. SIC is sufficiently simple that a reasonably complete design can be presented without burdening the reader with detail. There are, of course, many important features of large-scale computers which are not found in SIC. AHPL routines describing many of these features will be presented in later chapters. Having seen the details of a complete computer tied together in chapters 6 and 7, the reader should be able to visualize <coughs> the incorporation of these features into the overall design of a larger scale computer. It is our conviction that AHPL is an excellent vehicle for teaching computer organization, but is also a practical design language. A program has been <coughs> developed to compile AHPL programs, that is, to translate them into a logic block diagram form. In Chapter 7, however, our point of view will be to indicate the various correspondences between AHPL notation and computer hardware. Our goal will be to provide the reader with the tools required to carry out the translation process himself. Once he has progressed to this point, the reader will have a basic understanding of computer organization. 
Then we've got section 6.2, register organization. And there's uh, an example there. <coughs> Figure 6.1. Section 6.3, data paths. And, uh, okay. The hardware required to shift data from MD to AC is shown in simplified form in figure 6.2. This particular register transfer is a critical part of the instruction LAC. The OR gates provided at the input to the memory elements allow information to be shifted into the accumulator from various sources. Hmm. LAC and TAD register functions. LAC, I think, was um, load accumulator, was it? And TAD, what was that? I forget. Something about the accumulator. TAD. They did mention it. I forget what that was. Uh, section 6.4, classifying instructions. So we've got I.O. instructions, we've got uh, operation instructions, we've got read, operand, store, and branch without read. Okay. Okay. Overall conf control flow chart. Okay. we go. Uh, Figure 6.5, alternate approach to indirect addressing. Okay. Section 6.5, AHPL control programs. Okay. Look at that APL. Carno map for section for step one four. <laughs> Look at that. I remembered learning about Carno maps, but I forget what they are exactly. That was a long time ago. Execution of group three and four instructions. Gating. As a further example of the gating associated with the register transfer, we shall detail the switching associated with step 21 of the previous section. This step is repeated as follows. Gating into MD for store instructions. The physical implementation of this register transfer is depicted in figure 6.9. The gating is shown in detail for only one flip-flop. The structure is similar for the remaining 17 flip-flops. Once again, the OR gates at the input to the flip-flop will accommodate inputs corresponding to other transfers into MD. Other possible control sequence for JMS and DAC can result in different switching configurations. This will be illustrated in the following example. Figure 610, alternate gating for store instructions. Six point seven operate instructions. Operate instructions do not require a time consuming separate memory reference during execution. Similarly, individual microcoded segments can be accomplished in a single clock interval. Therefore they can reasonably be handled in sequential fashion. For SIC, each operate instruction will consist of three register transfers or batch operations executed in sequence. The execution cycle will still require less time than the full than the fetch cycle. Table 6.1 Coding of Operate Instructions. Before we proceed to an example instruction, a few general comments regarding table 6.1 are in order. Note that a rotation of three bits in either direction is possible if rotate is specified each event time, but bit 4 is applicable 
only if rotation is specified in one of the three event times. In that case, it gives the direction of rotation. More than one operation can be accomplished in a single event time. Okay. Figure, six, figure 611, flow chart for operate instructions. Next map values, there's a whole bunch of impenetrable APL, which we're not going to think about very hard. Okay. Wow. Bussing of arguments. In section 4.4, we presented only one reason, an economic one, for the use of busing, which is that busing permits the sharing of input switching logic between several destination registers. This switching logic then becomes the bus. An additional reason for the use of busing emerges when the destination of the register selected by the bus is a combinational logic network such as an adder. Arguments for a combinational logic network must be selected by a level. Thus, the switching network satisfies the description given for the bus in section 4.4. For our pulse-oriented control unit, control levels must be obtained by setting bus control flip-flops. In this section, we shall denote the placing of information on the buses by the setting or clearing of these bus control flip-flops. Hmm. Because adders and other logic units may be expensive, it is generally desirable to provide for their use with various input and destination registers. A typical arrangement uses two input buses to provide switching of operands from various registers to various logic units. Such an arrangement for SIC is shown in figure 613. Later, we shall allow other logic networks to share the same buses, but for now we shall concentrate our attention on the connections to the adder. Indexing. Indexing takes place at the beginning of the initial fetch cycle. Indexing and indirect addressing cannot be specified simultaneously in SIC. Where more than 18 instruction bits are available, this combination would probably be included. Indexing will affect the instruction JMP as well as the read operand instructions. Uh, it is possible to accomplish indexing in conjunction with steps 10 and 12 of figure 6.4. This would require switching the output of the adder into PC as well as MA. Alternatively, the result of indexing could be gated back into IR prior to the branch at step 9. Although it is more time consuming, we shall use the latter approach. Okay. Addressing schemes. It's only one page. Let's read about addressing schemes. I'll just take a quick break. Addressing schemes. There are reasons why a memory addressing scheme may be made still more sophisticated than necessitated by the mere inclusion of indirect addressing. Multi-operand instructions, as discussed in Chapter 1, are one possibility. Often it is desirable to add the contents of some register in addition to the index register <coughs> to the address specified in an instruction. Sometimes this is made necessary by the lack of sufficient 
address bits in an instruction to address all of the available random access memory. Suppose, for example, that only 10 address bits are provided, but that 16k words of memory are available in order to form 14-bit addresses, it is <coughs> necessary to add the contents of a special address register to the 10 address bits obtained from an instruction. Ordinarily, it will, be <coughs> it will not be necessary to change the contents of the special address register often, as execution can be confined to a 1k section of memory for many instructions in succession. In some machines which have insufficient address bits, indirect addressing is relied on to permit accessing data or branching outside of small areas of memory. The term page has been used in some instances to refer to a small section of memory. Consider as an example a machine with 4k 12-bit <coughs> words of memory. Only 8 of the 12 bits are available for use as an address, thus the memory must be divided into 16 256 word pages. Uh, the memory address register and program counter are designed to accommodate a complete 12-bit address. The most significant four bits of the both registers remain unchanged as instructions are executed within a page. When an operation ventures out of a particular page via indirect addressing, a new 12-bit address is placed in MA or in the case of a branch in both MA and PC. A special address register to add <clears throat> to every instruction address is useful in large-scale computers. It permits the relocatability of compiled programs within memory with a minimum of change. That is, a program may be compiled without foreknowledge of where it will be placed in memory. When loaded, the operating system need only add one instruction, which will cause the appropriate starting address to be placed in the special address register. A discussion of relocatability in systems 360 and 370 may be found in flaws. The following example illustrates an approach to the hardware handling of address formation. And they had a note there. Uh, this configuration is a simplified version of the PDP-8. The PDP-8 includes one special page which may be addressed directly from any other page. Interesting. Uh, figure 615, registers used in address formation. No, I'm not going to look hard at that. Multiple cycle instructions. Okay, let's hear about that. <clears throat> the memory reference instruction considered so far were executed by a single transfer of information from one register to another register. The operate instructions require no more than three consecutive changes of state in a register. In later chapters, as we consider instructions useful in computers with particular problem distributions, we shall find that some instructions require many consecutive register transfers. In general, the approach to designing the control sequency hardware will be the same regardless of instruction complexity. Let's, let us illustrate using fixed point multiplication as an example. There are various possible approaches to the multiplication of numbers which may be negative since storage may be in the form of one's complement two's complement or sign and magnitude <coughs> various schemes are used to effect multiplication in all of these formats to preserve continuity let us defer a discussion of the various alternatives until chapter 12 the simplest though <coughs> not necessarily the fastest or least expensive approach is to mu to multiplication is keeping track of signs and multiplying the magnitudes here, let us assume that numbers are stored in two's complement notation. Thus, prior to multiplication, the sign of the product will be determined, and all two's complement negative numbers will be replaced by magnitudes. Since the fixed point multiplication of two 18-bit numbers may result in a 36-bit product, another register, the MQ register, must be added to store the 18 least significant bits of the product. It will be necessary to count the number of bits of the multiplier which have been treated at any given stage in the process. So a 5-bit counter designated MC will be added. The link will be used for storage of the sign. 
the described hardware configuration may be found in figure 616. Okay, there it is, multiplication hardware. <sighs> Only the basic data pass involved in multiplication is shown in figure 616. In practice, busing would very likely be used. However, to make the multiplication routine as clear as possible, it is desirable to omit program steps which load controlling registers for the various buses. We leave the rewrite of the routine to utilize busing of the arguments as a homework problem. The multiplication instruction is not included in SIC. Similarly, several of the registers in figure 616 are not available in SIC. Therefore, let us visualize multiplication as part of another computer encompassing all of the features of SIC but with an extended arithmetic capability including multiplication. Let us pick up the orientation at a point in control sequence following the fetch cycle at the identification of the instruction. The multiplier is in the AC from the previous instruction. The multiplicand multi has just been read from storage and placed in MD. Control has diverged to the point of the actual beginning of the instruction. The, operating, the operation begins with the clearing of the link to prepare for sign determination. The first five steps convert the multiplier to sign and magnitude form, leaving the magnitude in MQ and the sign in the link. The last five steps place the magnitude of the multiplicand in MD and leave the sign of the final product in the link. Two's complements where necessary are obtained by complementing individual bits and addressing one to the least significant bit. Notice that the link which was initially reset to zero is complemented uh, once if the multiplier is negative and once if the multiplicand is negative. Thus it ends up zero only if the signs are the same. Before proceeding, let us consider the basic multiplication process in some detail. Since the basic arithmetic process of a computer is addition, multiplication is generally carried out by successive addition. In this technique, the decimal multiplication of 203 times 276 would be carried out as shown in figure 617a. 617A. Okay. Uh, for the binary case, the process is even simpler since the only multiplier bits are 0 or 1. Thus, for each multiplier bit, the multiplicand is either added once or not added at all. A typical binary multiplication is shown in figure 617b. From this, it is seen that the basic binary multiplicative process involves inspecting each multiplier bit in turn, adding and shifting for a 1, and shifting without adding for a 0, as shown in figure 617. Uh, as shown in figure 617, the partial products are successively shifted left before addition, finally resulting in a product having twice as many bits as the initial operands. This process would be impractical in a computer since it would require a double length adder, that is, or for example, a 36-bit adder for a machine with 18-bit operation operands. To avoid this difficulty, addition, if required, is performed as each bit of the multiplier is inspected and the resultant sum is then shifted right providing a relative left shift to the next partial product. To provide for the double length product the AC and MQ registers are catenated for right shifting. The multiplier is initially loaded with MQ the multiple canned into MD with AC initially cleared as the product is shifted into MQ, the multiplier is shifted out so that the multiplier bit to be inspected is always in the low order position of MQ. This process of multiplication is illustrated in figure 618. 
computer mechanization of multiplication. <sighs> Where did we land? For the same multiplications as figure 617b, the dotted line in MQ indicates the boundary between the developing partial product and the remainder of the multiplier. That's here, there's your dotted line. Okay. <sighs> All right, so the, so the summary is short. Let's read that. Um, this is the summary of uh, Chapter 6, which was Machine Organization and Hardware Programs. Is that right? Mm. Uh, in this chapter, we have presented a language in which the engineer can approach the design of a computer or a computer subsystem. It is not an algorithmic design procedure. The designer is not relieved of the responsibility of optimizing his AHPL description of the control unit for his application. It is hoped, however, that this chapter and chapter 7 will provide him with a place to start. So far, we have examined only these features of the computer which may be incorporated in a small machine, such as SIC. The number of additional features which might be added to a computer to improve its performance is far too great to allow them to be treated in a single textbook. We shall examine a few of them in the chapters which follow. We shall approach them through their control using AHPL, an AHPL sequence. And then there's a bunch of problems for chapter 6. And we're on to Oh, there's heaps of problems for chapter six. Wow. Wow, heaps and heaps of them. Alright, now we're up to chapter seven, the control unit. Yeah, about halfway through the book, not quite. Okay, the control unit. Introduction. The basic function of the control unit is to furnish, at the proper times, the control pulses required to accomplish the register transfers described in Chapter 6. Uh, these pulses must appear on a multitude of separate lines destined to points within the arithmetic unit and elsewhere in the computer. The demands placed upon the control unit are illustrated by the pictorial diagram of Figure 7-1. Here we go. The control unit has got a clock. Uh, signal levels from IR um, and certain data registers. The IR is, of course, the instruction register. Um, and then there's output pulses. There you go. Cool. <sighs> As shown, the primary input to the control unit is the master clock of the computer. The clock frequency may typically range between 1 and 100 megahertz. <laughs> Slower clock rates may be used in smaller special, special purpose machines where maximum computation speed is not a dominant design objective. Certain logic, certain te te eh? certain logic circuits technologies such as MOS, that's metal oxide semiconductor, may require slower clock rates. At the upper end of the range of clock frequencies cited above, transmission line delay begins to become a limiting factor. Notice that the velocity of propagation of a pulse on a transmission line is approximately 3.1 to the power of 8 meters per second. Uh, we conclude that a pulse is delayed 1 nanosecond by each foot of transmission line over which it passes between control unit and destination. At 100 megahertz, clock pulses are separated by slightly less than 10 nanoseconds. At this frequency, a difference of two or three feet in distances between the control unit and operand registers involved in consecutive data transfers would have a significant effect on the timing of these transfers. The use of integrated circuits reduces the size of the central processor and therefore the distances between registers. Various considerations, including the necessity of communications with physically large peripheral equipment, 
limit the advantage which can be realized from reducing machine dimensions. As logic circuits are available with delays less than one nanosecond, designers continue to look for further increase in clock frequencies. For clock frequencies above 100 megahertz, special measures must be uh, adap uh, adapted to assure proper synchronization. This problem would take us too far afield for the present chapter. The control pulses shown at the output of the control unit in figure 7.1 are all synchronized with the input clock pulses. In effect, the control unit must select clock pulses occurring at particular time instants and gate them onto lines triggering register transfers scheduled to occur at those time instants. Our technique in this chapter will be one of physically implementing the flow chart of the AHPL description of the machine. The result will be a permanent hardwired control unit. A hardwired control unit is not used in all computers. It is used in certain fast, large-scale machines. Smaller machines more often utilize a read-only memory as a control unit, a technique which may allow the modification of the control sequence through microprogramming. This approach will be the topic of Chapter 8. We call, we call that these days, we call that microcode, and that, that's a contemporary uh, uh, technology. As mentioned in Chapter 4, there are many approaches to the design of a hardware-wide control unit. Some may use a multi-phase clock. Others will distribute control systems in the form of levels rather than pulses, as shown in Figure 7.1. The reason for choosing a particular approach are usually electronic circuit considerations and therefore outside of the scope of this book. The implementation of the control unit used throughout the book will employ pulse delay elements to separate consecutive pulses by one clock period in time. An instruction sequence will be initiated by a single pulse, which will then propagate through the control unit to cause a step-by-step -step execution of the control sequence. Following the pulse through a hardware block diagram of the control unit is much the same as tracing the AHPL sequence of a flow chart. The primary reason for choosing this form of control hardware is to provide the most graphic correspondence between the AHPL sequence and the control unit. We shall denote the hardware translation of an AHPL sequence as a control sequencer. Sufficient detail is presented to permit the reader with some background in switching circuits to actually construct a control sequencer. An additional advantage of this type of control sequencer might be the simplification of maintenance procedures. Thus, even for short sequences, it may be chosen in preference to some other control unit with lower circuit cost. Section 7.2, the control delay. Okay, that probably has something to do with clocking. Here it is. There you go. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, and there's a control delay circuit. Timing within a control delay. Asynchronous operations. At this stage, it will be illustrative to make a first attempt at translating an AHPL control sequence into a hardware control unit. We are at least able to handle synchronous register transfers. Symbol for a control delay. First attempt at control hardware. That's weird, it's gone straight into translating Hmm. Okay, fair enough. Translating branch instructions. I don't know how we landed there after control delay or asynchronous. With the exception of branch instructions, we have established a one-to-one -one correspondence between lines of AHPL and configurations of logic elements, <coughs> memory elements, and control delays in the control sequencer. No time delay is required for a branch operation. The branch operation is merely a 
is merely a multiple output combinational logic function of the pulse input, the instruction decoder, and various bits or functions of bits from the data registers. Let P be the uh, pulse input and X1 to uh, XK are uh, the level inputs. If there are n possible points to which control might branch, the function must take the form <coughs> P and... Is it P and or P or? I don't know. I forget. And by the looks of it. Except in the case of parallel processing, control cannot be transferred to two points simultaneously. We shall exclude parallel processing from our present discussion. Under this assumption, equation 7.3 must be satisfied for all i and j at every branch point for every assignment of values to the variables x2 to xk, x1 to xk, which is not a don't care condition. Okay. Since control must be routed somewhere, we have equation 7.4, which also need not be satisfied for any don't care situations, conditions. All right, branch logic, blah, blah, blah. All right. Delay of control pulses. Transfer pulse connections. Register transfer timing for excessive clock frequency. Combinational logic subroutines. There's a full adder. Generation of an 18-bit adder. Return to SIC control unit. In section 7.4, a realization of the SIC control sequence was developed through step 10. Steps 11 to 15 are repeated as follows. Of most interest now is the use of the combinational logic subroutine add MDAC in step 14. When this step is encountered by the hardware compiler, the adder network of figure 717 is generated from the subroutine, if not already available. Part of the compilation of step 14 consists of connecting the adder to the input switching of AC as shown in figure 718. As the adder is synchronous, timing is provided by five control delays. The length of time required for a carry to propagate through 18 full adders will be a function of the circuits employed. We assume that the designer has determined it to be the equivalent of five clock periods in this case. Control of the add operation. 7.7, a refinement. From here on, unless otherwise noted, where the vector to be transferred is specified by the values of one or more control levels, we shall assume the use of a network of the form given in figure 719b. <clears throat> to generate the proper transfer pulse. To explore the implications of this choice, let us consider the various types of vectors which might be transferred into an arbitrary register A. Examples of all vector types which might affect the control hardware are given in the next value Carnot map of figure 720. For simplicity, the control variables are A, B and C. An AHBL transfer statement for this map is given as expression 77. As much as was done for step 33 in section 6-7, terms are included only when the value of A is to be changed. As depicted, two of the terms specify the transfer of data into A. One specifies the complementing of all flip-flops in A. One specifies setting all the flip-flops in A. And one specifies clearing these flip-flops. Control realization for expression 7-7. Example 7.4 Operations on the accumulator 
the increment subroutine <sighs> to maintain perspective we show the portion of the control unit specified by lines 10 to 16 of chapter 6 in figure 723 if IR0 is 0 and operand is read from memory if IR1 is IR2 is 0 the ISZ command is implemented at step 16 the realization of steps 16 to 20 calls for another combinational logic routine, INC. Step 16 calls for incrementing the MD register and step 19 specifies incrementing PC. Hi, oh, gee me. Control unit continued and convergence of control. the shift register okay in order to allow for implementation of the rotate instructions the AC the accumulator must be provided with the capability of shifting in both directions the gating necessary to permit shifting in either direction is illustrated in figure 7.2 B is that up there no Oh, that must be back a while. Okay. Um, the input gating is shown only for a single flip-flop from AC. This gating must, of course, be duplicated for each flip-flop in AC and the link, which inputs taken <coughs> with inputs taken from the flip-flops immediately on the left and right. The link is connected to AC0 and AC17. Thus, AC becomes a left shift a left right shift register uh, the rotate right and rotate left pulses each one of which drives all 19 flip-flops are generated by the section of the sequence uh, corresponding to the operate sequence of section 6.7 left and right shift capability the control sequencer for our for rotation in the first e uh, event time is detailed in figure 727 <coughs> here okay uh, the other event times are represented as single blocks in the figure the reader will, will recall that step 30 <coughs> is the first step in the operate sequence following the separation of control for input output instructions notice that rotate left and rotate right lines may be generated in the sequencer for each event time these are connected to OR gates the outputs of which provide the rotate pulse shown in figure 726. Hmm. Another form of control hardware. This section is not necessary for con continuity. Readers without prior background in clock mode sequential circuits may have some difficulty with the level output control unit. The purpose of this section is to explore the possibility of designing a control unit which will issue control levels rather than pulses. The reader will recall from section 4.9 that there are advantages to using flip-flops featuring a third input directly connected to a low impedance clock line. The function of the clock is to trigger into the flip-flops that information which is routed to its inputs by control levels. The very simple control sequence of section 4.8 will serve as an example for comparing the two forms of control unit. The sequence of section 4.8 with two changes is repeated as follows. Notice that branch statements are now expressed in AHPL rather than Fortran. Also, two control delays are inserted in the waiting loop at step 2. A pulse circulating in a loop consisting only of branch instructions is an electronically unstable situation. One delay of the type given in figure 7.3 will not suffice since the design assumption for that circuit ruled out input pulses in two consecutive clock periods. Clearly, a more complicated control delay not subject to this assumption could be designed. Control sequencer for word disassembler. Replacing control delay 
with master slave flip flops. Left level oriented control unit. Sequences involving loops. This section will consider a multiplication control sequencer. The detail of the first 10 control, control instructions will not be shown. The reader should be able to supply this with little <coughs> difficulty. The situation is the same for steps 19 to 28, which establish the sign of the result. Okay, this is a multiplication. Serial addition, serial addition control, decoding networks. So far we have not discussed a network realization of the frequently used expression m to the power of tma. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know how to pronounce that symbol either. This expression has appeared on both left and right side of AHPL statements. We shall see that this expression appearing on the right may be directly replaced with a pair of combinational logic subroutines. No special complications are encountered. Okay. Well, I tell you, I'm well out of my depth by now. Like um, memory selection, variable destination transfer. A complete design example. This section may be omitted without loss of continuity. So far in chapters 6 and 7, we have been uh, concerned exclusively with the computer SIC. Because of the scope of this system, it may not have seemed like a single design problem to the reader. The discussion of SIC should, however, have equipped the reader with the tools required to make the design decision in less complicated systems. Alright. Storage hardware for priority store. Okay. Gee, that's dense, isn't it? That APL, man. Search of stack. Summary. In this chapter, we have provided one means by which an AHPL sequence can be interpreted as a computer control unit. In the process, we have treated many of the problems which arise in any approach to control unit design. In particular, we have considered the details of timing very carefully. Our approach allows us to consider the timing problem only once, rather than coming back to it repeatedly in various situations. In attempting to adhere to a single standard procedure, we have undoubtedly overlooked many possible circuit economies. Often, possible savings will be a function of the particular technology involved. We take it for granted that a designer would use our approach only to provide a beginning. He would then go on to make changes to achieve the most economical control unit and arithme arithmetic unit consistent with performance specifications. The order of presentation was chosen for pedagogical reasons. There is nothing sacred about specifying registers, writing the AHPL sequence and translating to form the control unit in that order. In practice, several iterations back and forth through these activities may be required before a design is complete. In the next chapter, we shall consider another approach to implementation of the control unit called microprogramming. Efficient production methods make microprogramming <coughs> using read-only memories an attractive approach to economical control unit design. Microprogramming has become almost <coughs> standard practice. Hardwired delay elements, as discussed in this chapter, will continue to be required to control subsequences where many consecutive high-speed register transfers are specified. And then there's some problems for this uh, chapter, chapter 7, the control unit. So we're not going to take those on. And then some references. Now we should have been looking at the references. What have we got here? 
Uh, Hill and Peterson, Introduction to Switching Theory and Logical Design, 1968. Uh, Goddard, Compiling Combinational Logic Subroutines, MS thesis, Master's Thesis. University of Arizona, 1971. Uh, Gishwind, Design of Digital Computers, 1967. Deitmeyer, Logical Design of Digital Systems, 1971. Brewer, General Survey of Data Automation of Digital Computers, Proceedings of IEEE, Volume 54, December 1966. Look at that, it's on page 1708. Holy cow. Uh, Gerace. Digital System Design Automation. A method of designing a digital system as a sequential network system. IEEE Transactions. <coughs> Volume C7, November 1968. Page 1044 to 1061. Wow. I don't know how to pronounce all the various surnames. Chapter 8, Microprogramming. The concept of a microprogram was first presented by M. V. Wilkes of uh, Cambridge University Mathematical Laboratory in 1951. This may seem particularly remarkable if one recalls that the vacuum tube and the relay were the only switching devices available at that time. This was only eight years after the introduction of the first electrical computing machine, which incidentally utilized the relay as the principal component. The concept was utilized infrequently until the introduction of the IBM System 360 in 1964. All but the fastest and most sophisticated model in the 360 series relies on microprogramming in the control unit design. A primary reason for this approach was to permit reasonably efficient emulation of earlier IBM computers on the system 360. The assurance that existing customer programs could be used directly on the new computer was no doubt a valuable marketing technique for IBM. <clears throat> in Chapter 6, we learn to express the control function for a digital system as a sequence of AHPL steps very much like a program. Why not store this <clears throat> program in some type of memory and read the AHPL steps out in program sequence? Each time such an AHPL step is read out, read, it could use a branch within the AHPL program or a register transfer within the computer. This is microprogramming. In effect, the control unit of the microprogrammable computer consists principally of a memory rather than a large network of control relays. Most often this memory will be a read-only memory. The instructions stored in the ROM are called micro-instructions. Each micro-instruction corresponds to an AHPL step. Usually a ROM will be cheaper than a read-write memory with the same access time. In addition to possible economy, other advantages of a micro-program include the possibility of modifying the instruction code and the apparent architecture of the machine. Also, a ROM may make possible cheaper storage <coughs> and faster execution of frequently used subroutine such as multiplication, division, and in the case of scientific applications, trigonometric functions. <coughs> in the early stages of the design process, the designer must carefully weigh the above factors against certain drawbacks to be pointed out in succeeding sections in the context of the intended application for his proposed computer. He will then decide to what extent, if any, he will utilize microprogramming in the design of the control unit. Section 8.2, Controlling the Microprogram. It is easy to say, store the HPL program in read-only memory, but how is this done? There are two basic problems we must consider. First, some correspondence must be established between the vectors of ones and zeros which can be stored in memory and the AHBL program steps. Secondly, we must control the reading of the program steps from memory and their execution. Clearly, it is impossible to avoid including a certain amount of hardwired control circuitry. 
in figure 8.1a, <coughs> we see a simplified diagram of the essential items of SIC hardware. Here it is, two types of control unit. <coughs> we've got hardwired control, and we've got micro-programmable control. In general, the execution of a micro instruction is a two step process. <clears throat> One, place a word from the ROM in the MIR. Two, issue a control pulse and or update MAR. Typical synchronous transfers. A micro-programmed SIC. <clears throat> we have laid the basis for the discussion of a fairly sophisticated micro-programmable control unit as might be used in a system 360 or 370. As we shall see, economics dictates a stripped-down version for a machine as small as SIC. There are no conceptual problems associated with using the control unit of figure 8.1b in any machine. Okay, this was the uh, yeah, okay, this is the micro programmable control unit 8.1b. <clears throat> It is instructive to investigate the micro-programming of a complete machine. We therefore use SIC, which we already have well in mind. For the present, busing and indexing will be disregarded. The ROM word length <coughs> will be the same as for main memory, 18 bits. There is no necessity for the two memories to have the same word length since they are completely independent, but 18 bits turns out to be adequate for this simple machine. <clears throat> we will assume that the access time of the ROM is approximately as long as a single clock period. The clock frequency has been chosen so that a single register transfer can conveniently be accomplished in a single clock period. The validity of our assumption will depend on the particular technologies chosen for the ROM and the high-speed registers. One would expect this situation to characterize certain cases where a very large, cheap ROM is employed. Under the, assumption, <clears throat> under the assumed timing constraints, we conclude that the steps making up the individual event times for the operate instructions should not be stored in the ROM, since only one register transfer is executed during each event time, we conclude that an entire operate instruction can be executed in less time than one access to the ROM. Thus we shall include a hardwired control sequence to execute the operate instructions. Transfer micro instructions. Example of microcode assembly. Asynchronous transfers. Microprogramming a bus oriented machine. The advantages of microprogramming may not seem apparent to the reader from the example of the previous section. There, there we added massive ROM to replace most of the fairly simple hardwired control unit. In the process, we have increased the execution time for each instruction considerably. The discussion of the previous section was intended primarily as an introduction to some of the problems of controlling microprograms. The control unit discussed did not take advantage of the large ROM available. 
Once the hardwired portion of the microprogram control unit has been included, it need not be increased regardless of the number of micro instructions stored in the read-only memory. It would seem, then, that the efficient use of microprogramming would imply sequences of micro instructions to execute complex operations such as multiplication, division, or other arithmetic or logical operations. The only exception to this observation might be in certain small machines where smaller, <coughs> small transformer ROMs with limited branching capability have been used to reduce the cost of the control units. Various specialized circuit techniques, which will not be discussed here, were used in these cases to affect economies. Although the opcode could be changed, it would probably be difficult to devise micro instructions for the machine of section 8.3 to substantially expand its performance beyond that of SIC. Only one branch condition, which was a function of data registers, was included, and only those transfers specified used in SIC were allowed. In order to permit a larger class of possible register transfers, data busing is almost universally used within machines employing microprogramming. In this section, we shall include the index registers IA and IB, busing, and certain additional branch conditions in a more general microprogrammable machine, which could include SIC as well as a much broader capability. Similarly, operate instructions, which could be microprogrammed. We will still assume a 3-bit opcode, which could be, but won't necessarily be, the SIC opcode, depending on the microprogram. In this way, we can use the 11 familiar branch conditions of figure 8.4a, adding five additional conditions based on data registers. The augmented list of branch conditions is given in figure 8.8. The interpretation of micro instruction bit remains as given in 4.8, oh, sorry, 8.4b. It is assumed here that unused bit combinations in operate instructions will be used to specify complex operations such as multiplication. These operations cannot involve memory references but must merely manipulate the contents of the high speed registers. There is much to be said, of course, for a longer word length, which would allow four or more bits to specify the opcode. <clears throat> Augmented branch conditions. Register and bus configuration. Connections to A bus and B bus. Connections to O bus. An assembly language for microprograms. Each transfer instruction accomplishes two distinct operations. The first is the establishment, <coughs> sorry, is the establishing of the input data vector on the O bus. Except for the case of addition, the first step is accomplished at the time of micro instruction at the time the micro instruction is read into MIR from the ROM. In addition, in, an additional period of time must be allowed for the propagation delay through the adder. Once the vector on the O bus is established, the second step transfers this vector into a register. It is therefore convenient to let each coded transfer micro instruction be represented by two HPL steps. The first to establish the vector on the O bus, the second to transfer this vector to a register. Both of these operations must be consistent with figures 8, 10 and 8, 11. The branch micro instructions, which may specify only those branch conditions listed in figure 8.8, .8, will be resented by, represented by one AHPL step. For easy reference, we name the resulting language MICRAL, microassembly language. Hmm. As a first example, let us express the multiplication sequence of section eight six uh, section six eleven in MICRAL. Uh, well, only the first step of each transfer instruction is numbered. Okay. So they've got a, a micro programming language that is also a, a HPL and it's called MICRAL.
Okay, section 8.6, further flexibility. The reader will recall that the uh, that bit MIR3 was unused in the transfer instructions of section 8.4. Let us use this bit together with MIR1 and MIR2 to uh, broaden the scope of transfer instructions. We shall merely redefine the significance of these three bits. No attempt will be made at redefining the connections use connections listed in figures 8, 10 and 8, 11 to take advantage of these changes. Branching improvements. In the previous section we had no difficulty in providing for the coding of any registered transfers which appeared at all useful. At the same time it was remarked that the branching code was insufficient to handle the decoding of operate instructions. In general it is the conditional AHPL branch operation <coughs> which is most severely constrained by a microprogramming approach. The SIC control sequence of chapter 6 liberally used instruction bits and data bits to branch at various points within the sequence. The wired approach makes it possible to connect directly to any bit or combination of bit of any registers in the machine to control the branch operation. For large machines with several high-speed data registers, the amount of information embodied in a particular branch condition is overwhelming. Consider, for example, a machine with 16 registers of 32 bits each. Let fi be the Boolean function which gates a pulse through a particular path of a particular branch operation. The number of possible ways to specify this function is given in equation 88. nfi equals 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 16 <coughs> or 32 which is 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 215. Thus, in the most general case, 2 to the power of 512 bits would be required to specify the function. Another PMAR bits would be required to provide the address of the next micro instruction in the event <coughs> the branch condition is satisfied. Compared to assembly language, a much larger number of branch function is required in microprogramming. Branch instruction formats. Unconditional branch. Uh, option branch. I've never heard of option branch. Although I suppose the Fortran if is like an options branch, isn't it? An economical microprogrammable control unit. In the last three sections, we have discussed a fairly sophisticated form of microprogramming. We have assumed that the advantage of microprogramming lay in the use of fairly complex microprograms of functions which would otherwise be accomplished by software. Certainly the case of a large number of micro instructions would be required to justify the complex micro sequencer and decoder implied by the development of these, section, these three sections. Not all microprogrammable machines are described by the above paragraph. In certain small machines, microprogramming is used for reasons of economy only. The read-only memory in such machines contains enough micro-instructions to provide the control sequences for the basic assembly language operations only. In this section, we shall make a, section, a sequence of design decisions which will lead to what may be the most economical most economical small microprogrammable control unit. We assume that the basic clock rate of the machine is slow enough that any ROM technology is accept as ac acceptable. Figure 822, implementation of two micro instructions. Figure 823, branching in a transfer... Uh, Branching in a transformer coupled ROM. Section 8.9 Observations. 
Microprogramming is a widely used method of controlling the execution of machine language instructions. It can be applied at a variety of levels with hardwired control sequences of greater or lesser complexity for controlling microprogram execution. The simplest application of microprogramming would limit the use of branching within the microprogram to separating all instructions at the beginning of the execution sequences. Assembly language branches could be accomplished by merely making a transfer to the program counter PC dependent on a data bit. We saw in section 8.4 that a more elaborate microprogramming approach would be justified only by storing routines which would otherwise be part of system software in a large ROM. And there's a bunch of problems for this chapter and some references. I, I won't. I'll just list the name of the uh, the uh, paper and the date and the year. So we've got uh, microprogramming principles and practice, 1970. The best way to design an automatic calculating machine, uh, 1951. Microprogramming and the design of the control circuits in electric digital computers, in 1953. The design of a control unit of an electronic digital computer, 1958. Microprogram control for computing systems, in 1963. Emulation of large systems, in 1965. Uh, card capacitor, a semi-permanent read-only memory, 1961. Microprogramming, IBM technical report. 1967, a guide to the IBM System 370, 1970. All right. So now we're up to chapter nine: inter-system communications. 9.1 Introduction. All large data processing facilities constitute a network of interacting vector handling digital systems. Each of these systems include at least an elementary control unit. These systems with their control units might be regarded as a set of separate intelligences organized to cooperate in accomplishing a computational task. One might observe a tenuous analogy with an industrial organization or committee of people united to work on a particular problem. <clears throat> Reminds me a little bit of Conway's law. Uh, fortunately, the condition of digital systems is less difficult and their individual capacities are used more efficiently than is the case with most committees of people. The intelligence of certain digital systems such as tape transports, is so rudimentary that they can function only in close communication with another system. In a computation facility, there is nearly always a very strong committee chairman, usually but not always the central processor, which closely coordinates the activity of the individual digital systems. Prior to our first major encounter with system interaction in the discussion of input-output in Chapter 10, it will be desirable to develop a means of describing inter-system communications. The problem of interconnecting two systems and providing for their communications is called interfacing. Problems arise in interfacing at the circuit design level, the sequential circuits level, and at the systems level. Although very real to the person who must design an interface, circuit problems such as level conversion and impedance matching can be conveniently divorced from a system's treatment. The sequential circuit problem involved in interfacing is synchronization. The discussion of this problem in section 9.4 will be applicable throughout the book. The remainder of the chapter will be devoted to an analysis of communications at the systems level. Some representation of the communications activity must be integrated into AHPL. As will be apparent, we shall, st <coughs> shall be still less concerned with automatic hardware generations at the multi-system level. Data lines and control lines which interconnect systems will be defined in the meta language, which is English, rather than in AHPL. 
This is, of course, consistent with the usual practice of constructing digital systems separately and connecting them as a final step. There's a note here. Individually controlled systems are not always mounted in physically separate units. Certain system pairs must be mounted in very close, uh, as in inches, proximity to maximize communication speed. There you go. The timing of communication between systems is part of the control function. We must therefore provide notation for sending and receiving signals in HPL. Close related to multiple control is the notation of parallel processing. Parallel operations can be specified at several levels. The simplest of parallel operations can be handled with the notation already available. In its most sophisticated form, parallel processing clearly involves multiple control. It is an intermediate form, parallel sequences of operations, which shall be considered in the next section. As parallel sequences become longer and more complex, the distinction between this format and multiple control becomes less clear. Section 9.2, Parallel Operations. Figure 9.1, simple parallel transfers, convergent with known timing relation, convergence of arbitrary sequences, timing diagram for convergence circuit, example 9.1. Figure 9.5, registers for process controller. Section 9.3, where is control? As the user looks from the outside of a large digital system, he sees many input and output ports which seem to be simultaneously absorbing and disgorging information. From the user's manuals, he learns of many internal activities which are said to take place simultaneously. What is controlling all of these activities? How is it that these activities seem to cooperate rather than compete? Are these parallel operations controlled by a single intelligence or several? That parallel control sequences and separate control might not be totally different can be argued in terms of the figurative model shown in figure 97A. Oh no, figure 9, uh, figure 9.7. Okay, here. parallel sequences and multiple control. A portion of a control sequencer feature, featuring three parallel sequences is represented by figure 97A. Only the paths of propagation of the control pulse within the control unit are depicted. The transfers which take place are left to the imagination of the reader. Figure 97b differs from 97a only in that the individual parallel branches have become more complicated. A control pulse can circulate in a path containing a loop for long periods of time, where such is the case for two or more loops. One might argue that the pulse convergence circuit serves to provide occasional communication between the separate control sequences embodied in these loops. Figure 97C, uh, the individual control loops have been formally separated to form distinct control units. Two-way communication between these separate control units is indicated by the dashed arrows. Presumably this uh, communications capability is more flexible than could be provided by depending on the pulse convergent circuit. To go further in comparing the details of interloop communications between figures 97A and 97B would be esoteric at best. The primary purpose of the rest of this chapter will be to develop the model suggested by figure 97C. Recall once more that the three parallel paths 
in the parallel control sequence of example 9.1 worked with three disjoint sets of registers only in step 6 of figure 96b after the three paths have converged does a transfer involve registers from more than one of these sets this is a method not necessarily the only method of ensuring the satisfaction of what we shall call rule 9 1 rule 9 1 a single register can be the destination of no more than one transfer in the same clock period hmm. As pointed out in chapter 4, the result of trying to transfer two vectors into a register simultaneously is unpredictable and cannot be tolerated. Rule 9.2 applies to registers which may be the destination of an asynchronous transfer. Recall that precautions were taken to assure satisfaction of this rule in example 9.1. Rule 9.2. The contents of a register must not be read at the same time when they might be in the process of change due to an asynchronous transfer. When control is separated into two or more distinct control units, as in figure 97C, the register arrays are usually separated and associated with the individual control units. Uh, the result is two separate subsystems. In order that there be an interact or interaction between the systems, certain registers must be provided which can be accessed by both systems. As suggested by the communications registers CR1 and CR2 in the model of figure 9.8, such a register remains part of one of the systems. In order to assure that rules 9.1 and 9.2 are satisfied and to assure that data transfers between the two systems via CR1 and CR2 are meaningful, some means must be provided so that each of the control units can know what the other is doing to CR. We shall find it convenient to use the term know in reference to control units from time to time in our discussion. Definition 9.1. A control unit may be said to know a piece of information related to its function if its information is properly coded and stored so that it may be used to influence branch operations within this control unit. Section 9.4. Synchronization. Until now it has been assumed that all systems considered were timed by the same clock and that the physical distance between the subsystems was small. If either, if either of these assertions is not true, a new set of problems arises. Suppose a pulse from a separately clocked control unit 2 in figure 9.8 arrives at control unit 1 to indicate that a vector has just been placed in CR1. This pulse may clear a weight flip-flop and introduce an unsynchronized control pulse into control pulse oh there's a typo here into control pulse into control pulse control unit one depending on the design of the control delay the effect could be an indeterminate output from the control delay reached by this pulse the pulse could also initiate a transfer which might not be completed before the results were required by a succeeding transfer as suggested in figure 9.9. Unsynchronized data levels in the communication registers can sometimes cause problems also. Certain applications call for periodically checking a communications register without being instructed to do so by a pulse communication. An example is the interrupt register to be discussed in chapter 10. The transfer of data into communications register, which can be so freely sampled, must be carefully synchronized with a clock pulse. The synchronization of levels is easily accomplished as shown in figure 910A. A vector of data lines from a register or bus from another system is shown at the input of a subsystem. The synchronization mechanism is shown for only one line. Synchronization is accomplished by merely clocking the signal levels into an input register using the internal clock of the receiving system. The logic level on the input lines may change at any time, even during a clock pulse. 
This pulse may or may not succeed in triggering the level changes into the register. If not, the change in register output is delayed one clock period. Typically, the level of the level on an input will remain unchanged for several clock periods. In any case, whatever the register output, it will always be synchronized with the clock and internal control signals. The system of figure 10.9a uh, would be most commonly used where the individual lines in the vector are independent. Difficulty can arise if a vector representing a binary number, for example, is transferred in this way. The level changes may not appear at the subsystem boundary at precisely the same point in time. If the appearance of a binary vector approximately coincides with the clock pulse, some of the level changes may be clocked into the register, while others may wait for the next clock pulse. If the register is sampled in the interim, an error may result. Consider the machine tool controller of chapter 5. The normal sequence of numbers transmitted to the controller might vary only slowly in magnitude. It might be tempting to supply the numbers to the tool in sequence to be synchronized as shown in figure 910. In this way, no control communications would be required. Suppose two consecutive data numbers expressed in octal are 007765 followed by 010043. If the second number were only partially clocked into the tool register, some such number as 017767 might reside there for one clock period. This number is appreciably greater than the two correct numbers, which are close together in magnitude. An undesired transient in the movement of the controller might be the result. This problem could be most easily avoided by letting a control pulse from the controller place data in the tool register. Thus, only one control unit would be involved and no synchronization would be required. If two systems are physically close and timed by a single clock, it is common for the control unit of the sending system to pulse information into registers in the receiving system. Where the systems are physically remote or timed by separate clocks so that synchronization is required, this approach is rarely used. Most commonly, a communications pulse is provided to the control unit of the receiving system to indicate when new information has arrived on the data lines. When such a pulse is received, the control unit may treat the data lines as if they were a bus within the receiving system. The vector on the data lines may be pulsed by the control unit into any register. As illustrated figuratively in figure 910b, the synchronization problem is transferred to the pulse line. As discussed at the beginning of the section, an unsynchronized pulse cannot be allowed to enter a control unit. The circuit required to synchronize a control pulse is somewhat more complicated than the single flip-flop required to synchronize a logic level. An approach to pulse synchronization is most easily discussed in terms of the circuit of figure 911a. Is it a latch? Are we going to be talking about a latch? I wonder. Which uses two SC flip-flops. The input pulse is used to set the first flip-flop, output Y1, to 1. The level Y1 cannot be gated with a clock pulse to generate a synchronized pulse as it too is unsynchronized. A partial pul pulse could result. The level Y1 is very much analogous to the input level in the level synchronizer of figure 911A. This level is used to set the second SC flip-flop at the time of the next clock pulse labeled in figure 911B. The synchronized level Y2 can then be used to gate a synchronized pulse as illustrated. Note that the clock pulse labeled 2, which generates the synchronized pulse, 
also clears both flip-flops Y1 and Y2 to zero. This readies the circuit to accept another input pulse. Although the input pulse need not be as narrow as shown, it must have returned to zero before clock pulse 3 arrives. As a general observation, some control communications must always be in the form of pulses so as to discreetly separate each data vector in sequence. Each pulse will cause a separate action by the control unit. Depending on the form of the synchronizing circuit, these pulses could be several clock periods wide, but in some sense, they must be pulses. The rightmost flip-flop in figure 911A must be a master-slave flip-flop since its inputs are a direct function of its outputs. The leftmost flip-flop could be merely two crossed coupled NOR gates. Thus the total number of gates used in figure 911A, including those used to implement the flip-flops, is 12. There are three state variables or feedback loops in the circuit Y1, Y2 and the internal loop of the master-slave flip-flop. The fundamental mode designed pulse synchronizer of figure 912 is slightly more economical in that it uses only 10 gates. More important, it will generate a synchronized output pulse one clock period sooner in most cases. The output from this circuit will be a pulse synchronized with the first clock pulse following but not overlapping each input pulse. Figure 912, faster responding pulse synchronizer. Where rapid response is important, the circuit of figure 912 would clearly be preferable. In other applications where the extra clock period is not critical, the easily constructed circuit of figure 911 could be used with perhaps extra confidence. In some cases, the extra clock period may be desirable to allow sufficient time for the data to arrive. Section 9.5 Conventions Notation for inter-system communication. Data transfer rates. If two systems are synchronized, data can be transmitted for finite periods of time at the rate of one data vector per clock pulse. There's a note here. In very fast systems, a new timing problem can arise when an attempt is made to synchronously read data from and pulse data into a register in the same clock period. Control pulses from different control units may not be precisely synchronized. To eliminate the possibility of trouble <coughs> requires the use of still more complicated memory elements, edge sensing master slave flip-flops. On we go. Figure 915, memory to memory transfer hardware. I suppose DMA de de uh, wasn't um, available at this point in history. Uh, section 9.7, a, tra uh, a tape transport controller. In chapter 10, we shall consider the interconnection of a medium scale digital computer and its associated peripheral equipment. The viewpoint will be one of looking out from the central processor. The peripheral equipment themselves will not be considered in detail. The example in this section illustrates how the control unit for the typical peripheral equipment might be approached. In general, it serves to illustrate the use of conventions defined earlier in this chapter. Figure 916, connections to tape transport. The term sprocket signal is apparently derived from the sprocket holes in paper tape, which actually control the mechanical movement of the tape. It has become fairly standard in referring to magnetic tape. The sprocket signals serve the same function as the signals derived from the timing track of a disc, that of marking the position of each character. Magnetic tape read logic. Wow. Control sequencer for read. 
And we're up to the problems for this chapter. Not many references, just three. So we've got digital magnetic tape recording, principles and computer applications, 1965. Introduction to switching theory and logical design, 1968. And error detection for peripheral storage devices in computer design, 1972. Chapter 10, interrupt and input output. Let's take a break. Introduction. In this chapter, we are concerned basically with the problem of communicating with the computer. Input-output devices are those devices by means of which the computer communicates with the outside world. Interrupt is a part of the communications problem because we must get the computer's attention before we can communicate with it. Interrupt procedures enable us to notify the computer during normal processing operations that special conditions exist which require the computer to put aside its current program as quickly as possible and institute special steps <coughs> to deal with the special conditions. Input-output operations are not the only <coughs> reasons for interrupt but they are probably the most common. Also the special machine instructions dealing with interrupt are usually grouped with I.O. instructions, so it seems logical to consider interrupt and I.O. together. Among the more common I.O. devices are card readers and punches, printers, teletypewriters, and paper tape punches and readers. These are all electromechanical devices of great complexity, but details of how they are constructed will not be considered here. We are concerned only with how the computer communicates with these devices. With regard to communications with the computer, all these devices have three special characteristics which account for the special nature of the I.O. problem. First, their operation is completely asynchronous with respect to the central processor. Second, their speed of operation is many orders of magnitude slower than that of the central processor. For example, the data rate of a typical card reader would be 300 words per second, compared with the typical CPU rate of a million operations per second. Third, their data format is usually quite different from that of the central processor. From the standpoint of communication with the CPU, magnetic tape, disk and drum are generally considered to be I.O. devices because they share these same three special characteristics. We have previously considered these types of devices as memory, but this is simply a matter of point of view. These devices are memory in the sense that the CPU can store information in them and later retrieve it without intervention, but they are I.O. in the sense of requiring special techniques to deal with their characteristics of slow, asynchronous operation and special data formats. There is probably more variation from computer to computer in the areas of interrupt and I.O. design than in any other area of computer design. This being the case, we cannot hope to cover all possible techniques in line with our belief that learning best proceeds from the specific to the general, we shall develop typical interrupt I.O. systems and then comment on the variations and options open to the designer. Section 10.2 Interrupt System for SIC There are many possible situations which can require interruption of the main computer program. Internal interrupts usually are caused by various types of error conditions such as arithmetic overflow or invalid memory address. External interrupts arise because of requests from I.O. devices for attention. Uh, the occurrence of these conditions may generate, generate only transient signals, so we need a means of storing the fact that the condition has occurred. For this purpose, we shall provide an interrupt register, INTR, with one position set aside for each interrupt condition specified by the designer. Thus, one position might indicate arithmetic overflow, another a memory fault, etc. In addition, we shall occasionally need status indicators, which are simply individual flip-flops which are set to indicate that some special condition exists. 
these indicators shall be denoted by names ending in F, such as int F, EIN F, etc. The dis F for flag, probably. Did it say? Oh, flip flop, who knows? Uh, the designer's uh, decision as to what conditions shall be provided for in the entire register determines what conditions might possibly cause interrupts. It is also desirable that the programmer should be able to exercise control over which conditions will actually be allowed to cause an interrupt under various conditions. In particular, the programmer may wish to establish priority among various I.O. devices. For example, it may be desired to ignore a request from a slow device, such as a card reader, if a faster device, such as a disk, is already being processed. To provide this programmer control over interrupts, we establish a mask register, MR, having the same number of positions as inter-R. By means of a special command, to be discussed later, the programmer can set or clear any position of the mask register as desired. If a position of MR is set to 1, the corresponding uh, position of inter is enabled. That is, when it is set by an interrupt request, it may in turn set the interrupt indicator int f. If a position of MR is 0, the corresponding position of inter is disabled so that its setting has no effect on int f. <coughs> the uh, logic <laughs> by which this is accomplished is shown in figure 10.1 masking of inter interrupt requests so it's just basically an AND gate with the the mask register that's pretty easy when a condition <coughs> demanding interrupt occurs the CPU should respond as quickly as possible in most computers, the interrupt will occur as soon as the instruction currently being executed has completed before fetching a new instruction. Thus, before entering a new fetch cycle, the control unit should check to see if an interrupt has been requested. Referring back to figure 6.5, we see that a new fetch is initiated in SIC when the control unit returns to step 1 after incre incre incrementing the program counter in step 25 or loading a jump address into the program counter in step 27. Once during each instruction cycle, control must interrogate the masked interrupt signals and set the interrupt indicator in F if any are present. Uh, we then insert a new step 1 to cause a branch into an interrupt sequence if interf is set. The interrogation of the MIS should come at the latest point common to all instructions immediately before the branch at step 4. The modified control sequence will then be as shown below. Step 63 is the start of the interrupt sequence. ENIF is the enable interrupt indicator. Figure 10.2 Modifications for interrupt detection. And figure 10.3 Interrupt priority circuit. Uh, typical interrupt routines in order to clarify the above let us consider a specific interrupt situation figure 10.5 format an example of int instruction Ten point three basic data transfer operations. Any data transfer operation will involve some or all of all of the following steps. Check to see if the device is available. When the device becomes available, activate. Transfer data, deactivate.
Section 10.4, Input-Output Interconnections. There are two classes of information that must be transferred between the CPU and I.O. devices, data and control or status information. The most common arrangement for data transmission is the I.O. bus, which from a logical point of view simply consists of a set of N lines providing bidirectional transfer of N bits between MD and the CPU and the data registers of the I.O. devices as shown in figure 10.6. If there are no direct transfers between I.O. devices, the principal saving achieved by the use of an I.O. bus is in cabling. As shown in figure 10.6, the bus is routed serially from device to device rather than routing two cables between each device and the central processor. In addition, the switching located at the input to the central processor is simpler, although the switching at each I.O. device is more complicated. Since the resistors connect, sorry, not the, I'll just take a break. Since the registers connected to the bus are located in separate devices, a single bus control register and decoder cannot be used. As shown in figure 10.6, a separate flip-flop controls the path between each device data register and an I.O. bus. These flip-flops are set and cleared locally by the device <coughs> control units. Clearly, a procedure must be provided by which one device, usually the central processor, issues bus control commands so that no more than one register is connected to the bus at a given time. The functions assigned to bus control flip-flops are intended to suggest their, their function, e.g. MDIO bus in the central processor. For clarity of discussion, we shall use two separate notation in AHPL for connecting the output of a register to a bus. For example, MDIO bus gets 1 and IO bus gets MD, shall both mean connect the output of MB, MD to IO bus. The later form will often be used for emphasis. These notations will be used whenever convenient throughout the book. For output, MDIO bus equals 1 gates the contents of MD onto IO bus. A pulse generated by the addressed I.O. device then gates the bus contents into, into its data register. For example, <coughs> the bus control flip-flop in the uh, appropriate I.O. device is set to 1 to place the contents of its data register into I.O. bus. <coughs> the CPU then issues a pulse to transfer the bus contents into MD. From an electronic point of view, the I.O. bus may be quite complex, including amplifiers, level shifters, etc., but the net logical results are as described above. In addition to the I.O. bus, there must be paths provided for transmission of control information between the CPU and the I.O. devices, which we shall refer to as the control slash status lines. There are two distinct modes of interconnection possible. First, there may be a separate set of control slash status lines to each I.O. device as shown in figure 10.7a. In this case, the CPU addresses a specific I.O. device by placing signals on the appropriate set of lines and determines which I.O. device is signaling by noting which lines are active. Second, there may be a single set of control slash status lines connecting to all I.O. devices as shown in figure 10.7b. With this arrangement, the control status lines must include a set of address lines with each device <coughs> assigned an address or selector code. I guess we call those IRQs these days. To address the device, the CPU places its selector code on the address line. Each device is equipped with a decoding circuit by means of which it recognizes its own code and upon receipt of which it will gate in information from the other control status lines. When a device signals the CPU, it must transmit its own code as a means of identification. Logically, there is little real difference between the two methods and often a combination is used some control slash status lines being common to all IO devices, others running, in, running to sig 
single devices. The choice between common or individual control slash status lines depends largely on the degree to which various I.O. devices may interface with each other on common lines. For programmed transfer, common lines are most frequently used because all transfers take place under the control of the CPU, which can therefore control access to the lines so as to prevent interference. In buffered transfers, however, transfer takes place at the request of I.O. devices and separate buffered devices may make requests for service at the same time. It is usual practice to provide separate control slash status line for each buffered device with sequencing of their requests handled by the CPU. This is figure 10.7, basic types of control slash status connections. Oh, look, they are going to talk about DMA. If enough separate control slash status lines and logic are provided for buffering of four devices at a time, for example, we will say that four buffer channels are provided. This nomenclature is perhaps unfortunate since the word channel suggests a completely separate set of lines, data and control status for each device. Sometimes, especially in early machines, this has been the case, which probably accounts for the use of the name channel. However, even though buffer requests may occur simultaneously, only one word at a time can be transferred in or out of memory, so only one set of data lines, the I.O. bus, is needed. Thus, the arrangement shown in figure 10.7a is the most common for buffer channels. By contrast, the DMA channel, which is completely self-controlled, is a completely distinct channel even to a separate memory port as discussed in the previous section. All right, so they must have talked about DMA earlier. I don't, I don't remember that. We must have skipped it. Section 10.5, IO system for SIC. To provide a specific example of the I.O. concepts discussed in previous sections, we shall now develop an I.O. system for SIC to provide program of buffered transfer. The basic block diagram of SIC with the I.O. system added is shown in figure 10.8. We assume up to eight I.O. devices all connected for program transfer through the I.O. bus and control status lines. Additional buffer control lines are provided for four buffer channels. The purpose of the various additional registers will be explained as we de develop the various control sequences. This is figure uh, 10.8. The block diagram of SIC with IO circuits added. Wow. There will be seven instructions included in the I.O. group. That is, instructions for which the first four bits are all one. Hmm. Figure 10.9, I.O. class instructions. Figure 10.10, partial flow chart of I.O. sequence. Buffer channels for SIC. A partial block diagram of SIC, including only those portion used in buffer operations, 
is shown in figure 1011. The reader will recall that buffer operations take place between instructions and must be performed in such a manner that the main program is not affected. Therefore, all registers whose status must be preserved from one instruction to the next have been deleted from figure 1011 to emphasize that they are not available for buffer operations since only three of the regular registers MD, MA and IR are available certain special registers have to be added for bus buffer processing the buffer word counter, counter BWC is a 13-bit register used in processing the buffer addresses there are two 4-bit registers each having one bit for each of the four buffer channels the position of the buffer IO register BIOR will indicate if the corresponding channel is engaged in an input or output buffer equals 1 for input equals 0 for output the position of the buffer channel ready register BCR will be set by signals from the corresponding channel requesting the attention of the central processor the channel counter CC is a 2-bit counting register which will contain the number of the channel the buffer channel currently being processed the buffer channel lines consist of three groups of four lines each one line in each group for each channel note that the buffer channels do not share common signaling lines as in the case of the control status lines this is figure 1011 a block diagram for the buffer section of the SIC This is a flow chart of buffer sequence. And figure 1013 is a BCR scanner. When the system returns to the main sequence, step 1 checks to see if any more buffer requests are waiting to be received. Recall that buffer requests are completely asynchronous with respect to one another so that more than one request could have been present when this buffer cycle was started or more could have come in during the buffer cycle. Note that BCRN was cleared in the above sequence so another request is indicated by any other positions being set. Section 10.7 Theme and Variations <laughs> As noted in the introduction to this chapter, there are probably as many different types of interrupt and I.O. systems as there are different models of computers. So far we have discussed only the essential features of the most commonly used types of systems. If we compare the three basic types of I.O. systems, we may note a theme here that the speed of the I.O. system is proportional to the amount of extra hardware provided for I.O. Conversely, we may state that the speed of I.O. transfers is inversely proportional to the degree that CPU hardware is shared by I.O. and non-I.O. operations. There is essentially continuous spectrum of designs ranging from a completely shared CPU to completely independent I.O. channels and any division into categories is to some degree arbitrary. Nevertheless, the classification we have made is based on fairly clear-cut distinction. In the program transfer, each transfer of a word requires a formal interrupt of the main program and fetching of special instructions. In the buffered transfer, the main program is not interrupted and no instructions are fetched. But <clears throat> Some hardware is shared, so transfers may occur only between execution of main program instruction. In the DMA transfer, the only hardware shared is the memory itself, and the main program will be unaware of the I.O. activities, except to the degree that it may occasionally have to wait longer for memory than would otherwise be the case. Even though these distinctions are fairly sharp, there are obviously many possible variations. At one extreme, program transfer may involve even less separate hardware than we proposed for SIC. 
we may eliminate the status register and the control status lines and route all information, data or control status via the IO bus and the accumulator or some other arithmetic register. Possibly the ultimate example of this approach is the unibus concept in which all registers, both CPU, arithmetic and control registers and IO data registers communicate through a single common bus. Thus, a transfer in or out of an I.O. register is no different than a transfer in or out of any other register. This scheme has a certain straightforward simplicity, but the total lack of special hardware for handling I.O. would increase the chance of the machine being monopolized by I.O. operations. Intermediate between the programmed and buffered approaches would be one in which instructions would have to be fetched for each transfer, but enough extra registers and logic would be provided so that the main program would not have to be disturbed. Similarly, we can achieve a compromise between buffered and DMA operation. Note that three memory references were required to process the address in the buffer sequence developed for SIC. By providing a separate register for each channel to hold the word count, we could reduce this to one reference per transfer. By providing two registers per channel, we can eliminate all memory references for address processing. The DMA, the DMA approach can be extended by providing separate control logic to handle all phases of I.O. Inquiry, activation and deactivation, as well as the actual transfer. When this is done, the resultant collection of hardware is often referred to as the channel controller, and it is essentially a special purpose computer sharing memory with the CPU. When an I.O. operation is desired, the CPU transfers one instruction to the channel controller, simply indicating which I.O. device is to be used and the size and location of the buffer area and then leaves all the details to the controller. Channel controllers vary enormously in capacity and complexity in systems that are primarily IO oriented such as interactive time sharing systems. The controllers may actually be more complex than the CPU and may even be in control telling the CPU what to do rather than the other way around. In some cases the CPU and channel controller may be different model computers, one selected for its IO capabilities, one for its processing capabilities. These machines communicate through access to a common memory. An interesting example of this approach is found in the CDC 6000 and 7000 series machines which consist of one central processor and 10 peripheral processors. The peripheral processors which handle all I.O. activities are small completely independent computers each with its own small memory but also sharing access to the main memory with the CPU. Features of these machines will be discussed in more detail in chapter 14. An interesting and important variation on the interrupt procedure is the use of the program status word, PSW. When an interrupt takes place, the status of the interrupted program must be preserved by storing appropriate information, such as the contents of the program counter register. When the program is restored, the MR register must be restored to the appropriate condition, which implies that the desired mark register setting is stored in an instruction in the interrupt program. Further, setting up the interrupt requires putting a new address into the program counter and then setting the new MR and a new setting of the MR. From the above, we see that replacing a main program with an interrupt program, or for that matter, replacing any program with any program, requires the exchange of certain information. To make this exchange as systematic as possible, we specify a program status register, PSR, which will at all times contain the information which must be preserved in order to preserve the status of any type of program. The PSR will basically consist of the concatenation of the P program counter register, the MR, and various indicators, the exact nature of which will depend on the computer. The contents of this register <coughs> are referred to as the program status word, PSW. Associated with interrupt sources will be a reserved location in memory in which the programmer will store the PSW for the interrupt program associated with that source. 
PSW would contain the starting address of the interrupt program, the desired mass register setting, and such indicator settings as may be required. When an interrupt occurs, the CPU simply exchanges PSWs, storing the current PSW of the interrupt program into the second reserve location and loading the PSW of the interrupt program into PSR. The reader should note that there is nothing basically new here. This same information must be exchanged in any interrupt procedure. The PSW concept makes this exchange somewhat more systematic than it might otherwise be. This approach is very important as it is used in IBM System 360 and 370 and all the many imitators of those systems. Now we've got a bunch of program problems. Problems, problems for chapter 10. And uh, no references for, for chapter 10. There you go. Up to chapter 11, high speed addition. All right. I wonder what high speed addition was in 1973. Maybe we'll find out. Introduction. One of the main concerns of the computer designer is obtaining the highest possible operating speed subject to various technical and economic constraints. As we have seen, the adder plays a central role in the operation of the computer and is thus a major factor in determining the overall speed of most machines. As a result, the design of high-speed adders has been the subject of exhaustive study from the very beginning of the computer era. Over the years, a number of fast adders have been developed, but today the majority of fast adder designs utilize some version of the carry look-ahead principle. The carry look-ahead adder was first described by Weinberger and Smith in 1956. The design was further refined in the design of the stretch computer. This version was described by McSorley in a 1961 article, which is the basic reference on the subject. Flaws, 1963, presented the first description in a textbook, and his description is probably the most complete to date. A particular problem of notation arises in describing adders. It is standard practice in articles on adders to number the bit position starting with the least significant digit as bit position 0, uh, the next most significant as bit one, etc. However, as we have seen, uh, in pra uh, the practice in numbering registers is exactly the opposite. Uh, the most significant digit position being bit zero. Uh, the former convention is convenient from a point of keeping the equation simple since we start writing equations with the LSD position. If we adopt the latter convention in a p-bit adder, the least significant digit is bit p-1. The next uh, digit is bit p-2, etc., which makes for very cumbersome notation. To keep things as simple as possible while remaining consistent with the register notation, throughout this chapter we shall discuss a fix fixed length adder of 64 bits from bit 0 as the most significant digit to bit 63 as the least significant digit. The reader should have no trouble adapting the equations to adders of any other length and we feel that the slight loss of generality will be more than compensated for by the advantages of a consistent system of notation. Section 11.2 Ripple Carry Adder The simplest form of parallel adder is the Ripple Carry Adder which consists of full adders connected as shown in figure 11.1 the basic ripple carry adder. The combinatorial logic subroutine generating this adder was presented in section 7.5, but we wish to analyze it in detail at this time to set the stage for discussion to follow. The adder combines an add end and an org end a and B to develop a sum S. A given full adder in the jth bit position 
receives the jth bits of the add end and organ, aj and bj, together with a carry in from the next least significant digit, c j plus 1 and produces the sum bit sj and the carry out cj. The truth table for a full adder is shown in figure 11.2 and the equations for the sum and carry bits are given in equations 11.1 and 11.2. Note that these equations are written in the second order sum of products form so that there are two levels of gating and or between input and output. If we let the delay through a single level of gating be delta t, then the delay in a single stage is 2 delta t, which is the minimum possible. We assume that all bits of the add end and org end arrive at the same time, but each individual adder cannot develop its sum until 2 delta t after it receives the carry from the previous stage. Further, if the add end bit is 1 and the org end bit is 0, or vice versa, the carry out will not be developed until 2 delta t after the arrival of the carry in. In the worst possible case, the carry may have to propagate, that is, ripple through, the adder from one end to the other with a delay of 2 delta t in each stage and a total delay of p delay of p to delta t for the whole adder. The worst case will rarely occur if the add end and org end bits are both 0 or both 1 then the output carry is independent of the input carry but we must allow for the worst case Thus, for a 64-bit adder, we must allow 128 delta T for addition. And even with very fast electronics, this can be an intolerable delay. As a result, the ripple carry adder will generally be found only in small, inexpensive computers. Section 11.3, the minimum delay adder. A basic theorem of Boolean algebra states that any Boolean function, no matter how complex, can be realized in a second order sum of products or product of sums form. All the bits of the add end and org end are assumed to be available simultaneously, so there would be <coughs> there would seem to be no theoretical reason why we can't develop a second order equation for each sum bit and eliminate the delays of carry propagation. Let us investigate this possibility for the 64-bit adder. For the, least for the least significant digit position, we have S64. Uh -huh. Okay, well, there's some, uh, there's some equations for the least significant bit and for the carry, and then for the next stage. And then we substitute... Uh, equation 11.4 into 11.5 to eliminate the propagated carry. Uh, there's a note here that the carry to the first stage, C64, is used in complement arithmetic and is assumed to be available at the same time as the add in and organ. Okay, so they've got a carry in, fair enough. And they call it C64. That's fine. Okay, uh, substituting uh, 11.4 into 11.5 to eliminate the propagated carry, we have this monster, 11.6. Here we have a second order equation exclusively in terms of the original inputs to the adder. So S62 will be developed with the same delay as S63. However, equation 11.3 requires only four, three input NANDs and while equation 11.6 requires 12 for input NANDs, if we carry the same process on further, we find that S61 requires 4, four input and 24 5 input NANDs, and S60 requires 4, 4 input, 8, 5 input, and 48, 6 input NAND. It is obvious that the number and size of gates is rapidly becoming totally impractical. <coughs> S0 would require approximately 
10 to the power of 20 gates. There you go. And take a quick break. This is uh, section 11.4, uh, the carry look ahead principle. <clears throat> we have seen that the ripple carry adder is too slow and the minimum delay adder impractical. So we look for something in between. In one sense, we need to find a way to factor the equations of the minimum delay adder into groupings of practical size. There are an infinite number of ways <coughs> of factoring the equations and many have been tried. But the most successful designs all utilize the carry look ahead principle. We begin by taking a slightly different approach to the implementation of the individual full adder. Notice from section figure 11.2 that if AJ equals BJ equals 0, then CJ equals 0 regardless of the value of CJ plus 1. Similarly, if AJ equals BJ equals 1, then CJ equals 1 regardless of CJ <coughs> plus 1. If AJ doesn't equal BJ, <coughs> then the carry out C CJ is the same as the carry in CJ plus 1. In the latter case, we say that the carry propagates through stage J, where the carry out of stage JI is 1, regardless of the carry in, we say the stage J is a generate stage. <coughs> this interpretation of an adder stage is given in figure 11.3. So that's, uh, that's figure 11.3, the carry propagation. Uh, stage J is a generate stage if and only if GJ, as defined by equation 11.7, is 1. GJ equals AJ and BJ. Stage J is <coughs> a propagate stage if and only if PJ is defined by equation 11.8 is 1. PJ equals AJ XOR BJ. <coughs> is, that what, is that what that is? I'm not sure. Anyway, we're looking at the carry look ahead principle. Uh, there's four, four cases of carry propagation. And we've got our full adder circuit again. All right. And then we've got figure 11.5, the carry look ahead unit. Okay. Figure 11.6, the complete adder for bits 60 to 63. Okay. If we examine equations 11.14, 11.15, 11.16, we see that they are iterative in form, and there is no reason why we could not continue the same process to write equations for C60, C59, etc. These equations <coughs> would be second order, so the CLA unit could be extended to cover more bits with no increase in delay. However, as we increase the number of bits, the size and number of gates also increases. C61 requires four input gates. C60 would require five input gates. C59 would require six input gates, etc. So the number of bits the CLA unit can cover is limited by the fanning capability of our gates. Circuit technology makes it generally impractical to go beyond about 8 bits in the basic CLA. 11.5 Group carry look ahead. As the next step in our design we shall divide the 64-bit adder into 4-bit groups. Bits 0 to 3 comprising group 0, bits 4 to 7 group 1, etc. We then define group generate GG and group propagate GP terms as shown below for group 15. Bits 60 to 63. The group generate term corresponds 
to the situation where a carry has been generated somewhere in the group and all more significant positions are in the propagate condition so that the carry propagates on out of the group. Hmm. The group propagate corresponds to the condition where all bits in the group are in the propagate condition so that a carry into the group should pass right through the group. Note that these terms are implemented by the leftmost five gates in the CLA, as shown in figure 11.5. Next, we note that there is a carry out of the group if a carry is generated in the group and propagated out, or if there is a carry into the group which is propagated through the group. <sighs> Thus, we can define the group carry, uh, GC15, which is equal to C60, by the following equation. C60 equals GC15 equals GG15 or GP15 and GC16 where GC16 equals C64. The carry into the group <coughs> in a similar fashion we can develop equations for the group carries from succeeding 4-bit groups. Uh, except for the names of the variables, equations 11, 19, 11, 20, and 11, 21 are seen to be identical to equations 11, 14, 11, 15, and 11, 16. Thus, the group carry terms can be developed by the same type of CLA circuit as used for the ordinary carries, figure 11, 5. The interconnection of adders and CLA units for bits 48 to 63 is shown in figure 11.7. The group carry unit is labelled GCLA for purposes of identification but is the same circuit as the CLA units. Uh, yeah. Now let us consider the delay for these 16 bits, again considering the worst case. The carry is generated in PG63 in 2 delta T and propagates through CLA15 to develop GG15 in 2 delta T through GCLA3 to develop GC13 in 2 delta 3 and through CLA12 to develop C48 in 2 delta T. Thus the carry propagation delay in figure 11.7 is 8 delta T compared to 32 delta T for 16 bits of a ripple carry adder. We are now beginning to see some significant improvements in delay times but we are not done yet. Section 11.6 uh, Section Carry Look Ahead We now divide the 64-bit adder into 16-bit sections and define Section Generate SG and Section Propagate SP terms in a manner exactly analogous to the group terms. Uh, these equations will be seen to have the same form as SG3 equals that monster and SP3 equals something slightly less ugly. Equations 11.17 and 11.18 for the group generate and propagate terms. <clears throat> Thus, the five leftmost gates of figure 11.5 will form SG and SP terms. When the inputs are GG and GP terms, the SG and SP outputs from GCLA are shown in figure 11.7. This is figure 11.7, a 16-bit adder with group carry look ahead. Hmm. We now develop equations for section carry out and in the same manner as for the group carry outs, these equations are seen to have the same form as those used for the original CLA unit, so the same form of circuit can be used again with one small change. Since there will be no further levels of look ahead, the final carry <coughs> output carry C0 must be developed. To develop this term, C0 equals 11.27. <coughs> Connect a SC4 input to the gate on figure 11.5 which develops GP and connect the output of this gate to the OR gate which develops GG on figure 11.5. This gate will now develop C0. The complete block diagram for the 64-bit adder with three levels of carry look ahead is shown in figure 11.8.
and this is figure 11.8, a 64-bit adder with three levels of carry look ahead. Applying the same sort of analysis as before, the reader should be able to convince himself that the worst case delay through this adder would be 14 delta T compared to 128 delta T for the 64 bit ripple carry adder. Thus we have achieved about a 9 to 1 improvement in speed, certainly a worthwhile accomplishment. However, we must also consider the cost of this speed improvement. An exact cost analysis would depend on the hardware chosen, but a good measure of the cost of a logic circuit is the total number of gate terminals, inputs and outputs, since this number will generally be proportional to the total number of active devices. The full adder of figure 11.4 has 22 terminals, giving a total of 1,408 for 64 bits the CLA unit of figure 11.5 has 56 terminals and there are 21 CLA units in the complete adder of figure 11.8 including the two extra inputs in the SCLA required for C0. This gives a grand total of 2,586 terminals for the complete adder. The cost of a ripple carry adder will depend on the full adder configuration chosen. The simple circuit shown in to the, author, to the authors has 27 terminals giving a total of 1728 terminals for 64 bits thus for less than a 50% increase in cost we have achieved about 9 to 1 increase in speed our, make, our remarkable speed to cost trade off section 11.7 generation of adder logic <coughs> by combinational logic subroutine. We have now <coughs> completed our discussion of the principles of the carry look ahead adder, but we have actually generated only a sample of the equations describing it. The structure of the adder is highly repetitive in form, with the same form of equations occurring many times, so it is ideally suited to description by a combinational logic subroutine. The adder is made up of two basic types of units, the full adders and the CLA units. The full adders are quite simple and need only be duplicated 64 times. If we consider the uh, equations for the CLA units, equations 1114, 1115 and 1116 for example, we see that they are iterative in form. If we let C64 equals G64, then each equation consists of a G term and one or more products of G and P terms. Since this same form of carry equation occurs in all the CLA units at all levels, it is convenient to develop a subroutine to generate the carry terms. This is shown in figure 11.9. Okay. So that's just doing the, uh, the carry look ahead um, with code. Uh, the inputs to the subroutine are P and G. The vectors of the carry and propagate terms developed by the full adders C in the carry into the group, e.g. C64 for CLA15, I, the index of the carry bit being developed, and J, the index of the carry into the group. Uh, a trace of this program for C62 is shown in figure 11. 10 uh, in this well that's interesting in this program H is the counter on the index of the G term in each product and M is the counter on terms in each product uh, the inputs to the add ABC subroutine are the add end and org end A and B and the carry in C. Uh, the outputs are the sum S and the output carry C0.
The reader will recall from the discussion of complement arithmetic that the operands may be the true or complemented form of the numbers in the input registers. The carry in may be 0 or 1, and overflow may be signaled by the presence or absence of a carry out, all depending on the signs of the operands and whether the operation is addition or subtraction. We will assume that all decisions with regard to these matters are made by external logic. Thus, the adder could be used with any type of number representation, sign magnitude, twos complement, or ones complement, with all decisions with regard to the nature of the inputs and the interpretation of the outputs left to the external logic. The complete add subroutine is shown in figure 1111. That's here. The first two statements specify the number of bits in the adder and the number of bits per CLA group. Thus, the program can be used for different size adders just by changing these two statements. <clears throat> there you go. Statement, uh, statements 2 and 3 give the number of groups and the number of sections. Statements 4 to 8, uh, four to eight uh, define the dimensions for the uh, various vector variables. Step 9 establishes the input carriers to carry into the SCLA unit. Steps 10 to 12 initialize the counters on sections, groups, and bits respectively. In each case, I defines the number of unit being processed and J the number of input to that group or section. Steps 13 and 15 set up the linkage between the section, group, and car bit carry numbers, e.g. C16 equals GC4 equals SC1, etc. Uh, steps 14, 16, 17 de decrement the section, group, and bit counters. The loop from step 17 to step 22 develops the GPS and C terms. The decision at step 21 breaks out of the loop when a group of K bits has been completed. Steps 23 and 24 develop the group, generate, and propagate terms. Steps 25 sets J equal to I, since the carry now being generated is the carry in to the next group. Step 26 checks to see if the section is complete. If not, step 27 develops the, the group carry and the program returns to step 15 to process the next group. When a section is complete, the branch at step 26 leads to steps 28 31, which develop the section terms. Step 32 checks to see if the adder is complete. If not, the program returns to step 13 to process the next section. Section 11.8, the carry completion adder. There is another type of adder which applies a comp completely different approach and therefore deserves some comment. We have noted that the worst case, the carry, propaga uh, the carry propagation from one end of the adder to the other will occur only with certain combination of operands. In most cases, there will be stages in either the generate or no propagate condition every few bits so that any given carry is likely to propagate through only a few stages. It has been shown uh, that the average maximum carry length for a 64-bit adder is about 7 bits. Thus, the average time for addition in a ripple carry adder would be about 14 delta T, the same as for the full CLA adder design in previous sections. In the carry completion adder, circuitry is added to detect when all carries are fully propagated and issue a completion signal. Upon receipt of the completion signal, the computer can then go on to the next step without waiting to allow time for the rare worst case. A carry completion adder of typical design has a cost about halfway between that of the ripple carry and the CLA adders. This type of adder has been used in few machines but has not met with much acceptance. The main problem is that it is difficult to make effective use of the time saved by the carry completion order. If the add time is fixed, uh, we can schedule other things to be going on at the same time. But if the add times may vary over a range of 64 to 1, it becomes very difficult to synchronize other operations with the adder. Section 11.9 Summary the carry look-ahead adder has been considered in detail for two reasons. 
First, it is probably the most popular form of fast adder. Second, it is a classic example of the ingenious application of logic design to the problem of obtaining increased speed at minimum cost. The validity of the first reason may change with time due to developments in device technology. However, it is inter interesting to note that the carry look ahead principle, which was first applied to vacuum tube circuits, has also been applied to integrated circuits, resulting in CLA adders nearly a thousand times faster than the original vacuum tube versions. A design principle which has remained viable while component speeds have increased by several orders of magnitude has certainly demonstrated some intrinsic validity. On the other hand, as basic logic speeds continue to increase, the ordinary ripple carry adder may become so fast compared to other system components such as memory that the CLA adder will be less attractive economically. But whatever the future may bring for the CLA adder, the logic design principles it illustrates will remain important. The careful analysis of the arithmetic process and the resultant factoring of the equations into iterative forms are basic ideas which will remain applicable to any technology. And the references for chapter 11. We've got the logical design of a 1 microsecond adder using 1 megacycle circuitry, 9 1956, and we've got high speed arithmetic in binary computers, 1961, the logic of computer arithmetic, 1963, the logic design of transistor digital computers, 1963, and fast high accuracy binary parallel edition, 1960. Up to chapter 12 multiplication and division. Signed multiplication. In chapter 6, the multiplication of negative numbers in complement form was accomplished by first determining the sign of the product, converting the operands to magnitude form, and carrying out the multiplication. For numbers stored in one complement form, this conversion can be accomplished by merely reading the operand bits from the complement side of each flip flop in the respective register. Thus, for one's complement machines, sign and magnitude. Sign and magnitude provides a satisfactory approach to multiplication. In the twos complement system, the process of complementing requires extra circuits addition cycles, which may be considered to consume time unnecessarily. Recall that in chapter six, multiplication was initiated with the multiplicand in the MD register and the multiplier in the AC register. As the multiplication progressed, the multiplier was first transferred to MQ and the product was uh, gradually formed in AC and shifted, least significant bit first, into the MQ register. At the conclusion of this operation, the product is fan found spanning AC and MQ. We now propose to carry out multiplication in the same manner without first converting the operands to magnitude form. Thus, MD and MQ may contain two complement numbers, or we shall see, as we shall see, it will be necessary to modify the hardware program slightly. Our goal in doing so will be to accomplish any corrections in the same time intervals as the basic shift and add operations. All right, so if we go a little bit more APL, talking about how they want to do the, here's the flow chart of assigned multiplication. There we go. All right, code, code, code. Section 12.2, uh, multiplication speed up, carry save. The time saving offer offered by the technique discussed in the last section is relatively small. At best, it eliminates two addition required for complementing, and since there may be n additions required for an n bit multiplier, this is a minor saving. It is often included since it requires <coughs> little extra hardware little extra hardware. In order to make any significant reductions in multiplication time, we must <coughs> reduce either the number of additions or the addition time. If multiplication is to be provided, we will almost certainly use a fast adder, such as the CLA adder discussed in the previous chapter, in the last chapter. But the necessity for n complete additions will still make multiplication relatively slow. Many techniques for multiplication speed up have been proposed, most of, most of which are discussed in floors. We shall consider only a few of the more significant and representative techniques. 
Certainly the best method of speed up in terms of cost performance ratio is the carry save technique. This technique provides very significant increase in speed with relatively little extra hardware and there are few multipliers of any size which do not include this feature in some form. The basic notion of carry save is simple. The addition process may be visualized as developing a set of sum and carry bits, shifting the carry bits right and updating the sum and carry bits. This process continues until the carry has been performed and shifted n minus one times. This is actually a synchronous interpretation of the usual carry propagation process. Now suppose a series of numbers is to be added together one at a time. Since addition is associative, the process is not changed if the next argument is added in at the same time as the shifted carry the process continues with a new carry word form and shifted with each addition until the list of numbers to be added is exhausted. From that point the carry is allowed to propagate normally through n minus 1 stages to complete the arithmetic. Multiplication, so we've got uh, figure 12.3 the example of carry save multiplication. Multiplication is an example of the process described above with the ith argument uh, consisting of the multiple hand shifted i minus 1 bits to the left if the ith bit of the multiplier is 1. Otherwise the ith entry is 0. The process is illustrated for a simple example in figure 12.3. The process consists of four steps of additions to the partial product followed by a fifth step representing completion of the carry propagation. In this figure we have shown the computer form of the process with the relative shift, left shift and carry save word CS and the multiplicand actually provided by right shift of the partial product. The CS word is shown boxed for emphasis and the space in the ACMQ word indicates the boundary between partial product and the shifted remainder of the multiplier. In analyzing the example, note that the contents of the ACMQ registers in each step prior to the last do not represent the binary sum of the three inputs, but rather represent the bit-by-bit -bit exclusive ORing of the three input vectors. For example, at step two, we've got that equals that, x all that, x all that, and the carry bits, zero, one, 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 are shifted and added in step 3. The reader should follow the process step by step and if necessary check by carrying out the multiplication in the usual manner. And figure 12.4 ripple carry adder converted to carry save adder. Ah, section 12.3 multiple bit speed up techniques. So far we've assumed that only one multiplier is to be handled each cycle. By carrying out multiplication for several bits at a time, the number of cycles can be reduced. This will reduce the overall multiplied time if extra hardware is provided to process multiple bits in the same time as single bits. First, we must provide for multiple shifts in the same time as single shifts. And second, we must provide means of adding multiples of the multiplicand in a single addition cycle. You got figure 12.5 bit triplet multiplication. Okay. Section 12.4 speed analysis. Before proceeding further, it will be instructive to derive some expressions which will allow us to compare the speed of various multiplier configurations. In order to carry out this analysis, it is necessary to make some assumptions regarding the speed of various operations relative to the basic clock rate of the computer. Let sigma represent the propagation delay through two levels of logic. The time required to change the contents of a register will then be on the order of 2 sigma to 4 sigma, depending on logic family used. To allow time for logical operations during transfer and some tolerance for stray delays, the clock period might typically be set to tau c equals 8 sigma. As we saw in the last chapter, the carry propagation time for a very fast adder might be tau p equals 7 sigma. 
On this basis, we will assume that a shift operation requires one clock period and add and shift operation two clock periods. And then off we go. Uh, figure 12.6 multiplication times for two clock periods per addition for two tau C. Section 12.5 large fast parallel multipliers. For a large fast machine with a heavy investment in memory and peripheral equipment, an additional investment in logic circuitry to speed up arithmetic and increase the machine's throughput is usually considered money well spent. The time for multiplication can be decreased from the level discussed in the previous sections by decreasing the number of intermediate storage times required. This must be accomplished while holding the propagation time preceding each storage time to a minimum. Section figure 12, 4 bit, 4 operand, combinational carry save adder. And then we're on to 12.6 division. In most computers, division is a considerably slower operation than multiplication. Its logical nature is such that it does not lend itself to speed ups as well as multiplication, and it occurs less frequent, frequently than multiplication in the general mix of problems so that slow speed can be better tolerated. In the machine using the complex 48-bit multiplication scheme described earlier, division takes four times as long as multiplication. The basic technique of division is the comparison or trial and error method. In decimal division, we compare the divisor to the dividend or current partial remainder, estimate how many times it fits, and then check the estimate by multiplying the divisor by the quotient digit and subtracting the new estimate, hence the name trial and error. Binary divisions are considerably simpler since the quotient bit is either 0 or 1. If the divisor is smaller than the partial remainder, the quotient bit is 1. And we subtract. If it is larger, the quotient bit is 0, and we do not subtract. An example of paper and pencil binary division of 2 7-bit, including sign numbers, is shown in figure 12.8. That's here. Consideration of this example indicates several special problems of division. First, placement of the binary point in the quotient requires not only knowledge of the position of the binary point in the divisor and the dividend, but also some information as to the relative magnitudes of the two operations. For example, both divisor and dividend can be fractional binary point to the left as in figure 12a but if the divisor is smaller than the dividend the quotient will not be fractional it is usual to assume both operations are fractional and to require that the divisor be larger than the dividend thus ensuring a fractional quotient provisions to ensure this condition may be included in either the hardware or software of the machine we will assume that this condition is met in the remainder of the chapter in the manual technique we determine whether or not to subtract by a visual comparison of the shifted divisor and partial remainder unfortunately the usual method of comparing the magnitudes of two numbers in a computer is to subtract one from the other and note the sign of the result thus we must subtract on every cycle further since a negative difference will be indicated by a carry out of the most significant digit position we must allow time for the carry to propagate all the way through so carry save is ruled out in the manual technique we shift the divisor right to make it smaller than the partial remainder. In a computer, since the adder is fixed in position relative to the registers, we accomplish the same result by shifting the partial remainder left. As we do so, we shift the quotient into the MQ register. Figure 12.9 illustrates the computer implementation of division for the same example as figure 12.8. And on we go for division. And then here we are in summary of multiplication and division. Our goal in this chapter has been to suggest some of the problems and options available in the implementation of multiplication and division. We have not attempted to provide all of the information which may be required to make a design decision. The reader will hopefully have gained sufficient insight to consider in more detail the various aspects of multiplication and division as the need arises. As before, we have uh, utilize AHPL as much as possible so that the reader will retain the confidence that he can fill in the details of a hardware realization in a straightforward way. 
we have restricted ourselves to fixed point arithmetic. Floating point is the topic of the next chapter. As we shall see, however, most of the material of this chapter is applicable to floating point. It is only necessary to add a few registers for handling the exponents and some additional control logic. And we've got some problems and our references. The Logic of Computer Arithmetic, 1963. Digital Computer Design Fundamentals, 1962. Uh, fast Multipliers, 1970. Uh, a 40 nanosecond 7 bit by 7, 17 bit by 17 bit array multiplier, uh, 1971. Digital computer design, uh, 1963. And high speed computer multiplication using a multiple bit decoding algorithm, 1970. And now we're up to chapter 13 floating point arithmetic. Introduction. Floating point notation is the computer equivalent of the familiar scientific notation. For example, rather than writing the speed of light as uh, 300 million meters per second, we generally write 3 times 10 to the power of the 8 meters per second, or the Fortran equivalent 3.0 E08. Virtually all high-level programming languages provide for this type of notation and provision for handling numbers in this form can be included either in the software, the compiler, or in the hardware. We have concerned in this chapter, uh, so we are concerned in this chapter with the hardware procedures for handling numbers in this form. All our discussions of computer arithmetic up to now have assumed fixed point operation. There's a note here. Uh, this should not be confused with the fixed format F format of Fortran, which concerns only the form of the numbers for input output. Okay. The radix decimal or binary point is not physically present in a computer register, but is assumed but its assumed position clearly must be known. When we add two numbers together, such as 3.6.81 plus 1.041 equals to 7.851. The decimal points must be aligned. However, the length of the numbers, <coughs> whatever the length of the numbers, when we add the contents of two registers, the corresponding bit positions are combined. So we must assume the same position for the radix point in both uh, registers for the results to have any meaning. Uh, it is general practice in computers to assume the radix point immediately to the left of the most significant digit. All right. As was done for the division process in chapter 12, the chief reason for this practice is to preserve alignment of the radix point in multiplication and division. For example, consider multiplication in a computer with three digit decimal registers. Multiplication inherently produces a double length product. But our registers are only three digits, so we can retain only the three most significant digits. We note that the decimal point in the product is in the correct position to the left of the MSD, most significant digit. With any other position of the decimal point in the multiplier and multiplicator, the decimal point of the product would be in the wrong position. Not all numbers are fractions, so how can we use a fixed point computer? The answer is that at input, each number must have a scale factor assigned to it to convert it to a fraction. Thus, 531 will have a scale factor of 1000 assigned and will enter the machine as 0.531. This assignment is done by the loading program and must be done even for floating point machines. The difference between fixed and floating point machines is in what is done with the scale factor after it is assigned. In a fixed point machine, the programmer must keep track of the scale factor and take it properly into account in all operations. This can be done, but it is very complicated. When compilers are written for fixed point machines, the scaling is provided by the compiler. So users of the machine writing the high level language are not aware of the problem. 
While it is possible to handle scaling problems by programming, the resultant programs or compilers tend to be inefficient because of the many extra steps required to keep track of the scale factors. In floating point machines, we substitute hardware for software, or in some cases, we microprogram the computer to handle the scale factors. The scale factors become part of the data words and are handled automatically by the hardware. The resultant hardware is relatively complex and obviously adds to the cost of the computer. However, the operation of the machine is so much more efficient that floating point hardware is usually considered a good investment and is emitted only on small computers. Another important reason for floating point is the increased range of the computer. Consider a fixed point computer with 48 bit word length with one bit reserved for the sign, the range of numbers can be represented as <coughs> sorry, the, no, the, the range of numbers that can be represented is plus or minus 2 to the power of 47, which is approximately plus or minus 10 to the power of 14. Though this seems very large, there are many classes of problems for which it is inadequate. For example, in electronic circuit problems, we frequently deal with resistance in mega ohms, which is 10 to the power of 16, and capacitance in picofarads, which is 10 to the minus 12. A range of values of 10 to the 18, too large for a 48 bit fixed point machine. In floating point, each data word A is divided into two parts the mantissa and the exponent. If A stores a positive floating point variable A, then A is given by... Uh, I don't know what that is. What's that? I should know that. I don't know. Where AM and AE are the mantissa and exponent, uh, respectively. In a typical 48-bit machine, the mantissa might be 37 bits, including sign, and the exponent 11 bits. Now the range of numbers can be represented as plus or minus 2 to the power of 36 times plus or minus 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 11 equals plus or minus 2 to the power of 36 times plus or minus 2 to the power of 2048 which approximately equals plus or minus 10 to the power of 630. Wow. Uh, the Increase in range has a cost in accuracy since we have lost 11 bits of precision or about three decimal digits. However, 36 bits still provide about 10 decimal digits of accuracy adequate for most problems. In addition, most machines with floating point arithmetic also provide fixed point arithmetic for greater accuracy and may also provide double precision arithmetic for even greater accuracy. I'm just going to have a look and see if I can find out what that symbol means. Yeah, I don't completely understand this symbol here. Um, this is the uh, the mantissa and this is the exponent. <coughs> uh, it says that it's the decode function. I, I don't know. It's, it's used in various uh, ways, but I, I don't understand uh, how it's really used here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <coughs> So, uh, uh, <clears throat> on to section 13.2, notation and format. Uh, the first decision we have to make in designing a floating point system is the number of bits to be used in the exponent. Uh, this it depends to an extent on the total word length, but is generally between 7 and 14 bits. The choice obviously involves a compromise between range and accuracy. For our examples in this chapter, we shall specify a 48-bit machine <coughs> with a, uh, I think that's meant to say a 48-bit mantissa with a 11-bit exponent, or maybe they mean... I'm not sure. Uh, seems like that's a typo. Okay, the next question is the arrangement of the various parts of the data word. 
Uh, the most common arrangement places the sign of the mantissa in the bit zero position, followed by the exponent, then the mantissa, as shown in figure 13.1. The separation of mantissa and its sign may seem awkward, uh, but this arrangement offers some advantages. First, the bit zero position will be the sign for fixed point format, <coughs> and this position may be uh, specially set up for sign manipulation since the mantissa is handled as a fixed point number it seems reasonable to preserve its sign position similarly the rightmost bit position is set up for receiving the input carry required in certain complement arithmetic so it is desirable to keep the least significant digit of the mantissa in this position third <coughs> the exponent is more significant than the mantissa so placing the exponent to the left of the mantissa seems that <coughs> means that relative magnitude comparisons can be made by the same algorithms as for fixed point numbers we will therefore adopt the format shown in figure 13.1 notice in the figure that the sign of the mantissa that is the sign of the floating point number is denoted separately as AS <clears throat> ASAM will be considered to be in two's complement form. All right. Next, consider the mantissa of exponent representation. Obviously we must provide for both positive and negative exponents. The most straightforward approach is to use the same representation used for the mantissa and fixed point numbers, i.e. signed magnitude, two's complement or one's complement, as the case may be, with the exponent sign in the most significant digit position of the exponent section, bit one in the format of figure 13.1. This system has been used in many machines. Another system of representation known as biased exponents adds a positive content constant to each exponent as the floating point number is formed so, the inter so that internally all exponents are positive. For example, with an 11-bit exponent section, 2 to the power of 10 is added to each exponent so that in octal notation exponents range from 000 to 3777 with 2000 corresponding to a true exponent value of 0. There are at least two major reasons for the use of biased exponents. One is that the absence of negative exponents may provide some simplification of the exponent arithmetic the second factor relates to the manner in which zero is represented in floating point form. Formally, zero times anything is zero, so that the exponent associated with a zero mantissa, mantissa is apparently arbitrary. In some machines, when a computation results in a zero mantissa, the exponent is left at whatever value it happens to have resulting in a dirty zero. However, as we shall see later, dirty zeros may result in a loss of significance in some computations. As a result, most machines assign the smallest possible exponent to a zero mantissa, producing a clean zero. With <coughs> unbiased exponents, uh, the smallest possible exponent is the most negative possible exponent <clears throat> but with biased exponents it is zero the floating point representation of zero is then the same as the fixed point i.e. all zeros this means that the same circuitry and the same commands can be used to test for zero regardless of the type of arithmetic <clears throat> the biased exponents corresponding to various floating point values are shown in figure 13.2. Note that 2 to the power, uh, sorry, minus 2 to the power of 10 and 10 
to the power two to the power of ten minus one are the smallest and largest possible exponents, respectively. Finally, note that there is no particular problem converting to and from the biased form. Numbers have to be converted between decimal and floating point binary on input and output in any case, and the biasing of the exponent does not make the conversion any more difficult. Another question about representation arises from the fact that in floating point notation, there is no unique representation for a given number. For example, 0 0.5 times 10 to the power of 2 and uh, 0 0.05 times 10 to the power of 3 represent the same number. <coughs> uh, since the uh, number of bits or digits in a register is fixed, we obviously reduce the number of possible significant digits if we carry along non-significant leading zeros. Therefore, it is standard practice on input of floating point numbers to adjust the exponent so that the leading bit or digit of the mantissa is non-zero. Numbers in this form are said to be normalized. Now consider the subtraction of one normalized number from another. The result is unnormalized. In most machines, post-normalization is performed after every operation to ensure that all operands are always in the normalized form. In the above example, the result would be normalized to 0 0.1 times 10 to the power of 5. There are some who feel that post-normalization is undesirable because it may hide a progressive loss of significance in a sequence of calculations. Most computers either use normalized arithmetic at all times or else offer the programmer the choice of using it or not. We shall use it in all of our examples. Hmm. Section 13.3, Floating Point Addition and Subtraction. In this, exam in this section, we shall develop an AHPL routine for handling floating point addition and subtraction. The emphasis will be on presenting an understandable treatment of the arithmet arithmetic operations without worrying about the details of the hardware configuration. The existence of necessary regi registers, data paths, and combina combinational logic circuits will be assumed. In the last section of the chapter, a specific hardware configuration will be developed. In these analyses, two input operands will be A and B, and the result will be C, and the sine, exponent, and mantissa sections will be denoted by adding the letters S, E, or M, respectively. Thus, the operand A is made up of the catenation of its three components, A, S, A, E, A, M. I was just looking up uh, IEEE uh, floating point standards. They've obviously got the 32-bit and the 64-bit additions. Um, apparently the IEEE floating point standard uses both normalization and biasing. Uh, and the biasing for the 32 bits uh, was 127 for the exponent. So that's subtracted to get the actual exponent. <coughs> and it was 1023 for the 64-bit sign uh, <coughs> floats and uh, yeah apparently they're normalized and the, uh, they're normalized so that the leading digit is a 1 um, which is true except for subnormals where it's, uh, it's, uh, it's 0 <coughs> anyway there you go so when we go over here let's do uh, section 13.3 floating point addition and subtraction in this section we shall develop the HPL routine for handling floating point addition and subtraction uh, the emphasis will be on presenting an understandable treatment of the arithmetic operations without worrying about details of the hardware configuration. The existence of necessary registers, data paths, and combinational logic circuits will be assumed. In the last section of the chapter, a specific hardware configuration will be developed. In these analyses, two input operands will be A and B, the result will be C, and the sine exponent and mantissa sections will be denoted by adding the letters S, E, or M, respectively. Thus, the operand A is made up of the catenation of its three components, 
A is ASAEAM. For addition and subtraction, the exponents must be equal before the mantissa can be added or subtracted. For example, if A equals 0 0.111010 times 2 to the power of 7 and B equals uh, 0 0.101010 times 2 to the power of 5, then B must be converted to 0 0.001010 times 2 to the power of 7 before the mantises can be combined. Thus the first steps are to compare the exponents, subtract the smaller number from the larger, then shift the mantissa, uh, having the smaller exponent, write a number of places equal to the difference between the exponents. Note that significant digits will be lost from the number shifted, and if the difference between exponents is larger than the number of digits in the mantissa, the smaller number will be shifted right out in the above example. If B equals 0 0.101010 times 2 to the power of 1, then after shifting to equalize exponents, B equals 0. <clears throat> Thus, if the difference between the exponents is larger than the number of digits in the mantissa, the answer is taken as equal to the larger operand. This pre-shifting also accounts for the loss of significance with dirty zeros. Assume that one operand is a dirty zero with a large exponent and the other is a non-zero number with a small exponent then the non-zero operand may be shifted right out, giving an incorrect zero answer. After exponent equalization, the mantises are added or subtracted in the usual fashion. If the result overflows, the mantissa is shifted one place right and the exponent increased by one. The control sequence then checks for exponent overflow. If the exponent of the inputs was the largest possible for the machine, then increasing it by 1 as a result of mantissa overflow will result in exponent overflow, indicating a result too large to be represented by the computer. <coughs> if there is no mantissa overflow, a check is made to see if the result is normalized. If not, the result is shifted left until a non-zero digit appears in the most significant digit position, decreasing the result exponent by one for each shift. In the event of an all-zero result, post-normalization step <coughs> should be skipped. After normalization, a check for exponent underflow is required. <coughs> If the input exponent was close to the most negative possible, decreasing it further for normalization may result in underflow, indicating that the result is too small to be represented by the computer. Uh, the complete flow chart for this process is shown in figure 13.3. At, at step 1, the exponents are compared. For this purpose, we assume the existence of three combinational logic functions indicating the relative magnitudes of the three combinational logic function indicating the relative magnitudes of the two exponents there's a note here the above statements simply define the three functions in the simplest algebraic terms using relational operators the design of the actual combinational logic subroutines required to implement them is left as an exercise all right <sighs> All right. Alternatively, the comparison could be made by subtracting one exponent from the other and checking the sign of the result, but we shall assume the faster combinational approach here. And on we go. And here's a flow chart for add okay and then there's a bunch of code fair enough section 13.4 floating point multiplication and division okay for floating point multiplication we add the exponents and multiply the mantises 
Mantissa multiplication may be done by any of the various methods discussed in the previous chapter, and thus may be fairly simple or quite complex. In other respects, floating point multiplication is somewhat simpler than floating uh, addition or subtraction, as there are fewer special conditions to worry about. There is no pre-shifting required and no possibility of mantissa overflow. A flow chart for floating multiplication is shown in figure 13.4. Step one checks for blah, blah, blah. So this is the flow point, floating point, flow chart for floating point multiply. And on we go with some APL code for how to do it. All right. Um, they didn't talk about division. Did they just make that a, a special case of multiplication? Probably. <clears throat> so uh, our division is very similar. The exponents are subtracted and the mantis is divided. A zero divisor leads to an overflow, a zero dividend to a zero quotient. We shall leave the writing of program for floating point divide as an exercise for the reader. There we go. So we've got uh, 13.5, hardware organization for floating point arithmetic. In the previous sections, the exact hardware configurations were not specified. Separate registers were assumed for all operands and results, and no separate MQ register was specified for multiplication. In practice, the register layout for floating point multiplication and division is quite similar to the layout for the corresponding fixed point operations. Considering the complexity of the floating point processes, it is hardly surprising that there are many different uh, hardware arrangements used for implementation. As a general rule, the same registers and added ad, adder used for fixed point or integer arithmetic are used for processing the mantises. The variety lies chiefly in the way the exponents are handled. One possibility is to split the registers electronically so that the same registers are used for all parts of the floating point data words. An alternate approach, which is probably more commonly used, is to unpack the exponents and place them in separate registers. Even if separate mantissa and exponent registers are used, the arithmetic and logic circuits may be split or shared by the mantissa and exponent registers. Alternately, <coughs> completely separate arithmetic and logic facilities may be provided for the exponent processing. Just which approach is used may depend on the manner in which address modification, particularly indexing, is handled. If index addition is done in the main adder, then the main adder will probably also be used for both exponent and mantissa processing. If a separate adder is used for index addition, this adder will probably also be used for exponent processing. Uh, this latter alternative is particularly attractive if the exponents and the index quantities are comparable in size, which they often are. And here's figure 13.5, the block diagram of floating point hardware. There you go. <clears throat> One possible organization for floating point operation is shown in figure 13.5. This arrangement provides much greater clarity in analyzing the various aspects of floating point than does any shared hardware approach. The mantises will be handled in the same three 48-bit registers that would be used for fixed point or integer arithmetic, MD, the memory data register, AC, the accumulator register, and MQ, the multiplier quotient register. All three registers will be provided with logic for one bit right and left shifts and the AC and MQ may be connected for shifting if desired. <clears throat> Rather than indicate just an adder, we uh, indicate an arithmetic logic unit, ALU. As we, have, as we have seen in our analysis of the floating point operations, it is necessary to be able to detect certain special conditions such as a mantissa equal to zero. Uh, these conditions will be detected by combinational logic circuits with the appropriate register positions as inputs. Often these logic circuits may be wholly or partially realized by sharing the logic of the adder. For example, in a carry look ahead adder, the condition of equal signs would be indicated by P bar zero equals one. For this uh, reason, we simply specify the ALU, a package of combinational logic to realize the desired function. 
And then we go, there's some problems. Then we're up to chapter 14. Features of large, fast machines. Overview. With the exception of the discussion of arithmetic in the last three chapters, we have restricted our treatment to elementary computers. In this chapter, we turn our attention to large machines, which are designed to accomplish many computations per unit time and as much computation as possible per unit cost. Many large computer uh, systems are operated in either the batch processing or the time sharing mode. In both situations, a queue of programs awaiting execution is always present at the input terminals to the system. Thus, the computer system takes on many of the characteristics of a production process. The goal becomes to maximize the number of jobs, weighted, of course, by their complexity, which are input to the system and executed per unit of time. A measure of accomplishment of this goal is called the machine's throughput. The raw material of the production process is programs rather than parts of an automobile to be assembled together. Programs, as contrasted to sets of automobile parts, are conceived and constructed independently by many different individuals with little thought given to the convenience of the production process. Some of the largest installations can afford the luxury of assigning different types of jobs to different machines. Other batch-oriented installations attempt to improve throughput by spacing jobs in time according to memory requirements or other apparent features which provide inform information as to job type. It is, of course, impossible to completely anticipate the requirements of a program until it is executed. In general, in general, it is the same flexibility which makes the computer program so very useful that renders it so hard to treat as a production item. Uh, perhaps more than any other one feature, it is the conditional branch instruction which limits the application applicability of mass production techniques on program execution and that I guess is in reference to the halting problem isn't it there are two obvious approaches to improving a machine's throughput the speed with which the central processor can perform arithmetic can be increased it is also possible to increase the speed at which data can be moved about the machine this includes input-output rates, memory access times, etc. In general, an efficient machine represents a balance between the two capabilities. For example, it would be wasteful of computation capability to utilize an extremely fast central processor with slow random access memory and a minimum input-output capability. When a central processor is forced to stand idle for significant periods of time because the system I.O. <coughs> is unable to deliver programs or carry off results fast enough, we say the system is I.O. bound. Because uh, batch processing facilities must handle many small programs and many I.O. oriented data processing assignments, such systems usually operate I.O. bound. The speed of all computer functions can be increased by increasing component speed. In chapters 11, 12 and 13 we saw that the speed of arithmetic operations could be increased up to a point by using more complex logic. Component speeds are limited by the state of the art and a point of diminishing returns is always reached in speeding up individual arithmetic operations. In this chapter we will be concerned with further increasing computer throughput by organizational innovation. As pointed out, data movement is more frequent limiting factor on throughput. Therefore, in the first part of the chapter, we shall investigate organizational techniques for speeding data flow. Sections 14.2 through 14.6 will deal with this topic. In sections 14, 17, 14, 7, 14, 8, and 14, 9, we shall investigate organizational innovations aimed at increasing the number of computations per unit time which can be performed by a central processor. In general we shall try to organize machines so that more than one computation can be accom accomplished simultaneously or in parallel. We shall find that it is impossible to completely separate computation and data movement. 
thus there will be considerable interrelation between the two sets of sections. The chapter concludes with a section devoted to byte-oriented machines. These machines are of interest because of their wide application to business data processing. In figure 14.1, we see a block diagram of a computer system which will allow us to outline the data flow problem in more detail. Here we classify the major subunits of a computer system into three sections according to response time. A memory unit is included in each section. As mentioned in Chapter 3, the capacity and speeds of the three memory units vary inversely. The high-speed memory in Block 3 has the smallest capacity, while the mass memories of Block 1 are the slowest. The random access memory is intermediate in both categories. The set of memories of differing characteristics may be termed a memory hierarchy. In some systems, it is possible to divide the hierarchy into more than three blocks. For example, the mass memory is assumed to include both magnetic disk and magnetic tape memories which have different speeds and capacities. Three blocks are convenient for this discussion, however. The high speed memory may consist of a few data registers and will be discussed in section 14.2 or a larger number of registers capable of accommodating instructions or data as discussed in section 14.5. In the latter case, it may take on many of the characteristics of the random access memory. Reading and writing in the memory in block 3 may be accomplished in a single clock period. <clears throat> it is likely that considerations such as LSI chip area um, and LSI as large scale integration and uh, power requirements will always place a cost premium on the components of the high speed memory. One would therefore expect to find in most systems a slower, cheaper and larger capacity RAM as shown in Block 2 regardless of the organisation of the high speed memory. Block 3 is organised so as to attempt both to minimise the cost per computation and to maximise the number of computations per unit time. Both of these parameters will be optimised for sequences of operations carried on entirely within Block 3. Unfortunately, such utopian situations will be highly temporary in most real-world job environments. The overall system throughput must depend on the flow of information along path B, C and D in figure 14.1. Ideally, path C will be used only rarely so as to avoid slowing block 3 <coughs> to the data rates achievable by the devices in block 1. Thus data flow will normally be along the path ABD ABD Right when the system is operating routinely in the batch mode Clearly data flow along path A will occur simultaneously with other system functions without interfering in any way. This is possible primarily because the system demands the right to accept programs from users and to furnish results at its own convenience. Many organizations have been devised <coughs> which will relieve the central processor in block 3 of the responsibility of data flow on path B. One of these will be discussed in section 14.9. Thus jobs can be placed in a queue in the random access memory to be executed in order by the central processor with the results independently removed after execution. This procedure is, of course, complicated by programs which demand large shares of the RAM or use auxiliary storage. With independent control, data flow along path B will depend on the capacity of block 1 to provide data and the capacity of block 3 to execute programs. The cost per computation will be lowest when these capacities are matched. A quantitative model of this relation may be found in Hellman. The more common situation finds the capacity of block 1 to provide programs and, less, and data less than the capacity of block 3. We have already <coughs> referred to this situation as IO bound. 
Path D is intimately involved in program execution. The high speed memory of block 3 may contain both instructions and data, so short sequences may be executed in entirely within block 3. When a branch to an uh, instruction in the RAM of block 2 occurs, however, it often becomes necessary to replace a sequence of instructions in the higher speed memory in as little time as possible without requiring block 3 to wait. Similarly, it may be possible to transfer arrays of data from RAM to the high speed memory at a data rate exceeding the maximum of the address rate for the individual words in the RAM. In section 14.3, we shall consider a method of organizing the random access memory so that the reading and writing of individually addressed words may be overlapped. Not only will this increase effective data rate, uh, but this same organization will permit communication with the memory by more than one processor. Like each of the topics in this chapter, the approach of section 14.3 may be included in a system design at the option of the designer. The designer must decide whether the performance improvement to be expected from the inclusion of one of these features is sufficient to justify the cost. Section 14.2 Register Symmetry and Multi-Address Instructions <coughs> uh, SIMD Single Instruction Multiple Data That's a contemporary technology still used in CPUs. Uh, <coughs> Among the most uh, time-consuming aspects of instruction execution are the continual references to the main random access memory for instructions and data. As solid state random access memories become common, an improvement in access time will be inevitable. However, the speed cost trade-off will remain. Economics will continue to force the use of slower, cheaper technologies for the main memory than are used for the high-speed registers within the central processor. In the next several sections, we shall discuss a number of organization techniques intended to minimize the time consumed by access to the main memory. One approach to reducing the number of memory references was incorporated into most third generation machines. By adding a small number of registers to form a very small high speed memory, it is possible to reduce both the number of instruction fetches and the number of data requests from the RAM. The number of instruction fetches is reduced through the use of multi-address instructions. A single add instruction, for example, might use an argument at address A to be added to an argument attained from address B and the result placed in address C. Because all three of these addresses are part of one instruction word, two instruction fetches are avoided. Multi-address instructions are, were mentioned earlier and uh, were first considered in the early days of computing. Their efficient application, however, depends on the use of the small set of high-speed data registers. It will usually be impractical to employ instruction words long enough to specify three addresses in the RAM. The number or address of a high-speed register can be specified by just a few bits where data in the high-speed registers can be used repeatedly, the number of data requests to the RAM is also reduced. Clearly, the relative improvement which may be achieved by this approach is program dependent. The diagram in figure 14.2, multi-register configuration for large machine. The diagram in figure 14.2 is suggestive of a multi-register configuration for a large general purpose computer. We have resorted to many notational simplifications in order to leave the diagram tractable. Uh, single arrows are used to indicate vector data paths and registers as well as logic units are grouped together in banks. An arrow from a register bank to a bus, for example, should be interpreted as representative of the network of connections of individual registers to that bus. The configuration on the left handles logical and integer operations, while that to the right handles the more complex arithmetic operations. Notice that the special registers IR, MA, and PC serve as logic and integer arguments. 
two separate busing configurations are provided, one for simple fixed point and logical operations and one for multiplication division and floating point instructions. The general purpose registers at the right labeled LR1 etc would generally be longer than the SR registers to accommodate the longer floating point operands. Notice that the O bus at the input to the long registers is specified into two sections, split into two sections. This makes it possible to provide communication with the short register O bus. The number of LR and SR registers is variable. Under certain conditions, the numbers N and M may be quite large. Clearly, many of the complexities involved in the execution of instructions on the configuration of Figure 4.2 remain unmentioned. No purpose would be served by attempting to treat such a mass of details here. We have presented this configuration first only because it is typical of what may be found in certain existing large-scale computers. Let us remove completely the right-hand busing configuration from Figure 4.2 and further specify 13 short registers plus registers SR0, MA and PC as registers 13, 14, 15 so that these registers may be addressed in the same manner as the SR registers. The modified configuration as depicted in Figure 14.3 is something of a super mini computer which can describe which we can describe in more detail. There you go. Simplified multi-register configuration. Notice that the data lines from memory are connected to the A bus with a direct connection between the A bus and O bus to provide for loading any of the 16 registers from memory. For convenience, we assume 24-bit words throughout we shall allow two types of instruction words. The first type, shown in figure 14.4a, 14 which is here. Okay, what did they say? That's uh, uh, the first type provides for obtaining an argument from or depositing a result in the random access memory. The second type of instruction illustrated in 144b calls for obtaining both arguments from the 16 data registers and placing the result in one of these registers. There you go. So two two registers. Uh, indexing, as indicated by bit 3, is possible where reference to the random access memory is specified. If IR3 equals 0, bits 4 to 7 may be used to specify some form of indirect addressing. Any of the 16 data registers may be used as an index register, as specified by bits 4 to 7. If IR3 is 1, consider the instruction uh, 244300040 in octal. Um, using the SIC opcode, we may interpret this instruction as calling for anding the contents of the word in RAM with the contents of SR3, the address of the word in RAM given by 40 plus the contents of SR2. The result must replace the argument in SR3. We can express the above sequence of transfers in AHPL if we represent the 16 data registers as the rows of a matrix SR. This implies, for example, that SR3 equals SR3 and SR15 equals PC. The following sequence begins with blah, 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 blah. So we're into some more code. We talk about multiple memory banks in section 14.3. The speed at which a magnetic core RAM may be operated is limited by physical considerations. Uh, the situation is only slightly more complex for a large semiconductor RAM. Uh, since the cost per bit to be allowed for such a memory is fixed by design decision, the available technologies are constrained and a limit on the operating speed is the result. There will always be applications of a random access memory in which its overall performance cannot be improved beyond a point dictated by the basic read and write times. 
There are circumstances, however, where the need for information from two consecutive memory locations becomes known at one time. It is possible to organize a slow random access memory so that several such memory references can be handled almost simultaneously. We shall first accomplish this by dividing the memory into several independent banks. Uh, the method of assigning addresses to these banks is called interleaving. A memory consisting of 16 interleaved banks is partially depicted in figure 14.5, interleaved memory banks. The complete memory contains 2 to the power of 18 words, 2 to the power of 14 in each bank. The assignment of memory addresses is shown in octal in the figure. Notice that the first overall address 0000000, 000 is found in M0, while the next address 0001 is found in M1, with 0000002 in M2, etc. Thus, the first 16 addresses are distributed over the 16 banks. The second 16 are similarly distributed, etc. This is interleaving. A sophisticated central processor will often find it advantageous to obtain the contents of several executive consecutive addresses for memory simultaneously. Typically, this information will be transferred to a scratch pad memory. The reader will see more clearly how these blocks of data may be used in succeeding sections. It should be apparent that the memory in figure 14.5 can be in the process of retrieving up to 16 consecutive data words simultaneously. The feasibility of this setup depends on a disparity between the access time of the individual memory banks and the basic clock period of the central processor. Suppose, for example, that core or MOS, uh, which is metal oxide semiconductor memories, uh, with access times of 500 nanosecond seconds are used well, the clock period is 20 nanoseconds. Thus, as many as 25 high-speed register transfers could be accomplished while a word was obtained from a memory bank. Suppose the processor in figure 14.5 becomes aware of a need to read data from several consecutive memory addresses. It begins by placing the first address in the processor address register shown. It can place a second address in this register <coughs> while the master memory controller routes the first address to the memory address register of the appropriate memory bank. This, pro this process can continue until an address of the appropriate This process can continue until an address in the processor address register is found to be located in a memory bank which is busy servicing a prior, prior request. In the case of the transfer of a very long block of data, the memory controller will begin transferring data into the processor data register at the same time new addresses are routed to other memory banks. The writing of the control sequence for the memory in figure 14.5 will be left as a problem for the reader. In the next section, a control sequence will be written for a somewhat more complicated situation. An alternate approach to 16 interleaved banks would be organizing the memory with words equal in length to 16 processor words. When a block of processor words are requested, a long word is read from memory and broken into segments as it is transferred to the processor. For several reasons, left to the inside of the reader, this approach is less flexible than interleaving. Section 14.4 Interleaved Banks with Multiple Entry Points Once the decision has been made to include multiple memory banks in a system, an additional advantage accrues. The memory can be accessed simultaneously from more than one entry point. These entry points may be connected to separate processes in a multiprocessing situation. Alternatively, they can be regarded as DMA points to speed up IO operations and accomplish, it, accomplish this in parallel with the execution of other programs. In this section, we will construct a control sequence for a four bank memory with four entry points. This sequence should serve to illustrate problems which will occur in other complex multipath data routing situations. Our basic 
configuration will consist of four separate memory banks as illustrated in figure 14.6. Memory layout. Each bank has a separate memory data register and a memory address register as shown. Any of the four memory banks may communicate with any of four entry points through their respective communication communications address register CA and communications data register CD. The memory unit and the processes are operated from the same clock source. Thus a processor can place a word in its CA register in one clock period and this word may be taken from the register in the next clock period by memory control. The data communications progress process may take place in either direction through a CD register. Two flip-flops, <coughs> R being R0 to R3 and W uh, being W0 to W3 are associated with each CA register for control purposes. If the corresponding R flip-flop is set to 1, a read is being requested. If W equals 1, a word to be written in memory is waiting in the communications data register with the address in the corresponding address register. If R equals W equals 0, the address and data communications registers are available to the entry point control unit. This indicates to the processor that it must take the next action. Uh, the transfer of addresses <coughs> between the CA and MA registers is accomplished by way of the bus. All right, we've got figure 14.7, uh, typical memory bank and communications hardware. Okay. Figure 14.8, address distribution. Okay. Bus control for interleaved memory. And we go. Scratch pad memories. <clears throat> we use the term scratch pad to refer to a high speed memory which is not in itself of sufficient size to satisfy the RAM requirement for the system in which it is found. Uh, there are several ways in which a scratch pad, sometimes called a buffer memory, may be organized. So these days we probably call that like an L1, L2 or L3 cache. Some of these approaches will be discussed in this section. Uh, the portion of figure 14.1 which depicts a path D between the larger RAM and the scratch pad is reproduced as figure 14.10. Alright, so there you go. Uh, the uh, simplest example of scratch pad memory organization is the register array discussed in section 14.2. The number of data registers which can be included in these arrays is limited. Three argument instructions can only be used for small arrays. In addition, it is difficult for the programmer to use larger high-speed arrays efficiently. Thus, we look for alternative organizations for high-speed scratch pads. However, the scratch pad is organized. The goal is to make the average access time for words requested by the central processor as near as possible to the access time of the scratch pad itself. Uh, this bound on the average access times, uh, average access time, uh, can never be actually achieved as the central processor will invariably request some items stored not in the scratch pad but in the large RAM. The slowing effect of references to the RAM may be lessened in the following three obvious ways. Point three was the topic of the previous section. So one, keep the ratio of RAM references to scratch pad references as small as possible. Two, overlap references to RAM with other central processor activities. Anticipate requirements for items from RAM in advance. And three, Organize the RAM so that the average data transfer rate is greater than the reciprocal of the access time. The three points are not independent. A certain anticipation of information requirements, as well as multiple use of items placed in the scratch pad, are implied 
if sequences of items are to be profit profitably obtained from the RAM at an increased transfer rate. In this section, we are primarily concerned with point one. And on we go, talking about uh, scratch pad memory. Uh, and then we've got associative memory. All right, yeah, I've, I've read about this before. This is um, this has a lot to do with how um, L1, L2, and L3 uh, caches are constructed, and it's basically some trade-offs that you can make. Um, so that's what this is all about. Should we read it? Uh, for convenience, we shall detail the design of a relatively small 256 word associative scratch pad memory. This memory will be operated in conjunction with a 256k word slow random memory. Yeah, right. Uh, figure 1412, uh, control for read from AM. I think AM it must be associative memory, is that what that's for? I guess so. Ah, virtual memory. Oh, wow. Uh, somewhat analogous to the associative scratch pad is virtual memory. While the scratch pad is included to shorten the effective access time of memory references, Virtual memory is an organizational technique for increasing the apparent size of the random access memory. That is, the number of random access addresses available to the programmer is substantially greater than the number of locations in the physical RAM. These additional data are actually stored in a semi-random access memory, that is, on a hard drive, usually. The actual location of a particular data word is transparent to the programmer, hence the term virtual memory. To be of any value, the virtual memory control must operate so as to make the probability large that a piece of data will be residing in RAM when it is requested. Figure 1413, typical virtual memory organization. Lock numbers are a are in decimal, addresses are in octal. There you go. Notice that consecutive blocks in SRAM are listed horizontally. Uh, the result is a form of block interleaving. That is, it is possible to place 32 consecutive blocks or 2 to the power of 17 consecutive memory locations in RAM. In a batch processing environment, this may include one or more complete programs. Section 14.7 Instruction Look Ahead The savings achieved by minimizing the number of storage references during instruction execution can never seem quite satisfying as long as a reference to memory is required by the fetch phase of each instruction. If a scratch pad memory is not used, one might attempt to reduce the number of fetch cycles which require reference to the main RAM by allowing short sequences of instructions to be stored in high-speed electronic registers as were data in section 14.2. If the number of look-ahead registers is sufficiently large, Short loops in the program can be traversed entirely within the look ahead unit, where a buffer memory with an access time equivalent to the look ahead registers is used. The same saving may be achieved by looping within the buffer memory. This assumes block transfers into the buffer as discussed in problem 1410. As the buffer memory may in some cases be quite large, the likelihood of storing a complete loop within the buffer is great. Thus, if a buffer is used, a very large number of registers within the look ahead unit would be redundant. There is further advantage in a look ahead unit with a few registers, however. 
the time consumed by the memory references may be approximately cut in half by overlapping the fetch and execution phases. That is, while one instruction is being executed, the next instruction can be fetched, placed in the instruction register, and readied for execution. This approach would be particularly advantageous where more than one word from memory are required to perform an instruction. As other aspects of this machine are well understood, we can most simply illustrate the design of this simple form of look-ahead unit in terms of SIC. In practice, it is unlikely that this feature would be included in such an otherwise elementary computer. Given the simple 8K memory originally provided for SIC, very little could be accomplished by adding a look-ahead unit. We must have the possibility of obtaining, of obtaining an instruction word and data word from memory simultaneously or serially <coughs> in a very short time period. This would imply an interleave RAM, a buffer memory, or both. For purposes of illustration, we replace the original SIC memory with a four-way interleave memory of the form described in 14.3. The memory will be identical to the one in section 14.4, except, except that the four banks will contain 2 to the 11 or approximately 2K 18-bit words each. The memory address registers will, therefore, be 13 bits. Only two of the entry points to the memory will be used in the discussion. The other two ports might be used for DMA input-output transfers, although additions to SIC as found in the chapter on I.O. will be disregarded here. A scratchpad memory will not be included in the design. Given the, the above configuration, uh, the principal payoff of the look-ahead unit to be discussed will be simultaneous fetch and execution memory references approximately 75% of the time. On the average, 25% of the data addresses will be found in the same bank as the instruction addresses. The resulting design will be the most elementary form of a look-ahead unit, but it should serve as an introduction to some of the awkward problems which are created when look-ahead is included in a design. Other than the memory, the only registers added to facilitate look-ahead are shown in figure 14.4, instruction look-ahead hardware. The instruction register IR1 contains the instruction under execution, while IR2 and IR3 are provided for the next two instructions in sequence. If the beginning of the control sequence, <coughs> sorry, if at the beginning of the control sequence the special flip-flop SH short contains a zero, the registers IR1 and IR2 contain the next two instructions in order. If short is 1, only IR1 contains the proper instructions. These two situations are illustrated in 14.14a and 14.14b. We shall see that short will be 1 following a jump or skip instruction. Uh, the control sequence will cause the instruction in IR1 to be executed while at the same time causing the next two instructions to be placed in IR2 and IR3. The program counter will contain the address of the next instruction to be obtained from memory, whether this instruction is to be placed in IR2 or IR3. The first step separates control for the jump instruction. In effect, the execution of jump and determination of the next instruction are the same operation. And we go, step two, step three, blah, 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 blah. We get section 14, sorry, figure 14, 15, a sequence of three micro instructions. All right. Uh, section 14.8, execution overlap. So far, we have limited our discussion of throughput improvement to speeding up the movement of data. If many of these innovations are included in the design of the machine, the execution of instructions by the central processor can become the bottleneck. A preferable situation 
would have the data movement and computation capabilities approximately matched. In this section, we begin our discussion of organizational techniques for speeding up instruction execution. The notion of operating a computer like an assembly line with an unending series of instructions in various stages of completion has intrigued designers for many years. Well, yeah, that's uh, certainly contemporary instruction proslight. Uh, pipelines are uh, a major part of contemporary CPUs. The instruction look-ahead problem, as discussed in the last section, and the hardware costs involved <coughs> acted to keep the idea on the shelf during the early history of computing. With the advent of LSI, and that's large-scale integration, this concept has been re-examined and in some cases put into practice. Our goal in this section will be to define the reservation control and routing system for a computer featuring simultaneous execution of instructions. Once again, our system is only intended to suggest one possible approach. We begin by considering an example of overlap within a single functional unit. All right, so we're going to, uh, this is multiplication in six segments. Okay, so this is uh, to do, uh, okay, registers for multiplication. Okay. Uh, APL-like assembly language program. Okay. So that's that's just all talking about uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 um, execution pipelines, and then we've got uh, section fourteen point nine multiprocessing. In the previous section, it was implied that in order to justify the cost of highly combinational arithmetic functional units, they must be kept reasonably busy. Whether this is so or not is an economic question. Factors such as the cost of LSI on which an answer to such a question might be based change continuously. If the answer is yes, they must be kept busy, then two approaches are possible. One approach is to use the computer system primarily in an environment of special problems in which the proportion of arithmetic operations to other instructions is greater than average. The highly parallel ILIAC 4 which will be discussed in chapter 15 is based on the premise that this is possible. Unfortunately, there may be only a few such special problem environments which can afford a large scale machine. The other uh, approach is to increase the rate of execution of instructions to a point at which the utilization of a particular functional unit is sufficient to justify its inclusion. In the case of the multiplication unit of the previous section, satisfactory utilization may mean intermittent occurrences of more than one computation in the pipeline. The notion of continuously full pipelines with a general purpose <coughs> which within a general purpose computing system may be wishful thinking. The look ahead unit touched on in the previous section represents an effort to increase the utilization rate of functional units. There it was assumed that only one program was in the process of execution at a given time. Relaxing this assumption leads to the concept of multi-processing. That is, let us postulate a set of n separate control units, each executing a separate program in central memory. Such a system is illustrated in figure 1419. Here we are, multiprocessing. So we've got RAM, buffer memory, usually we call that L1, L2, L3 cache, uh, processor cores, and then reservation control, functional units. Okay, that must be like the ALU and, and so on. Okay. The advantage, uh, or so such a system is illustrated in figure 1419. The processes share the items 
requiring the heaviest investment, namely the very large random access memory, peripheral equipment, and certain highly combinational functional units. The several processors should have less trouble keeping the pipelines filled than a single look ahead unit. The advantage of the system in figure 1419 is efficiency. The obvious disadvantage is that it is so large and therefore so expensive as to be of interest to relatively few installations. Perhaps it could be sold in modular or building block fashion. Unfortunately, the purchase of a single processor would find at least some hardware in the system for which the only justification is that it will make an end processor system operate more efficiently. With the intention of returning to the system of figure 1419 later, let us consider multiprocessing as a general term. This term has been given different meanings in different contexts. For example, multiprocessing has been used in a purely software sense to refer to an operating system switching back and forth from the execution of one program to another. Some advantage may be derived from this technique if one program under execution arrives at a point where extensive I.O. is required. Where DMA is employed, there can be simultaneous operations contributing to the execution of two programs. As no more than one instruction can be fetched and considered for execution at a given time, the above technique is properly referred to as multiprogramming. The term multiprocessing is reserved to refer to separate hardware control units executing separate programs simultaneously. Various forms of actual hardware multiprocessing may be found in existing machines. One of the earliest examples may be found in the CDC 6400, which is organized along the lines depicted in figure 1420, input-output multiprocessing. Here, the central processor execute programs sim simultaneously with 10 peripheral processors. The peripheral processors handle the chores of managing input-output, preparing programs for execution, and loading the main memory. No functional units are shared by the central processor and the peripherals. The main random access memory is not shared, in the sense that only the central processor executes programs in this memory. The peripheral processors merely load and unload central memory. There is extensive hardware sharing among the peripheral processors. It might even be argued that the specialized design employed actually binds the 10 peripheral process together as one processor under a single control unit. For further details, the reader is referred to the CDC reference manuals. In any case, there are at least two independent control units in figure 1420. Yeah, right. And we've got uh, section 1410, variable word length computers. Okay. All of the machine organization we've studied so far have assumed that all operations involve operands of a fixed length. No matter how complex the organization, we have assumed that each memory access involves one complete operand. The choice of the word length for such a machine necessarily involves a number of compromises. In chapter 1, we discussed the compromises involved in choice of word length, memory size, and instruction complexity. With regard to operand size, the word length should be large enough to handle the largest operands anticipated, but not so large as to waste excessive memory space on operands of average size. There you go. So we've got figure 14.21, which is a partial block diagram of variable word length computer. I think that's only really of historical interest at this point. Flow chart of typical MR1 sequence in variable word length computer.
figure 1423, addition in decimal, binary, and binary coded decimal. All right, this is the summary of chapter 14. <clears throat> In this chapter, as has been the case throughout most of the book, the emphasis has been on how to design rather than on what to design. Various factors which influence design decisions in large machines have been pointed out, but no systematic procedure for evaluating these factors has been presented. The reader can no doubt see the advantage of an analytical model which will indicate whether such features, such features as associative memories, look-ahead pipelining or multi-processing should be employed in a given design. Models of this type have in fact been developed but have generally been very complex and applicable only to specific situations. Rather than attempting to present a representative sampling of decision models, we merely call the reader's attention to their general use. As the costs implied by a design decision in the computer area are often very great, the designer must endeavor to take advantage of any analytical aids available. And there's a bunch of problems for chapter 14. And then the references. Computer Organization, 1969. Digital System Principles, <coughs> 1967. The IBM 360 slash 195 in a world of mixed job streams, April, uh, April 1970. Uh, design of a computer, the CD 6600, 1970. Parallelism, Pipelining, and Computer Efficiency, 1971. Design Approaches for Cache Memory Control, 1971. Factors Affecting the Efficiency of a Virtual Memory, 1969. Control Data 7600 Computer System, no date. A guide to the IBM System 370 Model 165. No date. Control data 6400, Computer System, Reference Manual. No date. All right. So we're getting towards the end. <clears throat> this is Chapter 15, Special Purpose Systems and special purpose computers. <clears throat> Introduction. Our point of view in this chapter will differ somewhat from that of chapter 14. In that chapter we attempted to discuss most of the important features which have been utilized to increase the speed of large machines. As we turn our attention to special purpose systems, the field of view becomes much broader, far too broad for an exhaustive treatment. Here our purpose will be to convey a design philosophy by considering only a sampling of design examples. The techniques illustrated will be applicable to a much broader class of problems. Many special purpose vector handling digital systems are not in themselves computers. Some systems, such as I.O. and display devices, may be parts of computing facilities. Other systems, such as the digital filter, are intended to function as standalone units. The first few sections will illustrate the use of AHPL in a variety of designs. Each example is interesting in its own right, and each is related to a different discipline. Beginning with section 515.5, we turn our attention to special purpose computers. Most of the designs in these latter sections will not be carried through to control sequence form. 
Typically, we shall be concerned with the layout and definition of the system at the beginning of the design process of particular interest. <coughs> In section 15.7, we discuss <coughs> which, <coughs> which establishes design parameters for the master computer of a time-sharing system. In that section, a simple cost-performance analysis of time-sharing systems is made. It is illustrative of similar analyses which might be used to determine a first approximation of cost-effectiveness of other systems. It is the author's feeling that the availability of MSI logic and LSI memories and ROMs will greatly simplify the design of special purpose systems and lead to the development of many more such machines. Most special purpose machines will be microprogrammed. To use microprogramming in subsequent sections of this chapter would have lengthened the discussions considerably. We assume that the reader could easily devise micro instruction formats and translate the AHPL sequence into a micro assembly language. Alright, so we've got 15.2 uh, push down storage. A very uh, useful purpose. Uh, <coughs> a very useful special purpose feature which might be included in a processor is a push down storage unit sometimes called a LIFO last in first out list or a stack no attempt will be made to design a complete special purpose processor only the stack mechanism which could be included in any machine will be discussed so usually we just do that well, we could use the uh, we could use the call stack, or we could use it just implement it on the heap. Uh, and I guess yeah, you could probably have a memory thing that did it. I don't know if if there are any uh, in in use. I'm not sure. Uh, Fifteen point three, a display processor. Okay. Okay. And then. Well, you have frame buffers in X windows and. Um, and so on and so forth. Digital filters. Electrical filter networks have many uh, applications in communications control and other signal processing systems. Digital filtering involves substitution of a digital computer for the analog filtering network. The advantage of a digital filter is increased accuracy and flexibility in the realization of the more complex filter transfer functions. Also important are the better stability and reliability of the digital filter. Figure 14.4 uh, is a block diagram of a digital filter. Registers in a digital filter. All right, now we're on to special purpose computers. When one speaks of a special purpose computer, it is usually understood that he means to contrast this machine with a general purpose computer. Neither of these terms is very well defined, but both satisfy the definition of a computer set forth in Chapter 1. In theory, any calculation which can be done on one computer can be done on by any other within the limits of its memory. However, a given computer might not necessarily work efficiently on a particular class of problems. Similarly, a general com a given computer might not be set up to accept input or provide output in the manner required by a certain application. For our purpose, we shall find it sufficient to describe a general purpose computer in the way it is most commonly understood. From there, it will not be difficult to define a special purpose machine. So here's the typical general purpose processing capability, figure 15.6. IO, and we've got memory. 
and we've got uh, binary fixed point arithmetic, floating point arithmetic, decimal arithmetic, logic and bookkeeping operations, and data moves. Okay. Sort processor. One of the most time consuming activities in business data processing is the sorting, ordering, or alphabetizing of lists of data. This process can be made much more efficient through the use of special purpose hardware. In this section, the implementation of specific instructions intended to perform operations related to the sorting problem will be considered. A complete design of the computer will not be presented. Here's the sort processor memory. And we've got uh, memory allocation and file organization. Fair enough. This is pretty, uh, it, you, you certainly wouldn't consider a special purpose uh, memory sorting uh, computer these days. Here's the uh, a move instruction in that computer. And then time sharing. Okay. Uh, time sharing as a medium for executing programs is not special purpose. Most any program which can be executed by a batch processing facility can also be executed by a time sharing system. The need for special purpose hardware, except for the input output terminals, is not apparent either. Many functioning time sharing systems consist of a general purpose computer connecting through its normal I.O. channels to remote time sharing terminals. Only the software operating system is special purpose. Okay. They call it what preemptive scheduling or something. It is the author's contention that time sharing using general purpose hardware uses this hardware less efficiently than a time sharing system with hardware particularly adapted to this task. In this section we shall discuss the general functioning of a time sharing system, pointing out where special purpose hardware might effectively be used. AHPL sequences describing the system will not be presented. The overall system is far too complex to commit to permit detailing the design in a single section. Here's a block diagram of a time sharing system. Remote user terminals, character buffers, IO bus, master computer, slave computer, program queue, temporary files, permanent files, large fast disk memory. Uh, figure 15.3, time utilization. Mm. In many systems, efficiency is maintained by running large batch processing jobs during slack periods. There you go. Figure uh, 1514, master activities. Uh, okay, the activity storage of incoming bits in character buffers. So you can use uh, special hardware for that. Uh, filling of line buffers. Maybe you could use special hardware. Maintain temporary files. Maybe you could use special hardware. Respond to user commands. Control program queue and slave operation. Handle output. Okay. It's a pretty odd table. Uh, figure 1515, minimal set of time sharing commands. New, oh, won't, oh well, new, calls for a new file to be established. Old, request retrieval of an old file. List, calls for teletype listing of file. Save, temporary file insertion, temporary file inserted in permanent file. Unsave, eliminate permanent file, compile file name, compile permanent file and store as named file, run, 
execute file, compile if needed, edit, miscellaneous text editing commands available, by disconnects terminal. Wow, this is fascinating. Huh. As the reader has observed, the master computer is required to perform a great variety of tasks. The timing of these tasks is not completely under control of this computer. To make possible timely response to all outside demands, the master operating system must be very carefully written to interlace the various activities. Large systems will tend to impose difficult to meet performance specifications on the master. Such circumstances suggest the design of a special purpose processor with a control sequencer providing a maximum of concurrent activity. The commands in figure 1515 suggest a very simple time sharing system. More commands could be added to permit more flexible utilization of the slave computer. Commands requesting access to magnetic tape files, operation in the remote batch mode, or paper tape input are possibilities. Section 15.8 Process Control Computer Here's figure 1516 process control configurations. All right. I think that uh, the Linux kernel is a process control computer. Process control is perhaps the most important current application of special purpose hardware. Two elementary process controllers were designed in chapters 5 and 9. Both of these were intended for essentially open loop operation. The only feedback into the controller was provided by the human operator as he manipulated switches on the panel. Open and closed loop process control computer applications are illustrated in 1516. In the closed loop system of 1516b, measurements or state variables from the process are fed back and treated as inputs by the process control computer. Computations on these state variables determine the sequence of control vectors supplied to the system. It should be taken for granted that AD and DA converters are involved in the input and output of data to and from the computer. Section 15.9 Large Special Purpose Machines Although not installed or constructed on campus, ILIAC-4 is the fourth of a series of computers developed at the University of Illinois. Most of the special purpose machines discussed so far in this chapter have been small machines dedicated to one specific task. ILIAC-4 is a very large multi-special purpose machine. That is, it is intended for use for a variety of problems which consume extremely large amounts of time on ordinary computers. Not all programs can be run efficiently on ILIAC 4. However, a simplified hardware layout of one of four identical quadrants of ILIAC 4 is shown in figure 1517. The disk memory and the Burroughs 6500 computer is used for IO communications are actually shared by all four quadrants. The quadrants can work independently or they can be joined together in a single array for large problems. The 64 processing elements are actually independent arithmetic units. Uh, the basic block period is 80 nanoseconds. So here we go. There's the figure of the ILIAC 4. The distinguishing feature of the ILIAC 4 organization is that the 64 processing elements do not possess individual control units. All PEs are under control of the single control unit shown. This feature constrains their operations such that all processing elements must simultaneously execute the same operation on different data. The only logical, the only local control available to the individual processing elements is an 8-bit register, RGM, which stores the results of tests and specifies whether the processing element 
will actually execute or will ignore an instruction issued by the control unit. A principal advantage of the ILIAC 4 organization is necessarily the economy achieved in the sharing of a single control unit by 64 processing elements. An additional advantage in some applications is the fast transfer of information between operating registers in individual processing elements. Interconnections between processing elements are provided so that they may be arranged in a two-dimensional 8x8 array or 64 element linear array. Pipeline processor. Fair enough. Uh, the arithmetic unit of figure 1518 is arranged to perform arithmetic in pipeline form C146. In the special purpose pipeline processor, the memory read and write, read and write operations are also overlapped in pipeline form. Thus, retrieval, arithmetic, and storage operations are performed in step as data move around the loop in figure 1518. In most cases, all data in the pipeline must be subject to the same arithmetic operation. As an exception, the CDC star can perform the inner or dot product of two vectors as their elements pass through the pipeline in pairs. Uh, reference 8 attempts to compare ILIAC 4 and the CDC star with each other and with a more conventional large memory. The issue is left somewhat in doubt. <clears throat> Final verdict must await extended operation of the two machines in a production environment. Much will depend on software developed and development and the skill at efficient use of the machines eventually achieved by programmers. And here's the problems for chapter 15. Ah, oh, there's a few references. So we've got uh, a design of display processor, 1969, digital filters, chapter 5 of active filters, lumped distributed integrated digital and parametric published 1970 uh, firmware sort processor with LSI components uh, 1970 uh, special purpose computer organization for double precision realization of digital filters 1970 the design of a time sharing computer system using Iverson notation 1970 uh, the ILIAC 4 computer 1968, uh, an introduction to the ILIAC 4 computer, 1970, the parallel and the pipeline computers, 1970, a versatile controller for data communications, 1970, and graphic CRT terminals, characteristics of commercially available equipment, 1967. Okay. So we're just about at the end. I'll just take a quick break. All right. Chapter. Oh, this is not in a chapter. This is an appendix. Uh, it's the only appendix, and it's called Sophistications in Control Unit Hardware. Okay. Throughout the body of the book, we have consistently assumed an easily understood pulse-oriented control unit. Our goal was to present an accurate and complete, although perhaps inefficient, physical picture. It was freely admitted that refinements might be required to permit the most economical control delay implementation in terms of a given family of logic components. If small scale bipolar integrated circuits are used, one, <coughs> and we don't use bipolar by the way, not anymore, um, we use MOSFETs I believe, uh, one would very likely use clocked flip flops throughout the system. The use of clocked flip-flops necessitates some form of level-oriented control unit as discussed in section 7.9. In section 7.9 we observe a second advantage of a level-oriented control unit in addition to compatibility with clocked flip-flops. It is possible to use classical sequential circuit techniques to minimize and possibly reduce 
the cost of sections of this type of control unit. A third very important advantage of level control is flexibility in establishing bus connections. No separate bus control flip-flops are necessary. The level outputs from the control sequencer may be used directly to switch inputs into onto the A bus, for example. Uh, a version of figure 613 revised according to this assumption is gi given in figure A1. Uh, to simplify the illustration, D-type flip-flops are shown in the hypothetical control unit. It is possible to connect fewer than the maximum number of bits to a bus. This is figure A1, direct control of busing. For example, one might use A bus 0, 1. As a step preliminary to setting the uh, sign bit in a register to 1. If a 5-bit argument is to be transferred through the bus to a register such as MC, one could use uh, W5 A bus gets Epsilon 5. To cause connections to be made to the last 5 bits of the A bus only. Notice that there is no overlap between the bus bits involved in the above two statements. The combination they add, in combination they add no more than one to the fan in of any gate. Bits in the center of the bus can even be used to affect special connections between short registers without affecting the fan in of gates at either end of the bus. With direct connections to the control sequencer, subsets of bits may be assigned connections to the bus at will throughout the design process. It is necessary only to assure that the fan in limitation of no single gate on the bus is exceeded. It is not necessary to make a list of all bus input vectors at the beginning of the design process to permit setup of a bus control register and decoder. It is interesting to note that the discussion in the above paragraph does not apply to microprogrammed control units. We recall from chapter 8 that all bus connections must be tabulated in advance so that certain sets of bits in the micro instruction may be assigned to specify connections to the various buses. This usually has the effect of limiting the variety of bus transfers which can be employed. If we permit some additional refinements in the level oriented control unit, it is possible to achieve a hardware saving at an apparent speed and an apparent speed improvement over the simple pulse oriented control units discussed in chapter 7. A two-step segment of a modified level control unit is illustrated in figure A2A. The level signal at the output of flip-flop 1 is used to gate the instruction register onto the A bus. As shown in figure A.2B, this level develops immediately following the trailing edge of clock pulse 2. It remains 1 for one clock period. At the end of the clock period, the level is anded with clock pulse 3 to generate the pulsed label MA gets uh, W13 uh, A bus. That's probably some sort of Greek W, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it is this pulse which affects the uh, specified transfer of data from the A bus to MA. Blah, 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 blah. Two phase clocking. Okay, fine. And that's pretty much it. There's a very small index, isn't there? Not very big at all. Might as well have a read through this index, it's not very long. Accumulator, adder, 
uh, carry look ahead, ripple carry, addition, double precision, floating point, serial, addressing, AHPL, ALU, analytical engine, and APL, architecture, assembler, assembly language, associative memory, asynchronous, Babbage, base address, biased exponents, uh, and, and we noticed that uh, the IEEE uh, uh, floating point uh, uses biased exponents. Uh, binary number, binary operator, uh, bookkeeping statement, branch, buffer, buffered transfer, bus, IO bus, busing, byte, carry, generate carry, propagate carry, carry look ahead, carry save, catenate, central processing unit, channel, character, clocking, closed loop, combina combinational logic subroutine, compiler, uh, hardware, compiler hardware, compress, uh, control delay, uh, control sequence, control sequence multiple, control sequence parallel, or no, multiple control sequence parallel, yeah. Okay, control unit, convergence, core, core memory, coincident current core memory, linear select core memory, uh, DAC, which is digital analog converter, data paths, decoding network, delay, difference engine, uh, digital filter, digital system, uh, uh, vector handling, digital system vector handling, uh, diode transistor logic, uh, diode transistor logic delay, direct memory access, DMA, uh, disk memory, division, uh, okay, uh, floating point division, uh, non-performing division, do loop, domain error, don't care, uh, trouble precision addition, drum memory, you know, I think that they uh, that actually don't care uh, occurred uh, at least twice. I think I remember seeing it twice. Uh, economics, ENIAC, event times, execute cycle, execution overlap, fetch cycle, fixed point, flip flop, JK flip flop, master slave flip flop, set reset, or oh, set clear <coughs> flip flop. Uh, floating point, uh, full adder, general purpose computer, graphics terminal, hardware compiler, ILIAC 4, increment, index register, indexing, indirect addressing, inhibit current, input, input output, input output buffered, uh, input output DMA, input output program controlled, instruction, uh, look ahead instruction, uh, memory reference instruction, multi-address instruction, operate instruction, register instruction, uh, instruction register, interaction, interface, interleaving, interpreter, uh, interrupt, uh, interrupt masking, interrupt priority, inverter, ISZ, jam transfer, uh, JMP, uh, JMS, joystick, I don't remember joystick, Page 441. Yeah. Uh, Kano map, LAC, level, level control, link, look ahead, machine language, magnetic tape, Mantissa, Mark 1, masking, matrix, memory, associative memory, memory hierarchy, memory scratch pad, memory banks, memory reference instruction, uh, micro. Micro address register, micro coding, micro instructions register, multi programming, micro sequencer, multiplication, uh, carry save multiplication, floating point multiplication, parallel mi multiplication, sign multiplication, speed and multiplication speed analysis, <clears throat> multi processing, multi programming, NAND gate, non responsive, NOR gate, opcode, open loop. Operate instruction, operator, binary operator, mixed operator, primitive operator, relational operator, unary operator, output, overflow, exponent overflow, page, parallel, parallel continued, uh, parallel control, parallel sequences, parity, peripheral processes, pipelining, port, priority network, program counter, 
pulse, control pulse, delay pulse, synchronizer pulse, push down storage, Q, radix, random access memory, uh, core RAM, electronic RAM, read only memory, ROM, semiconductor ROM, transformer coupled ROM, real time, record, reduce, register, mask register, shift register, symmetry register, transfer register, register memory, relocatability, reshape, responsive, SC flip-flop, scalar, scratch pad, semi-random access memory, sense winding, sequential circuit, sequential memory, SM, shifting over zeros, uh, SIC, SIC instructions, SIC layout, uh, slave computer, special purpose computer, stack, star, status, status register, store, stretch, swap time, synchronization, synchronous, TAD, tape transport, throughput, time sharing, transfer, input output transfer, transfer rates, transfer register, transfer variable destination or variable destination transfer, two's complement, unary operator, univac1, variable word length, vector, uh, binary vector, prefix vector, uh, vector prefix, vector suffix, uh, vector unit, uh, handling digital system, vector handling digital system, virtual memory, wiring statement. And that's it. So I'll just pop you over to the, uh, to the farewell cam and we'll wrap up. And that's a wrap. So, uh, we finally made it to the end of uh, digital systems, hardware organization and design. Uh, that was a pretty good read. That was pretty good. Managed to get through it in one setting, one sitting. Uh, so we discussed uh, the introduction, uh, objectives of the book, evolution of the computer, basic organization and design of digital computers, instruction format, software, uh, summary and outlook, then uh, organization and programming of a small computer, system components, design conventions, uh, introduction to AHPL, the uh, hardware programming language, uh, machine organization and hardware uh, programs, the control unit, microprogramming, inter-system communications, interrupt and input output, high speed addition, multiplication and division, floating point arithmetic, features of large fast machines, and special purpose systems and special purpose computers. So uh, thanks very much for, uh, for following along. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks very much for watching. And please remember to hit like and subscribe.